So welcome to the 2022 Welfare and Safety of the Racehorse Summit. <clears throat> I'd like to once again thank Keeneland for hosting us. Uh, they've been a great and incredible partner for this event. Uh, thanks to everyone here attending, those tuning in via the live stream, and all those that contributed to the past summits. But most importantly, I'd like to thank all the individuals this, this, in this industry that wake up 365 days a year to take care of this great animal, the thoroughbred racehorse. They get up and do the job and, that we dream about and the ideas that we think about in these rooms and put them into good practice. Uh, so as we got ready for the 10th Welfare and Safety of the Racehorse Summit, we wanted to do a little research into the impetus for the original summit. And first, we'd like to thank Ed Bowen, uh, who's here today, and Dale Hancock, our chairman at Grayson, and the Grayson Board for really having the foresight uh, to come up with this in 2006. It seems like not long ago, but a long time ago now. So the impetus for the original summit was really a discussion amongst Grayson Board members examining the decline in starts per starter and asking the question, was this related to safety issues, a durability of the horse, un unsafe conditions, or was it other things? Well, after quickly realizing the starts per starter issue is a much larger uh, issue than a summit on horse safety and welfare could address, the participants quickly settled in on this. The welfare and safety of the racehorse should be the guiding principle in the decision-making process for all segments of the horse racing industry. So this led to two, recommend, or two summits that were closed door meetings of industry participants with limited uh, public uh, presentations, but the recommendations centered on a couple of areas. And those were, we had a lack of data for horses suffering fatality or injury. So in 2006, we couldn't tell you how many horses suffered a fatality on the racetrack. Uh, we had no surface lab to send materials to. We had no maintenance reporting for track services. We had no procedures, uh, equipment procedures in 2006. Now, when I say in 2006 in these years, of course we had one, two, three, or four tracks that were kind of doing these, but now these are more standard operating uh, procedures around the country. Uh, they recognized that we needed greater regulatory veterinarian oversight with establishment of necropsy programs, standardized pre-race exams, and the development of lab standards for an accreditation program. Uh, and we needed increased education for everyone involved. So I'd like to say since 2006, our industry has remained focused on safety and welfare of the horse. Now some of these items may have been performed at one or two, like I said, but now I would like to say most are standard operating procedure across our industry and they've been undertaken to assist rider and equine safety. And I'd just like to read this list of things that we've come up with, and I'm sure there's others. We created the equine injury database. So in 2006, we did not know how many horses suffered fatalities. And now Dr. Parkin's going to present risk factors on horses. So an amazing feat in a small amount of time. We have a racetrack surface laboratory that's dedicated to our industry for materials and is assisting other equine disciplines with their footing situations. We have equine treatment and procedure system for electronic reporting. We have standardized pre-race exams on all entered horses, the creation of the NTRA Safety and Integrity Alliance, the creation of the Racing Medication and Testing Consortium Lab Accreditation Program post-race exams on horses, necropsy programs and review committees for breakdowns, jockey health information system, protocol for putting all horses on the vets list, a protocol for working and testing horses off the vets list, regulatory veterinarian inspection of horses between starts, the elimination of traction devices on front shoes, ASTM certified vests and helmets on riders, void claim rules, padded crops, uniform national trainers exams for licensing and a study guide, specialized regulatory veterinary and continuing education, racetrack superintendent field day for education, concussion management for riders, weather protocol for riders and horse safety. That's just a short list we came up just to make remarks, but I'm sure there are others. And uh, we always know the goal is zero. But right now, we have seen substantial results in all these efforts in lowering the fatality rate. You'll hear a great program today about those efforts, about the equine injury database, about the surface testing lab, and other things that are going on across the country to keep our horses safe. But now, 
I'd like to introduce our Master of Ceremonies, Anise Montpleasure, the Equine Education Coordinator for the Kentucky Equine Education Project Foundation and President of Horse Amplify Horse Racing, and she'll be our Master's of Ceremony for the day, and thank you for attending. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2022 Welfare and Safety of the Racehorse Summit. My name is Anise Montpleasure, and I am so excited to be joining all of you for this very important event to our industry. I first became interested in the thoroughbred industry after learning the story of the legendary Philly Ruffian. And so fittingly, Ruffian would actually become the subject of my first ever public speaking engagement, which was presenting a competitive speech at my state 4-H horse show when I was 14. And it was thanks to that speech, and we'll say thanks to Ruffian, that I was actually able to visit Kentucky for the first time to present it at a national competition. And as I was researching for that speech and my interest and passion for the thoroughbred industry started to develop and grow, so did my curiosity to better understand what was happening in the space of welfare and safety and supporting the health and longevity of our amazing equine athletes. And I'm sure that many of you probably have a story that is similar to mine and that it was a particular horse who inspired not only your pursuit of being involved in the industry, but your pursuit of developing your knowledge of the industry and becoming a great steward of the horses that are at the center of all of this. And that's what brings all of us here today for this event. So it is a great confidence that I can say that 14-year-old uh, Denise would be very excited for me and the fact that I get to stand before all of you today and not only introduce the incredible experts that we're going to get to learn from, but also I'm here to learn as well alongside all of you. So with that, we are going to transition into uh, our first presentation, which is a fitting one to kick us off, as this has been a topic at the forefront of the summit since its impetus, and that is the Equine Injury Database, which was first proposed at the Welfare and Safety of the Racehorse Summit in October of 2006. What followed was a 13-month pilot program during which over 3,000 injury reports were received and recorded, leading to the official launch of the Equine Injury Database in July of 2008. Now everything is recorded digitally in an extensive database that seeks to identify the frequency, types, and outcomes of racing injuries using a standardized format that will generate valid statistics, identify markers for horses at increased risk of injury, and serve as a data source for research directed at improving safety and pre preventing injuries. Joining us to provide an update on the Equine Injury Database is Dr. Tim Parkin, head of Bristol Veterinary School at the University of Bristol. Welcome, Dr. Parkin. Um, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be back here once again, um, and particularly a pleasure to be back here in person after the travails of the last couple of years. Um, makes a massive difference to come and do these things in person rather than have to sit behind a screen and do those awful Zoom and Teams meetings um, with multiple people on board. Um, I'm going to give you a brief update on what we've been doing over the last um, few years with respect to the Equine Energy Database. Um, a few things to uh, talk about. Firstly, just a uh, bring you up to speed as to where we are with respect to the annual audit figures that we do on an annual basis for the Jockey Club. Talk a little bit about what happened last year with our two-year-olds. Um, and then a question that came from uh, the Thoroughbred Safety Committee for the Jockey Club asking about the difference in uh, risk associated with horses that um, stick to one surface or those that compared to those that change surface as they go through their career. And then finally, just a little bit of a uh, section on uh, sudden death and what we've been doing in, in that field as well. So uh, looking at the annual fatality uh, figures and reminder that these fatal injury reports are reports of any horse that died or was euthanized within 72 hours of a race date. Um, overall uh, figures on all surfaces, as you, I'm sure you're aware, 
Uh, the figures have come down quite substantially uh, since 2009, representing a 31% reduction in the risk of fatal injury um, from a high in 2009 of around 2 to, for the first time this year, I believe, uh, dipping below 1.5 per thousand starts on those uh, participating uh, racetracks. Obviously, dirt being the predominant surface in this part of the world, then that very closely mirrors what we see in the overall figures. But again, a very substantial reduction in risk, 36% reduction in risk uh, since 2009 to uh, 2021, hovering just above the 1.5 per thousand starts. Again, a substantial reduction since the, uh, from the 2.1 per thousand starts that we saw in 2009. Um, looking at turf, uh, obviously with fewer starts and the line is a little bit more up and down, a little bit more wavy, but again, a substantial reduction, about a 30%, 28% reduction uh, from uh, 2009 to 2020. And then finally, synthetic, um, <clears throat> a very substantial or more than 50% reduction in risk compared to that first year. Now, that first year was a particularly uh, high point, obviously about one5 so uh, that, that, lean, that uh, contributes very significantly to that very significant reduction. But it's, a, it's, it's very pleasing to see, after a small uptick last year, a return to uh, the uh, general trend in a downward direction for synthetics, now down at about 0 0.75 per thousand starts in terms of fatal injuries um, on those particular surfaces. So last year was a bit of a 2021 data was a bit of a, a strange year uh, in terms of what we saw, um, particularly for the risk associated with two-year-olds. Um, and it, I don't think there's a year goes by when I come over and, and speak here where someone doesn't ask me about the risk associated with two-year-old horses and whether we should be racing two-year-olds. So it did um, throw us a little bit uh, when we saw the figures that suggested that actually there'd been a spike in two-year-old fatal injuries uh, last year. These data um, represent, the red line here is the, year, the annual figures for four-year-olds, okay? So uh, this is what we've seen in four-year-old pluses, horses. Uh, this is what we've seen in three-year-olds as we go from 2009 through to 2021. You'll see that in the three-year-old group, I've, I've pointed out years, year on years, where there'd been a significant increase from the previous year. And this was a, in, I think it was 2013 to 2014 in the three-year-olds, there was a 21% increase in the risk from the previous year in terms of the risk of fatal injuries per 1,000 starts on the track. Now, those are the four-year-old plus and the three-year-old uh, lines. So the four-year-old plus are the uh, red line and the blue line is the three-year-olds. And then if we overlay the two-year-old figure, again, I pointed out year-on-year uh, -year changes where we've seen a, what you might regard as significant change. And certainly in 2011 and 2012, we saw a, a reasonably significant increase on the previous year, 16 and then 17% increase. But what we saw last year from 2019 to 2020 was a 43% increase in the risk of fatal injury in our two-year-olds. And that really did throw us. That was not something we were expecting at all. And if you look at the lines, for the most part, then uh, three and four-year-old pluses, they intertwine with each other. They kind of trade places in terms of whether the three-year-olds are at slightly increased risk or the four-plus-year-olds are at slightly increased risk. But in no other year has the two-year-old risk been above either of those two particular lines. And 2020, the value for two-year-olds was higher than both the value for three-year-olds and the value for four-plus-year-olds. So it really was a surprising, surprising finding. Um, it is obviously, as you see, uh, gratifying to see that actually in the most recent data, then the two-year-old's um, risk of fatality has returned to what you might regard as normal trend, and it's come back down, well, for the first time, to be below one per thousand starts. So we're glad to see that it's back on track, but it did raise some questions about what happened last year. And uh, uh, from <clears throat> discussing with the Thoroughbred Safety Committee, we then took... Um, data from workouts recorded in the EID. And th this plot is a little bit um, difficult to see, but what you're seeing here is each year from 2009 to 2021, and on the y-axis here, we've got the number of EID recorded workouts per horse per month. And you've got month of March through to December here. And you can see that for the most part, from 2009 to 2019, 
all the years are clustered in amongst each other. There is some fluctuation, but there's, there's no one year that really stands out, apart from 2020. And these are the lines in the early part of the year, March through to June for 2020, when the number of workouts was clearly uh, impacted, uh, workouts per horse, was, per horse was clearly impacted by what was going on in that spring of 2020 with COVID, et cetera. Now, the number, the, the actual numerical difference might be quite small, but actually I think it doesn't take necessarily an enormous difference in the number of workouts or the amount of training that a two-year-old doing is potentially to, to, to have a potential impact on the risk of fatal injury and how the bones adapt in those particular horses. And it is interesting to see that we did see a similar, probably less pronounced training disruption in the older age horses, but we didn't see that impact on their risk of fatal injuries. Um, what we did see uh, later on in the year, we think, with this, this line going up through here, we did see some attempt at compensation for a lack of exercise early in the year in those two-year-olds as well, which may also have contributed somewhat to the increased incre uh, uptick in risk of fatal injuries for those two-year-olds in 2020. Now, obviously, these are purely data and actually trying to take that from uh, correlation through to causality is somewhat difficult, but I know Larry will talk a little bit after me about how this might relate to uh, adaptation in the bone and then therefore how it might have actually resulted in an increased risk in those two-year-olds. Uh, interestingly, if we then add on 2021 here, and that's a black line you can't really see amongst all the other lines, but that tells us that essentially the 2021 workouts per horse per month were back to normal. And actually that then ties very nicely in with the fact that actually we've seen a significant reduction in the risk in those two-year-olds uh, 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 in 20, 2021, as I said, with the risk per thousand starts dipping below one for the first time. So that gives us some anecdotal uh, evidence to suggest that yes, there is quite a strong relationship between uh, the number of workouts horses are doing and the interruption in training and therefore the, uh, the risk that those particular horses were at um, uh, in 2020, purely due, due to the disruption in training due to COVID. I was asked um, at the Thoroughbred Safety Committee, then asked about, well, you're not going to see an immediate impact of that reduction in work on the risk of fatal injury, uh, and you'd expect a lag in the uptick in fatal injury, which I think is what we have seen. Now, there is a bit of a caveat uh, with respect to these data in that we are talking about the number of fatal injuries on tracks by two-year-olds per month, and in no one month is that greater than 10 individual horses. So we are bound to see quite a lot of fluctuation when we put that against the denominator, looking for a, a per thousand risk. But nevertheless, it is quite interesting to see that actually if you look at the red line here that goes through, that's the average number of fatal injuries per thousand starts in two-year-olds in 2015 to 19. And then the green line is what we saw in 2020 uh, with two clear, uh, sorry, three clear peaks in June, September, and then December that we hadn't seen at all in the previous years. Interestingly, in uh, 2021, we did also see a peak in June that actually exceeded the peak in 2020 uh, uh, June, but then actually it fell back for the rest of the year, it fell back much closer to the norm and what we'd more normally expect. So is this evidence that there's a definitive link between uh, the disruption in training and then the lag and then an increase in risk of fatal injury? Well, I think it's, it's somewhat evidential. But as I said, it's quite difficult to be sure given that uh, we are talking about relatively small, small number of individual horses on any particular month uh, <coughs> of the year uh, when we're just talking about two-year-olds. Um, a question that was posed to us um, uh, from the Thoroughbred Safety Committee was about horses that tend to stick to the same surface and those that tend to then move on to different surfaces and whether the level of risk for those individual horses is somewhat different to those that happen to be switching between different surfaces. Now, this question might on the face of it seem like a relatively simple question to try and start answering, but actually when we looked at the data and actually saw the, different, the numerous different permutations of um, changes of surface that lots and lots of horses undertake, actually creating a profile that is typical, in quotes, of 
uh, your average horse that sticks to dirt or your average horse that then goes from dirt to turf or turf to dirt is somewhat difficult. And actually you end up with multiple, multiple um, different uh, levels of risk for all the different potential permutations of horse as they switch between surface. Nevertheless, we have produced something that looks um, something like this. Um, first of all, the uh, line, dotted lines here are the risk on dirt, turf, and synthetic for all horses, regardless of their prior history, whether they've been on whichever surface that happens to be. So that's just the baseline level. Uh, if you took all the data from 20, 2009 through to 2021, that's the baseline level on dirt, turf, and synthetic. <coughs> The dots here, so we've got, oh, sorry, we've got a red dot here that indicates the risk for horses that are, have only ever, up to that point in their career, have only ever raced on dirt. We've got a blue dot here, which is the risk for horses that up to that point in their career have only ever raced on synthetic. And we've got a green dot here that is, represents the risk for horses up to that point in their career where they've only ever raced on turf. What we're interested in is then to see, okay, you take a horse that's only ever been racing on dirt and actually its first change is then onto a different surface, either that be turf or synthetic, then what is the risk going forward for that individual horse? So you take a horse that's gone from dirt and it goes, its first change is to synthetic, then its risk drops reasonably considerably, but certainly gets nowhere near the level of risk, overall level of risk on synthetic. You take that same dirt horse and it goes to turf, it gets closer to the overall level of risk on turf but still lies above the overall level of risk on turf. If you take a horse that's only previously been racing on synthetic and its first change is to dirt, it's certainly its risk for the rest of its career then is actually very much more closely related to the overall risk on dirt. And you take that horse and you change it to turf for its first switch, it very closely mirrors the overall level of risk on turf. And then finally, if you take a horse that's gone from turf, its first change is to synthetic, actually it looks like its risk actually increases. It doesn't go towards the overall synthetic risk. It actually increases somewhat to above what might experience if it stayed on turf. And if you take it from turf to dirt, make its first, first switch to dirt, then again, that comes much closer to what you might already uh, automatically expect on dirt for all horses that are experiencing a dirt surface. So how do we interpret these? Well, I think uh, for all those horses racing on dirt, uh, regardless of their history, whether they have, have been continually racing on dirt or whether they made a switch, then they are all somewhat close to, but below, the overall level of risk on dirt. For those horses racing on turf, they are above and below, the overall level of risk of racing on turf, so somewhat turf, somewhat in the region. But those horses that started on synthetic or were only ever raced on synthetic are quite significantly different in their level of risk uh, compared to those horses that start on synthetic and then switch to either turf or dirt. Now, those estimates, sorry, those estimates might be somewhat, um, how do I go back? Those estimates might be somewhat uh, difficult to pinpoint because there are relatively few horses that switch from synthetic to turf or dirt, so there will be quite low, wide confidence intervals around those. Um, I think what's important, actually, if we look at the horses that do move, so if they've come from um, uh, a different surface, synthetic or turf, onto dirt, those horses are at similar but slightly lower reduced risk compared to those horses that are consistently on dirt. So you could almost anticipate that they retain some of the safety aspects of being a turf or a synthetic horse. Those horses that move on to turf are at similar but slightly higher risk compared to those who are consistently on turf, regardless of whether they come from synthetic or dirt. And those, those horses that move on to synthetic, whether they've come from dirt or turf, they don't get anywhere near the level of risk that you would see for a horse that is consistently on uh, synthetic, or indeed the level of risk for a horse that is overall level of risk on synthetic. 
Now, as I said, those two dots there are relatively smallly populated by relatively few numbers, so it would be quite difficult to draw any significant conclusions about that. And certainly, we recognize that what we've done here is just take the first switch for a particular horse as being the switch that represents its future risk, and actually being able to further profile horses that then switch from turf to dirt and then back to turf, for example, is something we want to take forward and actually understand which of those individual horses with different surface profiles present perhaps the greatest risk is something we want to take forward. So this is just our first look at these. Um, I think it's interesting enough to present here and certainly shows that there are certainly significant impacts of the surface that horses are racing on, which we all know about, but actually some horses will retain some of their predominant um, or previous level of risk that might have been built up because they've been racing on different surfaces or they're a particular type of horse that is prone or uh, 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 particularly useful on a synthetic or a turf, turf type track that then happens to switch uh, for other reasons. Um, the final thing I wanted to talk about just briefly is just sudden death. <clears throat> Um, and first of all, just to present some figures. So this is a the plot on the left is slightly different to the overall fatal injury rate that you've seen before. This is just pulling out MSI, so musculoskeletal injury, fatal injuries, uh, and the risk per thousand starts since 2009 all the way through to 2020. And you can see, as you can imagine, it mirrors very closely what we see in overall fatal injury because these contribute about 90% of all fatal injuries anyway. What we see uh, uh, with respect to sudden death is a relatively flat line. Now, just to note here, I've kept these on the same scale just so that we can see that actually, obviously, sudden death is uh, significantly uh, less predominant, uh, prevalent than uh, musculoskeletal injury is an important thing to, to remember. If we, um, if we change the scale slightly, then we see um, uh, quite a bit of variation going on with respect to sudden death. Um, Although I put here there's been an 18% drop since uh, 2009 to 2021, if we'd actually done this last year, then actually we'd have seen an increase in the risk of sudden death. So I, for me, this is a bit of a flat line, not really going up or down in any particular great detail, um, certainly not in the same level of evidence to suggest, as we've got here, that musculoskeletal injuries are going down by about 31%, have gone down by about 31% since uh, 2009. So we can see that actually, for us, this is kind of useful because it suggests that the risk factors we've identified and actually people are starting to take note of and developing interventions for, regulatory change, et cetera, have had an impact in the area we might expect them to have actually on musculoskeletal injuries. But those same risk factors haven't had the same impact on sudden death. So obviously the thing to do is to then develop a multivariable model that actually identifies what those risk factors might be for sudden death in particular and actually see whether the particular risk factors we can take that we can then impact on and then actually try and uh, reduce the risk of sudden death as well as uh, the risk of musculoskeletal injury. Um, probably the reason that people are talking more about sudden death, obviously uh, apart from potential high profile cases, is that actually because of the reduction in the overall contribution of musculoskeletal injuries to the total number of fatal injuries and actually the proportion of horses that are, overall horses that are dying uh, due to sudden death is obviously, obviously rising. Uh, and whereas previously in 2009 it would have been about five, between 5 and 6%, it's now, for a couple of the most recent years, has tipped over 10%. The proportion of all fatal fatalities on the track that are related to a sudden death has now ticked up above 10%. And that's purely driven by the reduction, obviously, in the total number of horses that are dying due to musculoskeletal injuries. I'm not saying that the risk of sudden death is going up at all, but it's certainly staying level. So that's probably why people are talking more about sudden death than they previously have done because they're noticing it more uh, uh, on the track. So we have produced a, a risk factor model for uh, sudden death. I don't have time to present it now. We're, get, we're looking to uh, uh, publish it in, in JAVMA in, the, in uh, the next few months or at least uh, submit it to the journal. Just something to say about this. It's important to note that sudden death is, is coded in the EID records. 85% of them are coded as SUD, so sudden death. 15% of our cases were pulmonary hemorrhage, EIPH, post-exertional distress, cardiac arrhythmia, or multiple codes from the same list. Um, <clears throat> obviously, the case definitions are rather broad. We don't really necessarily have very good understanding of what causes sudden death in many of these horses, that many of them aren't post-mortems, and even if they were, then you're not guaranteed to be able to identify and pin down the cause of death anyway. 
But we have identified a range of risk factors. And as I said, I'm not going to go through them all, but I did want to highlight one just for this particular audience. Um, uh, and we identified for the first time a relationship between the use of Lasix in the race and sudden death, uh, and indeed any, any outcome we're talking about. And actually, the use of Lasix in the race uh, increases the risk of sudden death by about 62%. Now, anyone who knows anything about statistics will see that this p-value is relatively close to being statistically significant or not. Um, and that is very, very much driven by the fact that actually very few horses, very few of our starts uh, as a proportion were uh, horses that were not on Lasix. And these data go all the way all back to 2009, so I recognize there's been regulatory change that is slowly reducing, to a certain extent, the number of horses that start on Lasix uh, in more recent years. <clears throat> but even disregarding um, that particular uh, p-value here, actually, if you look at the overall risk uh, of sudden death um, per thousand starts when you're not on Lasix being about 0 0.08 compared to when you are on Lasix being about 1.13 per thousand starts, I think there is evidence there that there is a, some sort of physiological uh, uh, relationship potentially between the use of Lasix and sudden death that certainly warrants further investigation. I think the reason that this won't have been identified before is purely due to statistical power. And we, essentially, when you've got more than 95%, 90% of uh, starts being made on Lasix, and it's very difficult to identify uh, a difference between those that are and uh, not on Lasix, uh, simply because we have very few that aren't. So actually, this, this is purely driven by the fact we now have sufficient number of years of data and sufficient uh, sudden deaths in the database to enable us to draw this conclusion. But I think it's certainly something that's worthy of continu uh, uh, further thought and further discussion. I'd be interested to know um, and, and understand more about exactly the uh, impact of uh, Lasix on, on exercising horses and actually how that changes their blood, blood, blood biochemistry and perhaps contributes to the risk of cardiac arrhythmias, for example. So with that, thank you for listening. I'd just like to acknowledge the help of Matt, Chris, and Jamie. As always, um, uh, enormous help that I gave, gave from those two and enormous industry insight that helps us direct where we should go with all of these analyses. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Parkin. We'll now welcome Dr. Larry Bramlage to the stage, surgeon and partner at Rudin Riddle Equine Hospital, to present on building a two-year-old skeleton for racing. This is a continuation from two previous presentations by Dr. Bramlage at the Welfare and Safety of the Race Horse Summit. The first in 2012 on selected effects of training and racing on the musculoskeletal system, and the most recent one from 2014 on training and bone development in racehorses. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bramlage. Thank you. Um, it's nice to be here. First, I gotta figure out how to advance my slides in the pointer. Okay, so we're, we're moving now from um, science to maybe interpretation or possibly from carpet to straw. And uh, the first question we need to ask is, um, is it a good thing to be training two-year-olds? Um, the, the criticism, interestingly, comes more often from people who are in other aspects of the equine industry than it does people that are uninitiated. And the, the show horse people, uh, and especially some of the disciplines like dressage, have a strong opinion that you should not be training two-year-olds. They let their horses fully mature before they start training. But I'm going to try to convince you that that's not the case. Um, the report, first report from the Thoroughbred Safety Committee whenever we were initiated in 2008 was to the Jockey Club Roundtable in 2009. And our first question was, is there evidence that racing two-year-olds is a bad thing? So we looked at three items. The average lifetime earnings per starter, and as you can see in the red, horses that race at two are much more successful than horses that um, don't make their first start until after two years of age. Same thing is true for their career, average earnings per start. Horses that are able to race at two are much more successful in the amount of money they earn per each start. 
They are also more successful whenever they're competing in stakes. Now, to some degree, this probably indicates that uh, there are some horses that are better athletes than others. Um, you know, the, the horses, there, there are some horses notably that you can throw anything at them in training and they're able to handle it. And then there's some horses that can't breeze twice in a row because they, I guess weak protoplasm might be the answer. Interestingly enough, subsequent studies or studies around the same time from New Zealand, I'm not going to try to uh, make you read that, but I just put red boxes around the conclusions in these papers. In New Zealand, it's better to race two-year-olds. In Australia, it's better to race two-year-olds. Even in Poland, it's better to race two-year-olds. So I, I'm unaware of any study that, that shows that um, not racing uh, as a two-year-old actually improves the situation. So. I think the evidence continues to show that racing two-year-olds is a good thing for the horse, or at least training it to. You absolutely have to train it to. Um, Thurbid Racehorse is a, an amazing running machine. Um, it's been developed by natural selection, multiplied by man. Uh, and I'm sorry about the colors here. They don't show up very well. But um, if you divide a horse into his systems, um, roughly 40% of the horse is uh, muscular um, tendinous. There's about um, a fourth of the horse that's skeleton. And then you have about 35% that's viscera. Um, this is an estimate, but if you, it's taken from the dress, um, dressed weight of an equine carcass. And if you're a hunter, you know that whenever you dress out a deer or if you um, dress a cow whenever they're slaughtered, they run about 60 to 65 percent. So we're taking a little bit of liberty uh, in assessing that. But suffice it to say that 25 percent is skeleton. These two are dead weight. This is what the, drives the horse. So if you can lower the dead weight in the horse that he has to carry around the racetrack, it's easier for the horse to run. We all know that a principal component, whoops, a principal component of the effect of Lasix is to reduce the water weight in the horse's colon. The horse urinates out a lot of weight. Uh, it's taken out of the circulation. It's then made up for by absorbing water from the colon, so they end up lighter. But the thoroughbred horse is so good at what they do because their skeleton is the minimal amount it takes to get the horse around the racetrack. And, and so they walk that line as to what's the uh, best skeleton I can have to keep me as fast as I possibly can. Skeleton's interesting. It's refined by the biomechanics the horse sees. The skeleton is actually built. It's modeled from the work that the horse, horse sees. But how does that occur? It occurs by training, and there's some comments I'll have to make in a little bit that I think fit very well with um, the data that Tim just showed you. Why train two-year-olds? The two-year-olds are right at the end of their growth period. And during the growth period, the skeleton is replete with the blood supply and the cell population to build bone. It doesn't make any sense to let that totally atrophy until the horse is four-year-old is a four-year-old, because then you got to build it all back. What you want to do is pick up that um, support system and convert it from growth to adaptation to training. And that's one of the reasons it's better to, to train and race a two-year-old. Now, way back when, whenever I was going to school, we, we learned that the skeleton was basically a passive unit in any being, but there, it couldn't be farther from the truth. The more we know about bone, the more interesting it becomes. It's actually very dynamic. Um, sorry, wrong button again. It's highly sophisticated and remarkably adaptable to what the skeleton needs to do. There are two cell lines, the osteocytic and the osteoblastic. We're not going to talk too much about that today. But this is a cross-section picture of a horse's cannon bone. And you can see where the cannon bone starts and where it ends up after it's trained. 
So it's pretty amazing at, at what a horse does to produce a skeleton that's uh, sufficient for his racing. Now, the osteocytes that I learned whenever I was in school, they basically build bone and they kind of get stuck in the middle of the, you know, the bone. But that's really untrue. They're the directors of everything that happens. And how that happens is each one of these little dots is an osteocyte. It's uh, diagrammatically, it's a cell like that. Uh, if you digest away all of the mineral, it's going to look like this. The soft tissue, that's an osteocyte, that's an osteocyte. The key to the horse building bone are the canaliculi and the dendrites. Canaliculi are canals. Dendrites are connections between cells. And if you digest away the mineral, you can see how much of that there is. It's a huge amount of interconnection between the cells. So the weight on the bone is then transferred to... This is uh, one of the, these circles, corresponds to here. And then you go down to here, and the osteocytes and the dendrites are suspended in fluid within those canaliculi. So the osteocyte is a director. It's not a prisoner. Um, it senses the... It's, they're, they're actually tethered inside of those canals. And they're communicating with all the other osteocytes in the area. Now, if you remember your physics, the hydraulics, whenever you increase a load on a, a cylinder full of fluid, it transmits throughout the entire cylinder. That's why hydraulics work on heavy machinery. And so whenever you increase the load on a bone, all of those osteocytes in that general area are going to be sensing that the load is increasing. So how do they respond? They add bone. The osteocytes communicate. In the case of a cannon bone, these will be the ones that the horse started with, these round things. Each one of those looks like that with a blood supply in the middle, all of these cells, and then all of the connections between all the cells. And they're all sensing the hydraulic fluid that's around, which is sensitive to mechanical load. When you bend the bone, um, like, for instance, taking the cannon bone, when a horse is fully galloping, the cannon bone bends backwards. The, the cells within the bone on the front cortex sense that that bone is bending backwards. We have to stiffen the front of the bone. So they're sending the signals to the secondary osteons that are being, I'm sorry, to the primary osteons on the surface of the bone that are being produced out here to say, we need more of you. Now, how that's communicated is yet to be um, elucidated. And if you can figure that out, we can go into business because whatever chemical it is, or it's probably a cytokine, we're in the age of cytokines now, which are intercellular communication mo um, molecules. Uh, whatever is telling these osteocytes on the surface to make more bone, there has never been anything discovered to this point that can make a fracture heal faster. Normal fracture healing occurs at its, at its, its a preferred site at its most um, active rate. For a while, the theory was electrical, that when you bend a bone, you get different charges on the surface. That washed out. But the hydraulic sensing of the loads in the bone is very important, at least, and how it does it, I'm not really sure. Uh, modeling of bone, I keep my finger on Right, but modeling of bone occurs in the shafts, which means modeling refers to the fact that you can change the shape. Remodeling refers to what happens on the inside of the bone. And horses are quite different. This is a picture of a human tibia just below your knee, and you can see how porous that is compared to the distal cannon bone of a horse. So this is Wolf's Law. We all uh, learned about that, and anybody that's taken a biology course of... Uh, that includes bone. Uh, he's the first person that described that bone is laid down where strength is needed and removed where it's unnecessary. Well, horses carry this to the extreme. They have such a, a huge cell population and blood supply that they can do that dynamically. And they need to do it dynamically. So how does a horse train? Um, you give him a load that the bone senses is a little more than it can stand, and then he increases the strength of the bone. And so the next training session, you give him another load, and the bone senses that that's a little more than I can stand, so it builds bone. And then all of that situation results in hypertrophy of the bone. 
this probably, the, the fact that it's, um, my, we used to think it was micro damage or very small fractures we couldn't see, but that's probably not the case. It's probably more correctly termed micro deformity. Now, changing the shape of the bone or changing the composition of the bone, if you just change the shape of the, this represents changing the composition of the bone, but it's much more effective to change the shape of the bone. The farther you get the outside of the bone from the center of the bone, it's illustrated here, and you probably can't read that, but if you take the same amount of material in a rod and put it in a cylinder, it doubles the bending strength. So the moment of inertia, which indicates that how far the outside of that bone is from the center of the bone, has a lot to do with how stiff the bone is and how well it stands the load. That only makes sense. This is from Dr. Nunnemaker's um, research in the 2002 Milne lecture that he presented at the AAP, and it gives you an example of the blue line is a standard bred yearling. The red line is a standard bred adult. That's how much of the adaptation of moment of inertia that the standard bred makes whenever they're training. Look what a thoroughbred makes. Thoroughbred yearling goes from here, which is actually lighter than the standard bred, which if, if you look at thoroughbred and standard bred foals, you can tell that because their skeletons are a lot lighter than the, than the thoroughbreds are. But look what happens to the adult thoroughbred. Look how much adaptation, how far that bone is moved from the center of the bone. And that's all adaptation from, for training. We, we can see that most readily in two places. The dorsal surface of the cannon bone more than doubles, and the posterior cortex of the tibia more than doubles. Not surprisingly, those are our two of our biggest sites of stress fractures in the shafts of the bone. If that adaptation is getting behind, we're going to see the bones start to break down. We're going to see accumulation of damage, and then, and then you get stress fracture and eventually pain. Uh, if you have an inadequate amount of repair or an excessive amount of load, the bone's not going to be able to keep up. And so that ends in the kinds, almost every fracture that we see is a stress fracture in origin. Once a horse reaches a made skeleton, which is usually about four or five races into their career, they don't have to make more skeleton again anymore. They don't have to move the moment of inertia out anymore because they've already produced those bones. And, and our clinical lameness caseload um, refers to that. There are places they have to keep up. And so the overload repair kind of stagnates. What actually happens is this, um, in that, that slowly the skeleton becomes a little bit stronger. That has a lot to do with the um, mineral content of the bone and becomes a little bit stiffer as the horse goes. Biologic systems never reach elasticity. The definition of elasticity is the metal in this bridge is going to bend and come back and bend and come back and as long as it's in the elastic range there's no permanent damage. But if you get into the plastic range, meaning that each time you bend it a little bit of anatomic change occurs, um, then that damage is going to slowly accumulate, and this is why we have to keep an eye on the adult fractures for uh, skeletons for things such as condylar fractures. This is an example of uh, several different horses' shins um, that we're looking at. You can see the, the different methods or different stages all of these horses are in. This is from Dr. Stover's work, who's in the audience. Um, looking at those osteons that are being produced on the surface of the bone because the mechanics of that bone are telling the bone, I need help. And if they get behind, this is what happens. Stress fractures uh, occur, and whether it's in the tibia or whether it's in the metacarpus, in an axially loaded bone, the shear plane is always at 45 degrees, and that's why the stress fracture occurs like that. And if it keeps happening, you, you can progress to this amount of damage. It just creeps its way, actually reaches, most often reaches the surface of the yearling shin and then propagates up. So the bone stiffness is a little different. If you totally ignore it, this is the possibility of what you're going to have happen. You've got to pay attention. Tibial stress fractures, they look exactly 
like dorsal cortical stress fractures. They also look like the stress fractures on the surface of the metacarpus. They will sometimes um, be painful in the early stages here, but sometimes we see the actual stress fracture. The better the trainers get at picking things up, the, the better we are at um, treating them. In the distal cannon bone, you have to change tactics because you can't make the distal cannon bone bigger. It's part of a joint. So there's no way to increase the moment of inertia in the bottom of a cannon bone. What you have to do is change the structure in order to make it stronger. And that results in the disease we all recognize now as being um, probably the single most important disease in the horse, and that is the distal cannon bone, subchondral bone inflammation or uh, bone bruising. Uh, it's been called maladaptation, and I don't really think there's anything wrong with the adaptation. I think we just give the horse the load faster than he can maintain. And so, uh, so th this is a horse that I happen to be doing a fetlock arthrodesis on, but every horse that I've opened up the joint, every thoroughbred that's done significant racing has some version of that bruising in the bottom of the cannon bone. You see it in every racing thoroughbred. So I don't think it's really maladaptation. I think it's just the horse can't keep up. And this is a bone scan, and it shows the hot spots that you see on the bone scan. And now Matthew's going to talk about PET scan. That takes it another level further. Um, in the bone bruising, it can take multiple pads. One is a condylar fracture. Um, that usually happens on the lateral side or occasionally medial, but the, the distal condyle bruising sometimes results in joint collapse and all these other diseases that we attribute to that problem. So how, how do we train bone? What's the best way to train bone in order to make it stronger? Well, this is a really, uh, bone behaves about the same in all species. It's remarkably similar, similar anatomically. This is a study that that I think is, uh, it, it's probably the single most interesting study I've read about bone ever. They used turkeys and they put them in a vise and they made them flap their wings to get fed. And they are looking to see, comparing the one wing to the other wing to see how many flaps it took to make the bone stronger. Once they got to 36 cycles a day in one day's um, episode of work, the bone never got any stronger. All the way up to 2,000 cycles, it never got any stronger. And so somewhere in the neighborhood of 36 cycles is the level at which we need to train bone in order to make it stronger. That's an illustration of the fact that bone trains to the level of work, not the amount. The cardiovascular system trains to the amount of work because you need to ramp up the enzyme systems in the muscles. Um, the heart gets stronger, the horse gets a, a larger number of red blood cells that they store in the spleen. All of that's going on based upon the amount of work that happens. And back when I was at Ohio State, this was in the mid to late 70s, Dr. Fox was one of the people who described interval training. It revolutionized human training. The, the concept is, is that if you're a miler, you break your um, training down into eight to 20 yard segments and you run each of those a little faster than you would in a normal mile and you eventually adapt to that. The reason it works in people is our limiting system is always our cardiovascular system. When this first got described, there were a lot of people lost money th thinking that they were gonna buy horses and interval train them and they were gonna take the whole racing industry by storm. What they got was five-year-old maidens with splints on their hind legs. Horses can't take that amount of training. Their heart and lungs are so good that they just pass the skeleton. The limiting system is always the skeleton in the horse. And so the 36 cycles, if you divide it out, is a little better than a furlong. So the rest of all of the work is microtrauma to the bone. It doesn't do um, any serious damage most of the time, but the best training uh, episode will have a furlong in it 
that's a little faster than the rest of the furlongs. And that shows the horse where they're going to go next week when they breeze. And then you got to do the galloping in order to develop the heart and lungs. But it's not actually good. You know, we, we sort of laud exercise riders that can say the same speed all the way around the track. That's not actually good for the bone because after 36 cycles, the bone doesn't do anything. It actually accumulates damage. So what about this two-year-old blip that, that Tim talked about? Now, now, now we're getting into opinion. I'm going to give you what I believe is the explanation for this, right or wrong. Maybe we can discuss it. If you look at a two-year-old in training training uh, schedule or a, a horse's training schedule, um, for the first October to the first of the year, they're learning what a racetrack looks like, how to respond to the rider. Um, they're getting all their lessons as to what it looks like to train. And then uh, somewhere around the first of the year, plus or minus, they start galloping. And they'll be moving a little faster, a little farther and a little farther as they go. Then when you get to the two to three months before the horse is ready to race, this is a graph of the two-year-old races in the three years that um, Tim talked about. 2019 is in the green, the pink in the middle is 2020, and the, the sort of gray is 2021. So you can see we, we have a few fewer races than 19, but we had less races in 2020 in, in um, the era of the pandemic. Part of that problem was nobody knew when the races were going to open up and all of the races got displaced later in the year. It didn't have as much effect as I thought it would when I looked at the numbers because they change, but they're, they're significant, but they're not huge. So once we got to racing, um, the, the um, number of races made up the difference. So one of the jobs of the Survey Safety Committee, Matt actually uh, gives us these charges. So we're, we were looking at two-year-old fatalities data, which uh, Tim has talked about. If you look at the number of fatalities by year, um, you can see there's a jump uh, in the fatalities in uh, 2020. The, the absolute numbers are here. It didn't happen in older horses, as he showed you. If you look at the actual fatalities by month, I don't really know other than the fact that September was really the year that most racetracks opened up. Um, the Derby was delayed until um, September. The stakes races are all kind of happening there. So um, the, the two-year-olds are getting the opportunities to race. I, I, I don't know why the December spike, but I think it might be the fact that most horses change tracks after Thanksgiving. They go south for the winter. And then the new racing at those tracks starts. And of course, during the Christmas um, meet, you're going to have the opportunity to have huge crowds. So I think there's some drive in order to get the horses to race there. So if you look at two-year-old racing opportunities, um, I took the data as far as um, two-year-old races total and two-year-old race days, and you can see how um, they differ. If you look at them, um, you're not going to be able to read this, but I'll just tell you. Uh, somehow you have to normalize the data to the number of races. So I divided, or I took the highest number, which is always 2019, and that's one, and then divided the number of races of the rest of the years into that number, and then um, divided the uh, number of fatalities by that number, which normalizes the rate of fatalities. So that, that's if you take the same number of races all of the years. This is what you would have you've got a 25% increase in the number of fatalities in the two-year-olds, which he's already shown you the blip as to what, what happened in that middle year. And then in the next year, it goes back down. So what's the deal? Here's if you plot the fatalities by month, um, looking at the numbers rather than by year, you can see those two spikes. And those spikes aren't directly related to the racing opportunities. They, they have um, something to do 
with the training of the horse. So what happened? This is what I think happened. Now, now you're, we're strongly into opinions here. When you're talking to the trainers during the first half of that year, they're all just galloping their two-year-olds. There's really no reason to tighten the spring and wind those horses up with breezes when you don't know when they're going to race because their schedules are all dictated about when they're going to mature and um, get to a race. So I think they increase the galloping significantly and then they squeeze the breezes together and maybe a little harder. His work data um, shows that to some degree. Um, what that does is we've now wound up the engine a much higher level than we've wound up the undercarriage. So the hearts, since heart muscles and lungs train more to the amount of work that they get, not to the level of work that they get, if you're just galloping the same speed, the bone's not making much adaptation here. But if you ask it to adapt in that short a period of time, it's got to make more adaptation in a faster period of time, plus you compound the, the problem of the, the faster breathing schedule with the fact that the hearts and lungs are more mature than the skeleton is. Because we didn't breathe those horses on a normal schedule like you do every year. Um, and the fact that the data, the fatality data came back to normal in 2021, I think is an indication that um, that's a possibility for why whenever we lengthen this space here to where we didn't get the over repair and then breeze them quicker and got them to the races, they were more vulnerable. They could go faster and the skeleton wasn't as prepared. This has a lot to do also with um, our day-to-day -day treating of lamenesses. It's very hard to improve on, for the skeleton on the healing properties of putting a horse in the field with grass. That, the reason that, that I prefer that when we're treating something is you actually want to prevent the horse from training his heart and lungs further because the skeleton has something to heal up. And if you keep him wound up and just slow him down enough that he can heal his bone problems and then open him up again, um, the, the skeleton is more vulnerable. I think that has something to do with the fact that if a horse is ever on the vet's list, his possibility of injury rises. Again, when he goes, possibility of fatality goes back to the racetrack, it stays higher. It has a lot to do with the fact that uh, training is more important than uh, racing because there's more of it. So if you train a horse on artificial surfaces, as Tim just showed us, and then you switch him to dirt, his skeleton is not prepared. He's not, it, training is work specific. And so you're, you're asking him to race on a skeleton that has been trained on a surface that didn't prepare it. And, and so just going someplace and race, I think if we could figure out what surface all of those horses were training on, I think the difference that he showed would be even more dramatic. Because when you train only on a very kind surface, and then we all know that dirt is not as kind as artificial surface, and you put the horse on a surface that requires a lot of the skeleton, it's not ready. And so it's real important that we train two-year-old horses, young horses, immature horses, at a, at a schedule that both trains the heart and lungs, that's the amount of work, and trains the skeleton, which is the level of work. And you have to balance both of those. If you get them out of whack, you run the risk that you're gonna overload the skeleton someplace and you're gonna have some kind of injury. So I think the pandemic really had an effect because it disturbed this system of gradually sneaking up on a horse's skeleton to where when you get them to four or five races, then you've got a made skeleton and all you have to do is to maintain it. That's it, I guess we're done.
Thank you very much, Dr. Bramledge. The California racing industry has undertaken many safety initiatives in the last three years, from heightening surveillance before, during, and after morning training to afternoon racing and investing in technology. One of the key links to making these initiatives successful are the relationships between the track and practicing veterinarians. In addition to numerous safety initiatives and protocols adopted in California racing, a program has been started aimed at horses who have endured fetlock injuries by performing fetlock arthrodesis. To discuss all of this, I'd like to welcome Dr. Dion Benson, Chief Veterinary Officer for the Stronic Group Racing and Gaming, and Dr. Ryan Carpenter, Surgeon at the Equine Medical Center. So in true fashion of trying to work together, um, Ryan and I are going to just freely comment on each other's presentation. We've worked together for three years now, and uh, he's one of my first calls when we ever have an issue. So my job is really to talk about the prevention of, of injury, and Ryan helps us fix those that do happen. Um, for those of you who know, uh, we had a little bit of an issue in the spring, winter of 2019. If you're not aware, then you're probably pretty new to the industry. Um, at Santa Anita, we had a significant spike, which if you look at the data, wasn't actually a significant spike compared to previous years. It was just much more publicized. Um, so we had to look and figure out what we were gonna do and change in racing and training. We were really on the precipice of ending racing in California. We had many, um, individuals, groups, significant stakeholders that were calling for change in racing and training um, because of the number of fatalities as well as the high profile of some of those fatalities. Uh, I'm gonna talk about two general areas we looked into. The first was racing. We did some, made some drastic changes to how we raced in California. And I'm just talking about the veterinary perspective. Obviously, there are some other things that went into this. Um, we really decreased medication in racing. We were the first jurisdiction in the U.S. to go to a 14-day stand-down after intraarticular corticosteroids. Um, we got rid of stacking of medications. We decreased, and that has actually gone to a 30-day stand-down on racing and training for horses that have had fetlock injections. Um, and then we moved non anti-inflammatories from 24 to 48 hours. This is something that the industry had been calling to do, the AAP had been calling to do, and it really took this moment in time in California to make it happen. Um, one of the things that I think helped the most, and we've done this in both racing and training, was to require the private veterinarians to sign off on the horses. Um, three days prior to entry, they are required to look at horses at a trot and um, okay them to race, basically. Uh, and I think Brian could certainly say that it has made a change in how he practices. Um, we definitely see the veterinarians taking more proactive role. We've gotten them back into the role of being a veterinarian. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Um, in our, our big kind of well-managed barns, we were doing this beforehand. But we all, and as practitioners, have those barns that kind of just utilize you on an as-needed basis. And so this puts you right in the front of the trainer uh, with the groom, foreman, and you're looking at these horses on a regular basis. And so you're able to have the conversations on an ongoing basis to discuss, is this time to um, work the horse? Should we back off on a little bit? And it's been a good working relationship um, with us and the practitioners, both the regulatory side and uh, the barns in general. And so, I mean, really, we were giving the, the vets the opportunity, and most of them have taken it and run with it and really enjoyed being the decision makers in the barns again. Um, we also do, and this is something that I believe every racetrack in the country should do, we have two vets on site, and one of them, as most tracks, follows the veterinarian or follows the field to the gate. The other one, while the, the field is moving to the gate, they actually watch the horses warm up because it's impossible to drive around to the horses while watching them. So this is a very cheap, ineffective, easy way, or effective and easy way to get 
eyes on these horses. Um, they actually have a mic to the producer of the, the show and they're able to ask to look at horses for a longer period of time. Um, and because of this, we've actually had horses scratched on the, on the track. Uh, we also have big race day protocols, for better or worse. We all know that there are days when there are more eyes on us than others. Um, and for those instances, we have additional protocols that are present. We require horses to be on the grounds longer. Um, er any horse that is racing that day, for example, the Pegasus Day, even if it is not in the Pegasus, is required to wear a numbered saddle towel. And we um, examine those horses if needed. We have people watching the, the horses train and we require 14 days of, of medical records to be submitted. The biggest opportunity that we had to make change was training. Prior to 2019 in Santa Anita, our sole responsibility for most of training was to provide the surface, to groom the surface on a regular basis and to um, make it prepared for racing and then allow people to do training as they saw fit. Um, I think that the more options or opportunities you have for interaction with the, the horseman and the horse, the more you can Im ensure its safety. So we really aggressively um, went after training as a way to help um, improve safety. So we controlled medication for official works or for all works. Any time to work, we controlled every medication that could be seen to mask pain non-steroidals, corticosteroids, opioid analgesics, all of those um, local anesthetics were controlled and randomly tested for after training. We didn't see very many violations, but truly this, this helped us to see horses as they were. Um, again, we required the private vet exam and saw, you know, it, I think it really also helped strengthen the relationship between our vets and the, the attending vets and allowed them to, to start to work together and trust one another. I've had more than one occasion where a private vet has been trying to get something done in a barn and couldn't, and so we're always in the barns and we can go and say, hey, this horse can't train anymore until it has this diagnostic, which wouldn't have been possible before this, this interaction. Uh, we require at Santa Anita all horses register for works. That starts a protocol that basically triggers a review of the past performances, a risk assessment, and we do um, a, a, a portion of every day's works we do exams on. Um, we scratch anywhere between one and eight horses a week from working and require diagnostics, require intervention by their private veterinarian, um, and it really, it's just one more opportunity for us to see how that horse is doing. One of the biggest frustrations I have is, you know, even, even at the best tracks, when we're just doing an exam every race, you're limited to how many exams you're going to see on that horse. Some horses you're only going to see a, a handful of times a year, even if they race at your track and only at your track. Because especially in California, we are so work heavy and so race light that we, don't, we wouldn't get to see these horses very often, and that represents a ton of risk that you have no control over. So really, this is truly an opportunity for us to see these horses, um, and I think, again, it's a, an opportunity for us to work with the private vets and have that be a second set of eyes and really a support for them to get what they need done. Um, again, we do, uh, since September 2019, we've examined 7,400 unique, unique horses at San, Santa Anita, and we've done over 21,000 exams in three years that would have not been done but for this program. This does not include pre-race exams, this is specifically pre-work examinations. Plus the private veterinary exams, plus, I mean, there's just so much, so many eyes on this horse and so many, these horses and so many opinions. Uh, we also did some random drug testing and training that was taken over by the CHRB as they started to regulate this, and we didn't see many violations, but we were certainly glad to see that. And one of the most important things is just having people at the track. Virtually every one of our tracks and training facilities, every day we have someone watching horses train. That's not just California, that is Maryland, Florida, our training facilities. And we see things that we would not see any other time. It just, it makes a huge difference. Um, we can ask horses to leave the track. We can ex follow up with horses that are unsound, call the vets. 
the private veterinarians, and it just makes a huge difference. So does it work? Um, if you look at 2018, this is, this is the ironic irony in all of this. We actually had a, this, about the same number of fatalities in 2018 and 2019. We had fewer races in 2019 because we canceled a lot of races. Um, as you can see in 2020, we saw our fatality rate almost drop in half in both racing and training. And then in 2021, we saw that about the same. Now, I don't know if you've read the papers. We just finished a six long, month long meet at Santa Anita and we had um, three fatalities in racing. One musculos, or excuse me, two musculoskeletal on the turf and one sudden death on the dirt. So that means we had on the least safe surface that we have, we had zero fatalities in six months of racing. Um, so I think it's working. I don't know that we'll ever do that, that well again. I'm hoping we do, I hoping, I'm hoping we do even better. Um, and we haven't pushed a lot of our fatalities to training. We had five musculoskeletal fatalities and one um, what they call other, a fatality in the stall. So for a big training facility with hundreds of thousands of works, uh, we're doing pretty well and I hope we continue to do that well, but it is certainly a team effort. It is not just the veterinarians, it is the trainers and the, the owners and the private veterinarians. And the one thing that is, impresses me the most is we really have changed to a, a culture of safety out there. Very few people will take that shot to enter that horse to get that one last race, whereas in other places I've been, in other places we have tracks, we tend to see that a little bit more aggressive attitude. Um, I think that really there is a, a conscious effort to put the horse first there. And I think it's important, and the reason that we know we're doing better is we continually monitor our training and tracks, our training facilities and tracks. Um, before I started, we didn't always uh, record every time an injury occurred. At a minimum, all my vets catch every time the ambulance, the horse ambulance moves, and often they get more information than that, and we try to track our data long term. So that is what I have, and I will turn it over to Ryan. Thank you, Dion. I'm going to shift now from a surgeon's perspective. Um, as an orthopedic surgeon, uh, based in Southern California. I deal with a lot of these uh, injuries, and as soon as the slides come up, we'll get rolling. Easier said than done. Hmm? Easier said than done. Here we go. All right, so as an orthopedic surgeon, we are often presented with different fractures that we repair on a regular basis. And our intent here is to preserve their racing career. And in a lot of cases, we have very good prognoses for these horses that come back um, and run at the level they did prior to injury. But what happens when things get complicated? So either based on the severity of the injury or the complexity of the repair, they might not have as good of a prognosis for a racing career but an alternative career with light exercise may be very favorable. The catastrophic fetlock failure or the breakdown injury is one of the most common causes of a fatal incident for racehorses in North America. And thankfully to the advances of surgical techniques, we're able to repair these fractures with very good success. These are three different injuries that all fall under the same category and with um, the, approaching them in a slightly different manner, we're able to have a good outcome. So today I'd like to describe California's approach to a breakdown injury. I'd like to share with you a few examples of some horses that we've followed years out of, of surgery. And then finally, I'd like to just talk about some of the myths that I know are circulating around the industry about what's going on in California. So we all recognize that fatal injuries have a tremendous impact on our industry. This is not only on a local level in California, but also on a national and even an international level. There is an editorial written in the LA Times that said, fewer racehorses are dying, but still too many. Interestingly, this was written last year when we saw a tremendous improvement in safety and welfare in our horses. And they concluded by basically saying, if we want to continue to do what we're doing, horses need to stop dying. 
So that presented an interesting um, avenue for us uh, about three years ago because we recognize that there's a percentage of horses that undergo an injury that are euthanized because of either the complexity of the injury or the finances required to um, repair the injury. And in our world in Southern California, our neighbors don't understand the difference between a quote unquote cheap horse or an expensive horse. So we wanted to ask the question that if you removed finances from the discussion, is there a population of horse that we have historically put down that might have the opportunity for uh, surgical intervention? And so in order to do this, we needed to have some good conversations with a lot of the industry stakeholders. We needed to talk from a short-term perspective from the racetrack organizations themselves. We involved the thoroughbred owners of California. And then of course, we have to involve the owner and the trainer. But from a long-term perspective, we needed to talk to our second career organizations because we all know, and it's a very hot topic in AEP right now, that animal welfare is an important um, piece of our equation. And there's no value in us creating a burden on the aftercare program just to address the immediate problem. So there are four factors that I believe are really critical if you want to institute this type of program at your racetrack. Uh, the first one is, is appropriate and immediate first aid. I think if we can get these legs splinted, bandaged, even before radiographs are taken, we have a tremendous impact to prevent soft tissue swelling, and this has a huge um, value for the surgeon in the aftercare of these horses. Originally, when I first started doing these, we would often have to suture um, the incisions closed because of the amount of tension on our incision but now we routinely just staple them because we haven't allowed them to swell as dramatically. Another important component is a consultation by uh, a surgeon and preferably someone with considerable expertise in this field. And that's because through looking at the radiographs, evaluating the horse, taking all the factors together, you can have pretty good case selection here. There are certainly cases that you can try and there's certainly cases that would not warrant um, surgical intervention. And so that consultation, I think, is critical. Financial responsibility is a big factor here. The first question people asked in the beginning was who's gonna pay for this? And we all know that when you see the radiographs that I'll show next, when you put plates and screws and legs and you're talking about months long of rehab, these are not cheap procedures. Um, so having the conversation on who's invested in this horse, both from an industry standpoint and from an owner and trainer standpoint, who's paying for what is a critical conversation to have prior to surgery. That way there's no surprises and everyone's on the same page. And then probably the most important factor is the aftercare. From a surgeon's perspective, the surgery is gonna take me a couple hours, the aftercare is gonna take me a couple weeks, but the second career for these horses in these aftercare programs is gonna be measured in the magnitude of years. These are often three, four-year-old racehorses that are gonna live for a decade or longer. And it's important to have a good relationship with aftercare programs who are willing to take on these cases because not all of them are willing to. But when you identify those ones that are, we really gotta cultivate that relationship. So when all these factors are in place, the program actually works quite well. Where it can become a little complicated is when insurance is involved. And so unfortunately, there's an aspect of our industry that sometimes horses are worth more dead than alive when they're insured. And so I really wanna challenge the insurance companies to think about how we look at this um, injury. They might not necessarily need to be euthanized in order to have an insurance payout, and this would be kind of mirrored to what we do in the show horses from the wobbler perspective. A lot of times these horses are able to, the owners are able to collect their insurance policy, but they don't demand euthanasia. So when we set out to do this, we had some goals. From a short-term perspective, we wanted to look at the survival rate at discharge for about a month after surgery. And what's their quality of life? I mean, we have no desire to put a horse through unnecessary pain and suffering just to quote unquote, an avoid a fatality. But I think what you'll see when you do these cases is based on the type of fixation, it's a very solid, stable fixation. These horses are actually quite comfortable a lot sooner than you would expect. And they have a good quality of life in the short term. But that's not where we stop. We've got to follow them out long term. We've got to look at these horses 6, 12, and 24 months down the road. And we've got to be able to ask the question, are they happy horses? Do they live on non-steroidals in order to remain pain-free lives? 
and are they a burden to the caretaker? And thankfully, when we followed these horses out, they have not been in the category that the caretaker says they're a burden on them, they don't live on non-steroidals, and they're actually quite healthy and happy horses. So that leads us to ask the question is, are our preconceived notions of the fetlock arthrodesis still true? Uh, a wise veterinarian once said, you'll remember your first one, your last one, and your worst one. And I think this is important because if that was a bad experience five years ago, you're probably not gonna be really excited about trying it again. But what I've seen in Santa Anita over the years is the veterinarians that have had negative outlooks on the fetlock arthrodesis have changed their attitude towards it, have been a little bit more willing to embrace it moving forward because they see the outcomes that we have. So I'm gonna share just a couple cases with you real quick. This is what I would consider a very straightforward fetlock arthrodesis. Um, the things that I like about this from a radiographic standpoint, you've got a large basilar um, lateral fragment of your sesamoid bone that you can incorporate in your repair. Um, the sesamoid bones are generally where they belong. They're not really distracted, and there's minimal soft tissue um, swelling. So this is a typical repair. Uh, it's a little overwhelming when you see it for the first time, but, um, and there's a lot of money in that leg with locking plates and cables, but this is a very stable repair. And this is the horse eight months after surgery. The uh, owner of this horse is actually using this horse for riding and is very happy um, with the outcome. The horse is not living on butte. You can see that this is what, for all intents and purposes, a very happy horse. Now, it took time to get there, but the outcome was very favorable. Here we have a more severe fracture. We've got a lateral condylar fracture and pastern fracture incorporated in this uh, right hind breakdown. But the approach is relatively similar. Same thing, plate screws, a little longer plate because of the fracture of the condyle and um, bit being a hind leg. Um, but again, here she is a year later um, and you'll see her um, running around the paddock. She does have a right hind mechanical lameness. Um, that's not uncommon for these horses. Uh, it seems to be more pronounced in the hind than in the front. And so that's just because of her inability to move her fetlock and her flex her fetlock. So as an industry, we're very comfortable dealing with pain-associated lameness. We don't deal with a lot of mechanical lameness, um, but this filly is, um, is very happy and, and not on medication. So the several things that I've learned over the years, um, one is um, first aid at the track level is absolutely critical. Uh, early on in my career, one of my biggest fears was blood supply issues to the foot. Um, and it, it's interesting if we look back at the ones we've done more recently as our uh, first aid has significantly improved, that hasn't really been um, a, a, a complication that we've experienced very well and that also um, I think is related to the good case selection that we have. Uh, one size does not fit all, um, and so you've gotta be willing as a surgeon to pivot your approach, and I really use my sesamoid bones to dictate what technique I'm going to do. And then the final one is uh, trust your repair. Um, these repairs are solid, they're stable, and that results in a happy, comfortable horse um, post-operatively. Uh, this actually is a picture of a distal femoral plate that they use in people, I was talking with a, a friend of mine that's an orthopedic surgeon that uses this in people, and you know, he was saying that when he puts this in a person, he um, makes them lay in a bed for four to six weeks, and he was just shocked that as horses, they stand up a couple hours after surgery. And, and because our repairs are so stable, we're able to get them out of casts earlier. I don't believe horses were designed to live in casts, and so historically we've left them in casts for uh, several weeks or months, but I will routinely take mine out of the cast at days after surgery. And um, as solid as this repair is, the horses are do well, and we um, minimize the risk of the skin complications from horses living in casts. So I'll finish off by just talking about some of the myths. Um, the first one is it's inhumane to put a horse through this type of surgery. Um, from a purely medical and veterinary perspective, the fetlock arthrodesis procedure itself is not an inhumane procedure, and I think we all agree upon that. Now, does that mean every horse should go, undergo an arthrodesis? And the answer is no. I think we have to respect our owners and, and their um, opinions on the procedure, um, but what I can tell you is when I have an owner that is, uh, is initially very reluctant to this, and you have to remember, 
Their horse just broke down. There's a lot of stress, emotion going on right now. Um, people tend to make quick knee-jerk reactions. But when I can pull that owner aside, I can share them the experiences that we've had, share them some of the data that we've, we've accumulated in California, they're generally willing to, to have a little bit of a mind shift. And so I would just um, suggest, you know, when the, when the injury happens, hit the pause button, take a deep breath. Um, we have historically um, been very quick to respond um, in terms of euthanasia when these injuries happen, but simply hitting the pause button, giving some time for everybody to get on the same page um, works well. I think one of the things we learned very quickly in this is we were very early on required everyone to do radiographs unless it was an open fracture or more than one limb was involved. And that gave us the time to make decisions slowly. You can euthanize very quickly. You can't take it back, but you, you take time to make those decisions slowly, and we usually get to the right one. I t definitely agree. Um, the next one is that they'll never have a good quality of life. Um, and that's not what we've experienced when we followed our horses um, over the last several years. Um, I have an Excel spreadsheet of every horse that I've done since we started doing this program, and I know exactly where they are, and I will routinely follow up with them you know, every six months and just say, how's this horse doing? Because at the end of the day, I didn't become a surgeon or a veterinarian to burden our industry with unwanted horses. I did it to provide value and an asset to our community. And we, when we took on this approach, we were very willing to say, if we get a year, two, three years down the road and this is not working, we, we will stop because there is a bigger goal in mind here. Um, the other one is that you will do anything just to keep your numbers down. Um, and again, that's not true. Um, and I think that's reflected through a couple things. Um, number one, um, our success rate is right around 70%, and that's through good case selection. We are not unwilling to euthanize horses. Um, that's always an option, and it needs to remain an option um, for our clients and for our, for our athletes. Um, but what we're just asking our population of owners and horses is to consider a different approach than you have before in the past. Um, it, it would serve me no good from a um, integrity and transparency standpoint to stand up here and say, in the last two years I've done 20 arthrodesis and two of them have survived. That accomplishes nothing for what we're trying to do. But when we can look back and say, here are the horses, here are we're, what we're doing, this will bring credibility to an area of conversation that's historically been looked upon in a different light in our industry. And in an ideal world, and Matthew's gonna talk a lot about this this afternoon with the PET scan, the PET scan's been a huge benefit to us at Santa Anita. It's been a huge benefit for identifying these at-risk individuals, and when he shows you some of these information and these images, it's, you're, gonna, you're gonna be really excited to see it. I would love to not do another arthrodesis, again, because we've intervened with these horses prior to the fracture occurring. We also recognize that that's not the reality of the world that we live in. And so they, we just have to be willing to accept that there is going to be a population of horses that needs to have this intervention. And if you look back at us in the last six months of all racetracks in California, this is Santa Anita, Golden Gate Fields, and Los Alamitos, we've done a total of six. So the, the thing that I get told a lot is you're doing a high, high number of these. And it's not, and, and my goal is that it becomes less and less every year um, because we're better at what we do and uh, the safety factor has is, is definitely been seen with a cultural change. So I'll leave you with one last video. Um, this um, gelding is about two years out. He's the one in the back. You can see him running through our lush California pasture. I know this is different than what your definition of a pasture is in Lexington, but um, this in California is sometimes as good as we get. So thank you. Yeah, and just one other thing. I think it's very interesting what Ryan was talking about, about placing the horses. The last couple of times we've actually had this happen, we've had people from the community step up and want to take one of these horses. So instead of becoming a burden, we have people who are so interested in what we're doing, we're working with other programs, and really they, these horses are finding really great homes um, and really great second careers. So.
Peter, and it is great to hear all the positivity that is coming out of California and the success with these initiatives. We are now going to take a 10 minute break and we'll resume back shortly to hear from Dr. Hill. Racing.net is a sport for you. Live it, love it, bet it.
Hello, welcome back everyone. For anyone who is not back in the pavilion, if you could start filtering in as we get started with our next presentation. Equally important to horse safety is the health of our riders. And as part of a long-term plan to modernize weight rooms, the British Horse Racing Authority in November of 2021 announced the removal of all saunas and developed a set of minimal standards, minimum standards for jockeys' quarters. In January of this year, the BHA followed the sauna removal with a two pound increase in the minimum weights for both jump and flat races. I'd now like to welcome Dr. Jerry Hill, Chief Medical Advisor for the British Horse Racing Authority to discuss supporting our human athletes and present on jockeys, jockey weights, well-being, and fitness. So good morning, everyone. Um, Thank you very much for that uh, introduction um, and my thanks to Jamie and the Jockey Club for inviting me all the way from London to come and talk with you today. Um, I've got a few declarations for you. I think one of the first things to say is, I'm sorry, there's, an, there's another Brit on the stage, so apologies for that. Um, I'm also not a vet, um, so that really begs the question, what on earth am I doing here today? Um, the other minor point, I actually haven't ridden a horse since I was 11, so don't judge me on that too much. So why am I here? I'm here to talk about the other athlete. That will be the human athlete, the jockey. Um, and I'm just gonna run through some uh, comments uh, so I can share the experiences we've had in the UK with you guys here. And hopefully there'll be some mutual learning. So GB racing involves an awful lot of stakeholders. I guess it's probably the same over here in the States as well. Um, and there's a list of them here on the stage, on, on the screen here. And one of the interesting things about COVID, one of the many, many interesting things about COVID, is actually, as an industry, we got together and we actually started to talk to each other better than perhaps we'd ever done before. Um, and that's one of the things, hopefully, which will be a legacy of COVID, that we will continue to actually talk to each other rather than work in silos. So on the screen, I'd say there's a number of stakeholders there, and you've got these sort of operational ones at the top, so that's ourselves at the BHA, colleagues from the Professional Jockeys Association, uh, the Injured Jockeys Fund, which are our main supporting charity to help with the injuries, um, colleagues from the RCA, and then we move into training with a couple of training colleges, and we actually have quite a lot of academic partners now because we certainly facilitate research in the UK into our jockey athletes. So I started racing, oh, it's 20 odd years ago now, um, working on the racetracks, providing trauma care to, to jockeys. And in the run-up to the London 2012 Olympics, I retrained in sports medicine um, and started to work as a sports physician, both in football and continuing to work in racing. Uh, sorry, when I say football, you probably know that's soccer. Uh, we call it proper football in the UK. So I worked in proper football, and I worked for proper football clubs, and I worked um, for the national squads. And I worked for the FA, and working at the FA, um, it was a very interesting experience because when you work for a national squad, actually, there are no limitations on resource. And so actually, what you want, you tend to get. And they were developing at the time this four-corner model for training the developing athlete. So that was looking at the technical and tactical side of things, the psychological, the physical, and the social. Um, and actually, to be honest, in, in the UK in the early years, we were pretty good at the technical and tactical. We were pretty poor at the physical. And this came to light. I brought a development squad to the, to the US, um, and we were much better technically, but they walloped us. And they walloped us because they ran and ran and ran. And it occurred to me, actually, what we need to be doing is actually developing the physical side of our athletes and not just looking at the technical and tactical side of things. So th translating that, we begin to think, well, actually, could we transfer this into, into racing? Um, and at the time, I was relatively new into racing and naively thought, well, that's great. I'll go in and save the world. But actually, a lot of it was already happening. And you can see on here that these are the sort of subsections within that four-corner model. Clearly, the stuff in the red box is all about football. Um, but a lot of the other stuff really does apply to our jockey athletes. So we began to think about jockeys as athletes um, and this was a bit of a shift because up until that point jockeys were just jockeys they were riders they were jockeys but as soon as you start to treat them as elite athletes that brings a shift in mindset 
And it begins a shift in mindset amongst them as individuals, but also amongst those who work around them. If you're an elite athlete, you expect and you deserve a certain level of support, whether that's strength and conditioning, physiotherapy, nutrition, psychology, the whole nine yards. So changing the name actually became a really quite useful thing. At the time, uh, I had a conversation with the English Institute of Sport about something called talent transfer. And we were looking about, okay, how do we get more jockeys coming into the sport? Um, and the English Institute of Sport said to me, oh, that's great, okay, just t tell me what, you know, what, what benchmarks do, do, do people wanting to become a jockey have to reach? It was actually quite a short conversation because we didn't have any benchmarks at all. Um, I think I mumbled something, well, it'd be quite nice if they were able to make weight, but actually we didn't know much more about it. And so what's happened, and we still have it running, there's a PhD running at John Moore's University in Liverpool um, called Defining the Jockey Athlete. And we're trying to work out what are the characteristics of a successful jockey. That's from a physical point of view, physiologically, psychologically. So that's work in progress. Clearly there's some stuff which is self-evident and actually a relatively unique to jockeys compared to other athletes. They're self-employed. They're single athletes, they're not a team sport, and that always makes it more difficult to train them, but there are plenty of other single athletes around. They have this, in the UK, this relentless schedule, not just from a racing and competition point of view, but actually they tend to hold full-time jobs as well, so they will get up at five o'clock in the morning, they will ride out, they will muck out, and eventually they might go racing in the afternoon. So that schedule, 363 days a year, is absolutely relentless and it involves driving all over. Okay, it's not a very big country I live in, but actually, if you're driving several hundred miles for a single ride, it's a big country. And then, there is the weights. Okay, weights. So I was always told, if you do a presentation, try and get a picture of a cute animal into it. So here's my picture of a cute animal. Um, but it's also, it's the elephant in the room, and I'm absolutely not saying that a jockey looks like an elephant standing on scales, but, Weight's a funny thing in racing because we talk about it a lot and actually we don't talk about it a lot. Um, and it's been a bit of an issue. During COVID, uh, you know, when we stood down for six weeks and we managed to get COVID, uh, the racing going again, I had a conversation with a jockey who'd come back. And at the time, as we would come to, we'd lifted the, the weights because of the absence of saunas. And I remember having this conversation with a jockey and up until that stage, going into the changing room where the jockeys were was a bit of a scary event because they were usually not very happy people. And I went in there and it was actually a changed environment and I was speaking to one of the jockeys and he was describing his definition of success. And prior to COVID, his definition of success was getting on the scales and making weight. It was not how he performed on the racetrack. It was not where he was placed in the race. Success was making weight. And I thought that was really sad for a professional athlete. Um, and it's one of those things that we, know, we definitely need to address that. So what about weights? Where are we? Okay, so this is the story of minimum flat weights in the UK. And as you can see, we started at an incredibly low weight in the 70s, a seven stone, uh, seven pounds. And it has gradually crept up over time. And it goes up probably a couple of pounds every 10 years if you're going to average it out. And you can see that numbers are starting to appear in brackets on this slide. Um, and they start to appear because this is the allowances that begin to become introduced for safety equipment. So these are extra weight uh, allowed at scales. So this is not declared to the racing public. So 2012, um, there was an extra couple of pounds because back then we were using a level one body protector. Uh, I think you're still using in the States so the tipper area is a common example of that. Um, and then in 2018, we increased it to a level two, so a heavy, heavier body protector, and they got an extra three pounds of scales, which is quite interesting because the body protector over time, as the technology has improved, the weight has actually come down. So actually, your body protector gives you 1.2 pounds of weight. So there you go. You've already got a bonus there because actually you get more than you expect. So what happened in 2020? Well, apparently a virus appeared in 2020, um, which uh, caused us all a lot of stress. Um, and one of the things we had to do at that point is to really nail down the infection control in race courses because we had the spectre that actually public health authorities said if we had a single case in an enclosed environment on the race course, everyone in that space would be quarantined for 14 days. And it only takes a few of those in a crowded jockey's change room before you go, actually, we run out of jockeys, we cannot race. So as a consequence, saunas were closed. 
Um, as you will learn, I'm not very upset that saunas were closed, but they were closed nonetheless. Um, and we really quickly had to come out with some compensation for the absence of saunas. Um, the other absence was gyms in the UK were also closed, and so that was another opportunity for jockeys not to be able to make weight easily. So they told me, it's all right, Doc, we only lose a couple of pounds in the saunas. Yes, of course you do, I said. Um, but nonetheless, that's what they said, and so a three-pound weight allowance came in. So suddenly at scales, they were getting six pounds extra, three for the body protector, three for the absence of saunas and gyms. Um, and that, in combination with the fact we restrict them to a single race meeting a day, was transformative for their attitude and well-being. So actually, COVID in that respect, lots of other troubles, but COVID in that respect was actually quite helpful to the jockeys. Now, latterly, um, we've been through another post-COVID uh, uh, debate about what we're doing about weights, and where, what you see on the screen is where we are now. So minimum weights of both flat and jump codes have gone up. Um, by two pounds, so eight stone two for the, for the flat and ten stone two for the jumps, um, and we've arrived at an extra four pounds personal allowance, which is given at scales. Now that's all very well, but actually, if you look at the picture, jockeys do come in different heights, okay, and we apply the same set of rules regardless of your height. So if you just hold that thought, because that's something which is important. So whenever you talk about weights, people go. Yeah, yeah, population's getting bigger. So it's getting bigger, and therefore, actually, you must put the weights up. And it's, it's, not, it's not an incorrect argument. Um, so on this slide here, you see we've got um, ourselves, colleagues in Ireland, because we work very closely with the Irish, and we put the Dutch on here. And the Dutch are on here because they are the giants of Europe. Okay, and so these are the really tall people. So yes, over the last 100 years, people have got taller. However, they've actually stopped getting taller in, in the UK. Actually, they got stopped getting taller in the 80s, probably something to do with the music at the time. But anyway, they've stopped getting taller. Um, so actually, it's a little bit of a spurious argument. Um, so you just have to be careful, look at your stats carefully. Um, the other thing which has happened, of course, is that people are getting bigger. Well, actually, when you say bigger, you mean fatter, and actually BMI is going up. So congratulations, United States. Here you are, top of this graph, to show that actually you guys are getting bigger. But remember, all these graphs are to do with the population of the whole country, not necessarily the population of your sport, of your industry. And actually, I can tell you that the population of jockeys, they are getting taller. I know because they're taller than me, and obviously I'm six foot eight. Um, so you know, they are getting bigger. So it is, it is, a, you know, it is an important argument. The other thing which is really important is this. So this is a, you know, the, don't worry, it's the only sort of vaguely stat slides we're going to have on here. So this is a normal distribution. You'll be familiar with this. Two important points in this. So first off, there are two genders on here, okay? And one of the great things about racing in the UK is that men and women compete on equal basis, more or less. It's not entirely true. There are still less women in the sport than there should be, but there are more coming in. Um, but they are shorter than men. And bearing in mind that largely your ability to make weight is a, has a relationship with your height, and of course your height is your genetic potential plus your nutritional state, then actually women have a considerable advantage over the chaps. But actually if you look at the normal distribution even for the men, it's got quite a wide base to it. And actually if I was to recruit jockeys from the entire population of the UK, I would find plenty at the left-hand end of that curve, at the shorter end of the curve, where I could actually find jockeys to e easily make weight. The problem is, that's not the population we're recruiting from. So recruitment is an important issue that I'll come back to. So before COVID hit, you know, there was lots of conversations and, and talking to my colleagues at John Moores University, who do a lot of our racing research, um, about our population. And looking at our apprentice jockeys, and you can see here, this is a paper that we published on the apprentice jockeys. Um, and essentially what we were saying even before COVID was that actually the weights were too low for actually most of our participants who were already involved in the sport, who already embarked on their career to actually make weights. Um, and looking at the numbers there, um, 
in the time period looked at, there were 41 apprentices who joined the sport, 32 of them went up to John Moores, and they all had their body composition done. And even if we reduced their body fat down to 2.5 kg, which, to be honest, is pretty low, it should really be about 5 kg, um, most of them were not going to be able to make weight with the current weight structure. Um, and what we were doing, we were almost writing their destiny for them, which was to say, actually, you're going to have to do things which are not good for your body to make weight. And as a medic, that's a really difficult thing to accept. Interesting, during COVID, when the weights went up and this service still continued at John Moores, uh, the next cohort came along, none of them turned up dehydrated for their assessment, whereas the ones in the original study did. So there was already a short-term gain. So what about making weight? Making weight, so the elephant in the room. So these are the, the ways you'll all be familiar with of how jockeys make weight, uh, and there's a heavy bias towards dehydration. So that's everything from fluid restriction to saunas or hot boxes, as you call them in the States, salt baths, burying yourself in your neck in piles of manure, and generally sweating to actually try and get your weight down. Interesting, uh, flipping is an issue in the UK. You know, it's, it's, uh, allegedly, we imported it from the States. I'm not sure that's true or fair, but flipping self-induced vomiting does go on. And actually, COVID gave us a little bonus on that because we were actually able to ban flipping because flipping involved vomiting. If you vomited on a race course during COVID, you were thought to have COVID and you immediately stood down for 14 days. Um, and actually, interestingly, we had less, we didn't have none, but we had less flipping on the race courses. The other thing which has been an issue in the past about laxatives and diuretic use, that has largely faded away in the UK. That's principally down to anti-doping um, because we now pick them up. So dehydration, why were we worried about dehydration? Well, we reviewed the literature again, and really, and we produced a position statement for ourselves as an authority and also the university. And you can see the detail of it on the screen. But essentially, if you dehydrate yourself between 2 and 4%, which for a jockey is not very much, um, we can begin to measure things which are bad for your performance. Okay, Health as well, but performance. So your reaction time is poor. Your power drops down your ability to ride safely is reduced. So actually, if you're making poor decisions and actually you can't ride safely, you're not going to do very well and you're going to fall off. Also, anecdotally, for my, my docs who work on the race courses, they were reporting that actually they frequently pick up jockeys who are riding light because actually, why have they picked them up? Because they've fallen off and they will often appear to be concussed. They're not, they're just very dehydrated. Um, and sometimes they feel appear to be shocked as if they've had a large bleed. They haven't. And that's a bit embarrassing when you get helicoptered to the nearest major trauma centre to find out the reason you're there is because you're dehydrated. What we do know is that actually if you access, and we have an extraordinary uh, support network in the UK of nutrition and other uh, support services, if you access that, then actually you can make weight relatively safely. So the conclusion, essentially, we worked out, not rocket science, dehydration is bad. Acute dehydration causes problems. And actually, to encourage that by providing saunas on race courses really was very difficult to accept in the same way as you wouldn't now give people a couple of shots of bourbon before they sat on the race course, because it does affect your ability to race safely. Now, of course, what we can't do is control what people do outside the race course, but actually we need to create an environment within the race course where actually we can encourage people to do the right thing. So dehydration, we were trying absolutely to discourage it, and actually COVID was quite helpful in, the, in, the, in that endeavour. But it's not all dehydration. There are other things which you do to try and make weight um, and some of those are good and some of those are bad. So a controlled diet and exercise program under supervision clearly is a good thing to do to help with your weight. Calorie restriction, food restriction, fasting is not good. And all of those things will have potentially negative effects on your health. So I'm going to, just going to touch on a couple of those. Um, so mood and bones we're just going to talk about. Okay, so a lot of these studies are quite old now. A lot of these studies are from eight, ten years ago. So this is a study, again, from colleagues in Liverpool. 
where we looked at jockeys who were making weight using traditional methods. Okay? And amongst a whole load of other measures, we did their Brunel mood score, which looks at certain uh, parameters, including anger, confusion, depression, fatigue, tension, and vigor. And as you can see here on the graph, you've got three lines. You've got what you're aiming for, so that is the, the normal curve, when you've got low levels of the negative parameters and high levels of vigor. And then you've got the assessments done on flat and jump jockeys. And as you can see, that actually, particularly the flat jockeys, they had high levels of what you're not looking for, so the depression, uh, the anxiety, and they had low levels of vigor and energy. Um, and that was really sort of echoed what common sense tells you, is because certainly as a doctor, if you pick up a jockey who's just fallen off a horse, they are not very happy people. If you drill down that to a bit more detail and actually go into formally looking at markers of mental health problems, um, again, this is a really top level sum summary, but you can see here, so on this chart, green is good, red is bad, and orange is somewhere in the middle. And again, another this cohort of jockeys who are actually having their mental health assessed, you can see that significant numbers of jockeys using, making weights in the traditional fashion had markers of problems with their mental health when you compare it to other weight making sports and the general public at the time. If we move on to bones, and it's really interesting hearing about the equine side of the bone side of things, um, but we've had repeated studies because we often use DEXAs to look at body composition, which obviously gives you a bone density score at the same time, that actually low bone density, uh, osteopenia and osteoporosis is more common in our jockey group than we'd like it to be, um, and it seems to be particularly prevalent in male flat jockeys, which of course is not what you'd expect from osteoporosis, which is traditionally the older females who run into problems with it. Now one of the difficulties is actually a difficulty of diagnosis here, because uh, when you are doing a DEXA scan and you're looking at bone density, you then compare your scores to a control population. Um, and you can either do that against control population matched by age and gender or a general control. And, and the difficulty is we are probably not comparing our jockeys to actually a relevant control group, um, and we may be over-diagnosing their low, low density. But if you think about it, we're in a sport when horses are travelling at 35, 40 miles an hour, you're going to fall, you're going to fall from at least two or three metres up. Actually, you know, you want good bone density. You don't want it to be in the negative half of the curve. So it, it is work in progress, and of course what we're really interested in is can we find a level at which bone density is low that you will fracture when you take, quote, a soft fall? Clearly, if you fall at high speed, you know, even if your bones are made to titanium, you're going to break them. But actually, it's those softer falls. And we are seeing an increase in the number of spinal fractures um, in the UK, partly, I suspect, because of increased diagnostics, um, because we tend to MR a lot of our spinal guys now. But you can, you can reverse these things. So we know that actually, if you do the right thing in terms of a diet and exercise program, you can reduce your body fat absolute amount and body fat percentage down. Um, and interestingly, even our jockeys who, if you look at them, you know, look quite slight, look quite slim, were bringing in joggy, uh, uh, body fat percentages in the low teens. You know, in a, if you're a professional footballer, you want it 8 or 9%, and these guys were bringing in, you know, 14 to 16%. So you can get it down. Um, and again, we know you can get it down in this group because we've done studies on it. And there was a study where we looked at giving jockeys a controlled diet. So the diet, their food was delivered. Um, it was a high protein diet. They ate six times a day. They were not hungry. They were not dehydrated. And surprise, surprise, they got their fat mass down. Um, but they preserved muscle bulk, which is always the big issue, that if you do rapid fasting, you lose muscle bulk and you need muscle strength. And also, their mental health scores improved as well. So if you're well-fed and hydrated, then actually it's good for your well-being in the broadest sense. Um, the difficulty is that a lot of these guys still have a slightly unusual arrangement with the food. Um, not quite, in many cases, uh, heading towards a formal eating disorder, but we do see more of that than we'd like to. So the challenge is this, that we have a 
level, an individual threshold below which you can't, you can't reduce your weight any further without actually incurring risk. So what are we actually going to do about it? What could be done about it? Okay, so number one, this is the one we've effectively done so far. So we raise the weights and we promote methods other than dehydration. So this is what COVID gave us an opportunity to do. But we know that every time you raise weights, you enter this honeymoon period where it's great for a while, but then eventually you're going to have to do it again, hence that stepwise increase in weights. Other couple of options are looking actually at individual more minimum weights, and some countries require these now, so colleagues in Ireland and France will require this. So you are set a minimum weight as a jockey based on some equation, and that might be based on body composition, where actually um, you're not allowed to ride below that weight. Um, and that's, in theory, great. Uh, int introducing and actually running that would be really quite challenging because you would potentially, at a stroke, re remove the opportunity for lots of current riders, some of the current jockeys, to, to ride um, at weights they've been riding at for years. So scientifically sensible, a challenge to introduce. Um, and then the other things I alluded to earlier is looking at the recruitment side of things. You know, we probably need to be looking away from our current population to recruit from elsewhere. So back to dear old COVID. Okay, so COVID came to an end. I know because Boris Johnson told me COVID had come to an end. Um, and he had some parties in Downing Street to celebrate the end of COVID, which was great. Um, so we then had to reach a point where we we're going to have to get rid or rename the, the COVID £3 allowance as it had become known by then. So with all these things, you know, in, in GB racing, we all meet. We have lots of people get together and, and people present their point of view. The Professional Jockey Association um, consulted their members um, and actually had a really significant response rate and you know, 180 responses from their members, which is well over half of their membership, was pretty extraordinary. Um, and the thing about it is that actually the jockeys um, generally had felt better through this time. And as I say, that was partly because they were no longer dehydrated using saunas, but also because they were, had one meeting a day. Um, some were still using dehydration themselves, and the split there is that 30% of them were using it once a week, and 10% were dehydrating every time they raced. Um, but the vast majority felt better. A uh, small number wanted saunas back, um, and a large number said, yeah, we're happy to, without saunas returning as long as we carry on with the status quo. So carry on with the weight allowance, but also we'd like the food to be better which was slightly unkind because the food had been improving, but we'll come back to that. Um, and also we'd like some warm-up areas, which again, which was a policy which was already in its sort of early stages. From the BHA point of view, I presented the medical evidence, which is basically dehydration is bad, can we please avoid it, work out some other way of doing it, and of course raising the weights was part of that. And my sense was to actually roll the COVID allowance over and rename it in some fashion was the sensible thing to do, at least in the short term. Uh, colleagues in the racing department then looked at the performance side of things, because there was always a concern that actually, you know, was the horse performance reduced in some way? Um, and they looked at the percentage of runners beaten by rank in handicap races um, across uh, jump racing, hurdles, um, and on the flat. Um, and actually found no discernible difference in the three years prior to COVID and the year of COVID. So actually, horse performance was not affected. Uh, the handicappers were very pleased because actually these are all handicap races and the spread, as you can see in the handicap, is very tight around the 50% mark, which is what they're aiming for. So horse performance not affected. Um, and for the vets here in the audience, which of course is most of you, we asked the vets what they thought, and they said, actually, we can't see any problem with this increased weight. Uh, and this is, of course, at which point everyone goes, well, actually, when they're riding out, they, they, they carry someone who's 10 and a half stone anyway. But of course, riding out and race riding is slightly different, I would suggest. But nonetheless, it's an important part. Uh, National Trainers Federation uh, consulted their members. There was some concern from then, because actually, when a horse doesn't do well, it's quite an easy thing to identify that's because it was carrying more weight than you wanted them to carry. Um, so there was some, some horse trading over that. And what we came out with initially, um, despite some of the recommendations from many of us, was actually that the minimum weights would go up by two pounds um, and the allowance of scales would stay the same at three pounds. 
So if you cast your mind back previously, they had a total of six at scales, and now jockeys were given a total of five at scales. Um, and surprisingly, that actually didn't go down terribly well with the jockeys, actually, because they said, well, actually, we think we'd asked for one thing, and you've given us something slightly different here. Um, and to be fair, this was a full consultation process, and I guess it's one of the, the lessons we learned that actually sometimes people are given the opportunity to give an opinion, and often they don't. And when there's a decision made that they don't agree with, then they give their opinion, by which time this full process had gone through. So it was really quite difficult. However, one of the things that had come out of COVID is actually we would learned to talk to each other. So in fact, we carried on talking to each other, um, and actually a compromise was reached, which is still um, being discussed. So now, actually, the jockeys get an extra four pounds personal allowance at scales. All the weights have gone up by two pounds. So by my maths, two plus four equals six. So it hasn't changed. It has a bit, if I'm being honest with you, because previously the weight was at scales and wasn't beforehand. And that is an important difference for the jockeys. Uh, but you know, with this dialogue still going on, and we've got some more meetings coming up. So the saunas have gone. Um, and we now have a total of um, six pounds weight allowance for that. So the other thing they were asking at the jockeys was, oh, we like better food on the race courses. As I say, that was a bit unkind because actually we'd working hard with a policy on better food on the race courses for some time. Um, and race courses are obliged to follow um, some diet programs which have been set up. They are inspected against them. To be fair, it had slipped during COVID. Um, and actually last week I had a phone call about Doncaster Race Course, oh, sorry, I shouldn't mention the name, but actually I had a complaint from one of the jockeys that the chips were soggy. Um, I said, that's interesting, I don't care that they're soggy, I care that there are chips on the menu, because that's not part of the programme, but there you go. Okay, so it, it is coming along. Um, we have really good support from the nutrition team. Um, around the UK we have three injured jockey funds rehab centres, uh, which are state-of-the-art physio-run re rehab centres and nutrition teams work out of there and John Moore's University. Um, the nutrition team will visit each of the race courses in the UK to help develop and food. Um, and they also go to the training colleges, uh, Northern Horse Racing College and British Racing School to actually teach jockeys. And they teach jockeys how to shop. They teach them how to cook. And they teach them how to actually follow a good diet. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of sport out there, but dehydration is still embedded in the psyche, I'm afraid, of many jockeys, so that's work in progress. The other thing that's happened is that, as mentioned in the introduction, we've now got this very large rebuilding program in all race courses in the UK. Um, so over the next couple of years, they're all having to reconfigure their facilities, um, and that's to accommodate, great news, increasing female jockeys, because at the moment, female jockeys probably get two foot square of changing room and the males get something like 30 foot square. So that's gonna, there's gonna be a balance there to allow more female jockeys. We've also have to introduce uh, areas for safeguarding, so that's for the under 18s for change. And from my point of view, we are gonna be getting warm up areas, uh, mini gyms, if you will, as well as enhancing rest areas and canteens. Um, as part of that program, colleagues at the Injured Jockeys Fund, there's a chap called Danny Haig, who has been really pushing a lot of the strength and conditioning programs. So he's devised this ramp program, which is a warm-up program for jockeys racing on a race day. So gone are the days when warm-up for a jockey was actually reading the racing post and having a fag. Um, they're actually going to start behaving like athletes from other sports, I hope. And so uh, there's a list of minimum equipment that uh, race courses are going to have. There's a minimum area of the warm-up area. So there will be some warm-up bikes, um, some free weights, some uh, pulley systems, some therabands. So it's going to be very exciting if you find that sort of thing exciting. So we're really looking at now increasingly at the physical profiling of our athletes. So coming back to the earlier, earlier comment when I said I didn't know what the attributes of a, of a successful jockey were, um, we're working on that now. Um, and so what we're trying to do is to learn more about our participants. Um, and physical profiling days take place at the Injured Jockeys Fund centres. Uh, and we're doing that for two reasons. One is for the sport, so we can learn about uh, the demands of the sport. We can understand um, 
the career pathway and also can we try and deliver a healthy jockey into retirement because retirement's a really challenging area for most sports. And then at the individual level to identify gaps in their performance to try and support them in their training because you know it's our belief if you're robust, if you're stronger, if you're fitter, you're faster, you're actually going to perform better but actually you're going to have less injuries, partly because you're probably going to fall off less, but actually when you do fall off, the way you impact with the ground and how you subsequently rehab is going to be improved if your basic fitness is better. Um, on, there, on the screen there, you can see there are two areas which are highlighted because most of the physical profiling is voluntary, and actually the jockeys are really engaged with it because they like to show off. They like to show they're fitter than their mate, and actually that's been really good introducing competition. But actually, if you want to enter the sport, you have to hit some fitness criteria before they actually let you in. And actually, if you've been injured before you return after injury, it's not just because your orthopedic surgeon says your bone's healed. It's actually, is it functionally working and have you regained all your fitness? Um, and so they will have a general fitness test as well. So there are two mandatory tests. The majority, as I say, is voluntary, but it has good take up. And if you want the technical stuff, this is the stuff we look at in profiling. So this is to do with looking at power, endurance, strength. We look at body composition. We look at coordination as well. Um, and we're trying to establish what are the normal ranges for jockeys at different stages of their development. So this is a nice simple one. Um, so this is the push-up. Okay, and as you can see there, what we, we're developing normal ranges for both genders. Um, but also for different stages in the jockey's career, um, and then we, are, we can grade them within that. Okay, so this is all descriptive at the moment, but it's to really to help us actually define our population from a, a physical performance side. And then we will be working towards uh, a structure here where you can see as you progress through, we'll begin to be able to populate this table with what your targets should be at any particular stage of your training career. So physical profiling is really coming in um, and actually is beginning to show dividends. So I thought, um, just in case anyone's going to, beginning to doze off, I'm now going to play some loud music. Apologies for this. This was drawn up by Richard Perham, who's one of our jockey coaches, who clearly likes a bit of rock. Um, and this is the entry level test to when you come into racing. If you do not pass this, you have to go away and come back later. The exercise ball squats. So these are all tests which have been developed just based on common doing sense. 20 squats holding a five kilo weight. Taken from Hold other the sports. Final squat for three minutes. And it's trying to mimic some of the issues that we see in racing. So you'll see a lot of this sort of position. Hold your plank with a straight line going from your shoulders through to your hips, through to your ankles, and hold this for up to four minutes. The elastic push. This exercise is set to a metronome at 50 beats per minute for every beat, you must extend your hand fully forwards. This exercise lasts for two minutes. The wobble cushion squats. If anyone's keen and wants to join in, cushions, feel free to stand up position. and do this at the same time. Bend your knee so your thigh is horizontal to the ground. You will need to maintain this static position for a maximum of four minutes. Leg raises. The leg raises are set to a metronome beat of 50 beats per minute. One beat is up, one beat is down. Continue this for up to four minutes. The 
press up hold position. Adopt a press up position with your hands facing forwards under your shoulders with your elbows close to your side. Hold this position for up to 90 seconds. You can see the correct position from the front. The Watt Bike Warm Up. During your warm up, pedal for three minutes at an average of 100 watts. You will then be ready for your watt bike test. The th so I won't bore you with the watt bike test as well. So these are the minimum criteria, um, and we expect you to do better than this as you progress through your career. Um, the other thing which is not shown on there, there's also an exercise test as well at the end of that. So they are. So you've, you've, you're on your license course, um, and you've, you've been taught how to cook, you've been taught how to shop, you've known how to use the gym, and your fitness has been assessed. The other thing, if you think back to the, that four-corner model, was looking at your psychological state. Um, and we're now be beginning to introduce psychologists in as a routine part of care. Um, and we're trying to actually move away from this uh, sense that people are finding it difficult to talk about their mental health. So we were introducing it at the beginning and colleagues at Sporting Chance and Changing Minds who are our providers for mental health um, are working hard to do this for us. Um, so each uh, applicant for the licensing course will have a one-to-one -one conversation with the psychologist and they also undergo scoring of anxiety and depression scores. Um, so if you look at this here, you can see that actually um, as usual, red is less good, purple in this screen is fine, and blue is somewhere in between. And this is at the licensed courses, we're seeing that actually about 30% of people are showing signs of anxiety. We have evidence of some depression, and putting it together, around about a third of our applicants are actually already showing signs of some distress. So is this an issue? If you then move to actually compare it with others, um, so on the uh, left here, you've got the licensed course applicants with their third. Um, you've then got a column which reflects a, re a study from Ireland where actually they looked at, this was an anonymous questionnaire which went to all their licensed jockeys and they found that for those who responded, which was about a 50% response rate, um, up to 70% of their respondees had some sort of mental health issue. Now, there was a, a significant skew towards alcohol misuse, which is not measured in the, in the, in the license courses. Um, but nonetheless, this is fairly significant. I would take it with a little bit of a pinch of a sword because the response rate actually um, will mean there's a bit of a selection bias here because you're probably going to people who've got an issue who are responding. But nonetheless, even if you wind it back, at best, we do have a, a selection in the Irish population are probably approaching 30, 35% of people with a discernible, measurable mental health problem. So that is important. And you can see on the other two columns, we've compared that with uh, Olympic sports, a sort of best and worst case scenario. So we cannot ignore the mental health side of things. In terms of the uh, data collected from the license courses, as I say, the, all this needs to be context specific. Um, because, of course, these folk were coming in for a course they had to pass, and so that's always going to create a certain degree of anxiety. Um, in the licensed course, it was not screening for alcohol-related problems. Um, and I guess the questions really are, are we actually recruiting in people who are better mental health than actually the current participants, or rather more concerning, does the sport actually cause mental health problems? Um, and we know there are significant pressures amongst our jockeys. So as a consequence of this, um, we're developing a mental health strategy for the sport in the UK, and at the centre of that is our jockey athlete. Um, and if you think about jockeys uh, in the middle there, they are under pressures like the rest of us. So they have issues with their family, that we have issues with their family. We're probably seeing a little bit more alcohol and drug misuse in that group than we would like. Uh, they also have the contend with the athlete-related stuff, so that's failure. So not winning races. If you're someone who doesn't cope well with failure, don't become a jockey 
because you're going to lose more than you win. Um, big issues with social media and abuse on social media. Uh, the constant concerns about injury risk and being stood down. If you want to make an athlete depressed, stop them playing their sport. So that's really important. And the issues going into retirement as well. Okay, so retirement, really big challenging time for athletes. So you lose a lot of their identity as they go into retirement. And of course, we've never got the more specific racing side of things. So concerns about employment, autonomy, uh, power relationships, weights, of course, as we know, have a big effect on people's mood um, and the relentless timetable. So jockeys are exposed to considerable pressure. Now, what we're trying to do is actually using the pillars on the left-hand side is actually to construct around them a support network. So understanding their needs from their perspective, um, identifying early when there's a problem, um, trying to move away from actually waiting for a problem, but actually to promote pos positive mental health, but also to actually respond sensibly when there is an issue. Um, and certainly the strategy is developing over time around the jockey, their primary level support like the rest of us are people we meet, so families, friends, um, and other jockeys. And then we're trying to construct around that an industry which actually is mindful of well-being in order that actually we don't inadvertently add to the burdens of this group. So one of the things we've done, for instance, is talking to the stewarding staff about how they run inquiries to do it in a way which is less burdensome. Um, we've taught the stewards how to bake break bad news as well because one of the challenges is often if you get a positive drugs test, you learn about it on a race course on a race day and how that is delivered to you is a really important thing. So there's a sort of broad strategy which is developing over time. So coming back to our four corners, pleased to say that the, the FA, which was previously in the middle of this uh, chart, has now been replaced by the jockey. So we're trying to be more jockey-centric and actually factoring all these aspects of the four corners. Uh, and then the other thing, which I'm really hoping will happen at some point, is that little elephant in the room uh, will eventually leave the room if we can actually come up with a strategy which is going to tackle weights in the long term. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you very much, Dr. Hill. Wearable technology is nowadays a part of all of our everyday lives. If any of you are like me, you like tracking the amount of steps that you walk in a day. I only did 11,864 steps on Derby Day this year, as opposed to 15,247 in 2021, and that was still probably low compared to a lot of people. All professional sports and most major college teams monitor and measure the health and fitness of their athletes with wearable technology that can track location, speed, change in direction, force, heart rate, recuperation, and more. These devices are now being designed and used in equine athletes. I'd now like to hand it over to panel moderator Joe Applebaum, president of the New York Thoroughbred Horsemen's Association, to introduce the panel of experts who will share some of the current advances in equine wearable technology. Welcome, Joe. I think Anise stole my opening line. Can I get a quick show of hands? How many people here use an Aura Ring or a Fitbit or Strava, uh, or Strava's for biking, uh, or Whoop for monitor your sleep? Right, so people in internet land, there's probably a dozen people uh, put up their hands. So the wearable technologies are um, becoming uh, <laughs> widespread amongst humans, and we have some experts here to talk about uh, how we're gonna deploy them in uh, equine athletes over the next, hopefully, few years. So uh, let me do a quick introduction. Uh, to my immediate left is Will Duff Gordon. He's the CEO of Total Performance Data. They're a leader in in-race sectional timing. How'd I do? Perfect, Joe. Okay. The man in the middle probably needs no introduction to this audience. Uh, Dr. Scott Palmer is the equine medical director uh, for the state of New York. Uh, he's well known for his research uh, uh, with equine athletes. 
and Valentin, I'm going to hopefully not mess up your last name, Rapine. Yeah. Okay, Valentin Rapine is the co-founder of Arianeo, a French company that has a product called Equimeter, uh, which is uh, widespread worldwide and rolling out here in the States. So what we'd like to do, and I'm going to start uh, with Will, and we'll go from here. If you can give a brief explanation of what your product is, what it does, what you're measuring, and uh, I guess uh, some brief technical specs about how quickly it does that. Cool, thanks, Joe. Um, and it's very good to be here, and thanks to the, uh, the organizers of this event, Jamie and Matt and Kirsten. Um, normally, they're the very, very uh, talented yearlings looking out here, the uh, potential superstars, which we're gonna try and match up to, Joe, aren't we? Probably badly. Um, so I set up TPD as a former racehorse owner. I used to work in the financial technology in the city and we're marrying kind of two things I knew a bit about, data and, uh, and horses. Um, racing as a chance to sort of uh, put devices on horses and have an unlimited use for that content, which gives racing a chance to kind of maybe overtake human sports where athletes will wear uh, devices in training, but perhaps not in matches, or perhaps that data might not be shared with broadcasters um, in real time, whereas the content on the horse, the poor old horse can't vote against um, what he's carrying uh, within reason, as long as it's light and safe. And so, yeah, we set out to um, work with Equibase from about 2017 onwards. We were also working in the UK uh, to see if we could, kind of the internet of things could come to racing and we could capture data that would um, that would help lift the lid on the mighty thoroughbred. You know, that's what I kind of try and do. In the States, we were set a um, pretty tough challenge of uh, adding value to um, official timing, workouts, uh, affordable graphics, uh, and enhanced charts. And then we also wanted to create in-race wagering. So kind of like there's a huge uh, set of challenges against all of those things. So it's effectively a GPS solution with accelerometers we also now work with hybrid, uh, hybrid beams in order to help with the official timing. Um, one of the big challenges in the racing here is the run-ups. Um, if I could define the technological challenge in American racing in two words, it would be run-ups, but I think we've dealt with that now. So yeah, we're, we're, we're I guess, making great progress against all of those items uh, using a, a type of GPS system and then very low latency transmission of data over radio frequencies. Can you explain what that means for the audience, low latency transmission? Probably not, I'll try. Um, so you, you, transmitting the data in real time for the benefit of in-race wagering for, for, fish, for to put on the TV screen for the timing, so different ways you can transmit the data. Some use mobile networks, some use Wi-Fi. We use radio, but the idea being to kind of like have real-time data on what the horse is doing. Is that, is that cool? Yes, latency just substitute in American real time. Speed. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, Valentin. Arianeo and Equimeter is a little different. Can you talk about what you're doing, what kind of data you're collecting, who your clients are, and what it looks like? Sure. So we created the company in 2014, and so we are specialized in the development of a new technology to collect and analyze some health and performance data on the resource during training. And so our flagship product is the Equimeter. It's being used by more than 400, 400 uh, trainers and vets all around the world. And so it's a simple device that you will attach to the girth. We have some electrodes that will allow us to gather the heart rate signal of the horse while exercising. So we will be able to look at the intensity of the efforts as reach during his exercise, how he handles his, his exercise and the quality of the recovery and the fitness data. On the top of this, uh, we have developed some very special electrodes that allow us as well to export the electrocardiogram of the horse at full speed during the entire exercise. So after each training, you can also download the electrocardiogram to investigate if there is any type of uh, heart rate abnormalities such as arrhythmias, atrial fibrillation, all those type of things. Then we have a GPS for all the speed, distance, mapping, sectional data, like basically all the clocking information. We also have some movement sensor on the device to gather some locomotion data, such as the stride length, strike frequency. We do also have some symmetry and regularity indicator that we use to, for the warm-up phases. And in the device, we also have an RFID reader that will make the scenario of use very easy. Basically, you just have to click on one button, you read the horse microchip, 
Like this, you never need to worry about uh, which horse is wearing what device at what time. Then you will gather your data during the training. Then uh, all the data will be then displayed on a mobile app or on a web analytic platform. Then you will have different functionalities, such as like the training's playback to analyze all the key parameters about the training that you've just done. Uh, comparison of uh, different training, evolution of the data over the time. Then we also have a very strong analytic tool into which one you can select a lot of different filters, such as like uh, every two years old, uh, breathing at Kidland on the dirt. You will get all the average data from a different horse or from, for one horse. And uh, you have like a more than 200 different indicators that you can uh, put into this, uh, this tab. Okay, so I just want a, a little sum up and then a follow-up question. We can collect all sorts of data now that previously was difficult to collect. Heart rate, stride length, EKG, uh, amongst others. It's, that's not even the full uh, thing. Okay, how much of that are you collecting? Just uh, give, uh, we're coll the easiest thing is how many beats per second are we collecting it? Um. So basically, uh, it will depend on different on the different uh, sensors. But yeah. uh, with the heart rate, we would collect like uh, 250 hertz. So right. it would mean like uh, 250 data per second. Right. Uh, for the locomotion data, we will go to 120. And for the GPS we are using for training, uh, we are just using one hertz. Okay. Will, any thoughts on your on the technical scale? scale? Um, well, we've got 500,000 horse performances we're getting close to. So it's a very big set of data now. It's up to 10 updates per horse per second from the moment they're saddled to the moment they're unsaddled. So yeah, stride data, velocity data, position data. So yeah, there's a lot you can do with that, that set of content. And this is important. I heard the jockeys talk about weight. How much does your unit weigh? Yeah, so 100 grams, give or take, is the, is the UK's sort of uh, weight limit here. Okay. Probably similar here. So something we wouldn't expect to impact the performance of the horse or... Okay, so turning to Dr. Palmer. Dr. Palmer, we did a study in New York starting last summer using data from a different company, StrideSafe. Can you tell us a little about what you've experienced and some of the results you've seen? Can I have a slide? Please? Absolutely. Okay. Any calisthenics in this? Okay, I'd just, like, I'd just like to start out by recognizing the Harry Zweig Memorial Fund at Cornell University that paid for the study. And uh, this is a fund that's been very helpful over the years. We've funded a lot of research at Cornell with the Zweig funding, and the information that we gather from these research projects is used to develop evidence-based interventions that we've used in New York to reduce uh, fatalities significantly over the, the last 12 years. So. Basically, all of the success we've had thus far has been based upon subjective data gathered by veterinarians examining horses, for, for the most part. And a look at some epidemiologic uh, tendencies and such have been helpful as well. But I think we, we are bottomed out pretty well in, that, in our ability to do that. And I think that we, we really need to use advanced technology to take another step forward to help us identify these horses that are at risk of injury. So as we said, these monitoring devices have been around for quite some time, both in humans and in horses, but think of them as, as a Fitbit, you know, a little more sophisticated perhaps. The one that I'm familiar with is about the size of a cell phone, weighs a couple of ounces. Um, now this unit, uh, it has a GPS unit in it and three accelerometers that measure acceleration in three dimensions, longitudinal front to back, vertical up and down, medial and lateral side to side. So the frequency of transmission, each sensor transmits at 800 hertz. So we're sending 2,400 bytes of data to the satellite every second. The GPS uh, has five, uh, five uh, pulses per second. So it's a very sophisticated device. We know exactly where it is in three dimensions throughout the race. This device is not connected to the horse. This device fits into the saddle cloth like a, fit, like a tracker, like a trackus device, and is held in place there. It's very light. We, the first thing we did at Saratoga, the question was, can we do this in, in an active, high-tempo racing environment? I mean, it's one thing to put a sensor on a horse in training, but can you put these 10 sensors on 10 horses and have them <laughs> go out there and, and do well and everything go okay, and you come back and un unload those sensors and, and use them for another race? That was the first question we had to answer, and, and yeah, we can do that. 
I think this is a really important piece. The galloping horse gait is complicated in a lot of ways, but, but this uh, algorithm of this computer breaks it down into three phases. The hind limb strands phase is whenever there's a hind limb on the ground. And you can see on the left here that we've got some squiggly lines that look kind of like an EKG, but this is smooth data on these horses. Those are the three different acceleration vectors that we're looking at. And you can see there's a fair amount of symmetry during the hind limb stance phase. At this point, the horse is loading his hind legs like gigantic springs. And then in the next phase of the stride, we have the forelimb stance phase. That's whenever a forelimb is on the ground. And you can see there's a lot going on here, but basically this is the phase when the, all that energy that's been developed in those springs from the hind limbs is now being kept caught and managed by the front legs. This is a concussion phase. And you can, it's not hard to understand why most of our injuries are in the front legs of these horses, but there's a lot going on here, as you can see in that phase of the stride. The third phase of the stride is the period of suspension. This is a time where the horse takes a breath, and it's the only time when the horse really has an opportunity to change the next stride. Uh, if, he had a, if he had pain when he came down on the left front in the last stride, while he's in the air, he can rotate his axial skeleton and make changes so he'll bear less weight on the leg for the next drive. That's where a lot of things are happening that we, we never really saw what was happening there. And you can see there's a fair amount of symmetry between acceleration vectors in this phase. So what are we, what are we getting out of these sensors? We're, we're able to measure the amount of energy the horse is putting into the race. We're, amount, we're able to measure the amount of concussion he's experiencing during the race. We're able to, again, show these vectors in three dimensions so we know exactly uh, subtle gait changes and hundreds of a second can be identified with looking at all this data. The report, the output of the data then, is in, a, in the form of a traffic light. The horses are either gonna have a green, a red, or a yellow alert depending upon their gait fingerprint. Every horse has a unique fingerprint. When a horse is moving at slow speeds, there's an awful lot of noise in the gait. When the horse is moving at very fast speed, there's, there's much less noise. The, the gait is much more consistent because the horse is really working from his subconscious uh, memory. He's not, he's not using conscious thought so much any more than if you or I were walking down the road, we're not consciously thinking necessarily but where our feet go unless there's pain involved and then you make a conscious decision to make a change. So this is all basically a programmed default way of moving that each horse is a little bit unique in that regard. And what we're measuring here is we're looking at a group of elite sound racehorses and developing a population mean. Here you can see a, a solid blue line with dotted lines above and below it. That's the, the median um, power output during a race of, of a horse. And then the dotted lines on either side represent one standard deviation from that median. The uh, green line stays in that range pretty much of the time, and that's a green light race. A yellow race is one where the line deviates outside that one standard deviation, and then that's between basically between one and three, and then if they exceed three standard deviations from the mean, we have what we call a red alert. Now, that, that means there's something happening in this race that needs to be investigated. There's, there's a change here. The, the source is deviating very, rap very significantly from the mean, and the higher they deviate away from that, mean, that normal, the more significant the change is and the, and the more the horse needs greater scrutiny. This was a very interesting uh, case at Saratoga. We started in the middle of July and, and we really didn't actually know exactly what our output was gonna look like and how it could be useful. This was a horse that, uh, in the total power on the left and the total vibration on the right, the pink line is the, uh, the recorded horse in this race, the dotted lines and the blue line is the population mean from other horses that we had at Saratoga. And everything looks pretty good at this point for the race. These charts show a different story. These are the, the individual vector analysis accelerations and the dorsal ventral means that you can see this horse is well below this, the population mean throughout the race and particularly so between 50 and 60 seconds into the race, he had a very low power drop there. In other words, his, his effort dropped away quite a bit at that point. In the second chart, we see longitudinal vectors. You can see the horse accelerated pretty well throughout the race until, again, about 55 seconds into the race, there is a rapid phase of deceleration at that point. And if you look at the medial lateral chart, you'll see two very big negative peaks here where the horse was shifting his weight significantly out of balance, in particular around 55 to 60 seconds into the race. When I got this data, I, I didn't know exactly what it meant, and I called the trainer up. This, I get this data the following day. I called the trainer and asked him if I'd come take a look at the horse because I was concerned about him. And uh, the trainer said, sure, come on over. I showed him these charts, and he said to me, I said, could you tell me, fill me in a little bit about how this horse came out of the race? He said, well, 
I guess you don't know what happened. And I said, no, I really don't know what happened. He said, well, this horse finished the race great. The jockey hopped off and the trainer was there in the unsaddling area. Everybody was happy. Finished second place in a maiden special weight, two-year-olds in Saratoga. And the horse was tagged to go back to the, uh, the test barn because it finished second. And when it, got, it walked a quarter of a mile from the unsaddling area back to the test barn, when it got back to the test barn, it was fine. During the, the cool out period in the test barn, it became lame. And it became so lame, it had to be shipped back to the, to the stable for evaluation, at which point they examined the horse, radiographed it, and found the horse had developed an acute sagittal fracture of the third carpal bone. And we could actually see that happen with the sensors. C keep in mind that every, nobody else saw anything. The jockey didn't feel anything. Uh, the trainer, everybody thought, was thrilled about the way this horse performed. But the sensor picked up this medial lateral weight shift, deceleration, and the lack of impulsion. So it was a, a very dramatic example for me that we were measuring something here that was important. So here is an example of the elite sound racehorse tracings of those acceleration curves during a race compared with the horse that broke its carpal bone. And you can see there's some pretty dramatic changes there. Now, how do you measure those changes? That's a, that's a computer algorithm that, that sorts that out. So the, the real question was, though, beyond the anecdotal information was, does this identify lameness? Does it, it certainly identifies gait asymmetry, but what meaning does it have? What does this all mean, and, and can we use it? And does it have value? So basically what we did, we did a prospective study at Saratoga from July 25th through Labor Day. We had seven high-speed exercise outcome variables that we followed for four months after the end of that meet. During that time, we had recorded 15 red alerts, 25 yellow alerts, and 91 green alerts. We did routine descriptive statistics in the crucial Wallace test to evaluate those results, and this is what we found. First of all, the green are the green horses, the yellow are the yellow horses, the red are the red horses. The index that you see there is a, is a combination of all those acceleration vectors, and we can see that there was a, was a significant difference between the green horses was, were basically were within zero to two standard deviations away from the mean, the yellows were between two and two and a half, and the, and the reds were between three and five, basically, and, and there was an enormous significant, significant difference in this group, it was about 131 horses. So we found that the three of these outcome variables were significantly different. First of all, the number of days to the next race was extremely significant. So the red horses did not make it back to race again for a significant period of time, more than the yellows and the greens. The other thing was that the red horses also did not complete as many races during a four-month follow-up period. And finally, they didn't, also did not complete the same amount of high-speed furlong events and timed workouts. In the four months after these races, there was no significant differences between the yellows and the greens in terms of making it back to the races. However, between the reds and the, and the greens, there was a significant difference, and there was also a significant difference between the yellows and the greens. Interestingly, only 40% of the horses that had a red classification were able to race at all for the next four months after the analyzed race, compared to almost 80% of the greens and the yellows. I thought that was, was, was powerfully significant. Obviously, the, the p-values in those numbers are, are instru fully instructive on their own value, but these were very significant data uh, with a population size of 131 horses. So the, these sensors are practical and scalable. They're, they're screening devices. They're not diagnostic tools, but they are screening devices that can detect subtle gait abnormalities, that is, subclinical lameness. None of these horses were lame before the race, obviously, or they wouldn't have been allowed to run but we were able to see things happen during the race and we were able to identify horses that were unlikely to make it back for a period of four months after that race. Now, a normal thoroughbred racehorse in New York runs about every month, 34 to 40 days. So if a horse is not coming back for four months, that's a really big problem, both from a standpoint of equine welfare and from the standpoint of economics for the trainer. So what we're able to do with this device is actually detect lameness in, in early stages to provide for timely intervention Typically speaking, the, the regulatory veterinarian in the racetrack does not get involved with a horse unless it fails a pre-race examination. And we have uh, a, an adversarial relationship at that point between the regulatory veterinarian and the trainer. This device allows us to identify unsoundness very early in the process where we can actually work with a trainer and say, look, your horse is not lame today, but the warning signs are very clear. You need to get this horse evaluated by a veterinarian. He needs to have a good, good diagnostic workup because something's going on here that's preventing him from competing and being up to his normal potential. And so with that 
that redefines the whole relationship between veterinarians and trainers. That veterinary tr client patient relationship is enhanced by this device because now you have a different kind of a conversation. Instead of saying you're not going to run today, the conversation is together, we got to figure out what's going on here, both from an economic and a welfare standpoint, so we can keep this horse in training and he can do well. The next steps then, we came back to, to Belmont, Fall Meet, and Aqueduct, and in Saratoga, we were only able to measure all of the horses in one race a day because that was a starting point. We wanted to walk before we started running. And when we got down to Belmont, we did every horse in every race and were able to get that data, did the same thing at Aqueduct. Because we had now repeated measure opportunities, we have individual horse fingerprints as well as population fingerprints. And we've refined the algorithm quite a bit. So using guided artificial intelligence and automated reporting protocols, we can get this information back to trainers in, a, in a, almost in a real time situation. And we have, are right now collecting the prospective data. It'll be, we, our last horse recorder was the end of April, so by, by the end of August, we'll have all the data and the outcome variables. We're gonna redo the whole study again through the um, academic analysis at Cornell, and I'm, I'm confident we're gonna have some interesting numbers, because at this point, we've got about 6,500 recordings and about 2,500 horses. So that's, that's an enormous population to look at. I just want to show, quickly show you this idea that we have a population mean that we can make reference to. This is an individual horse mean. This horse raced five times, and you can see it, that there are four races up here that are kind of clustered together. There's a lot of noise, particularly in the medial to lateral forces. But notice the bright red line on the bottom was the last of the five races in October, and this horse was significantly different than in all of his other races. So I'm just pointing out to you that with a, with, we have repeated measures with the opportunity to measure a horse against himself and use his individual fingerprint as our baseline, and it gives a very powerful tool to pick up changes. Uh, I just wanted to th acknowledge Naira and NYTHA, the New York Thurbid Horseman Association, who could help collect data and provided the opportunity to do this study. And again, uh, Houston Mohammed is an epidemiologist at Cornell that helped analyze the data. So I wanted to let you know that this was, a, to my knowledge, one of the first independent reviews of this technology in, in, a, in a real time racing environment. And I'm excited Thank to share you, that Dr. with you. Thank you, Dr. Palmer. So I think Dr. Palmer just said a, a really important thing that I'm going to circle back to is independent review, right? And that goes to data validation. So I want to ask Valentin and Will. We now know we can collect the data. Dr. Palmer is giving us very kind of exciting and interesting results from that data that it seems worthwhile, uh, especially in equine welfare. The question really, though, is how much data do we need to make sure it's worthwhile and we can draw reasonable conclusions? Earlier, Dr. Parkin talked about uh, something that was underpowered and I think that's important. Will, you just talked that, that you're, you have 500,000 data points, or is that races? Or ho is that horse, horse performances. Horse performances. Yeah, I mean, you, you want to have every horse in every race uh, providing the same information so that you've got a consistent, um, consistent set of performance data to judge every horse against when you're evaluating who, who's going to run well badly or, or from the safety angle. So. The task we were set was to make the sort of the wearable sensors scalable, so it could be in every horse in every racetrack. Uh, Trackers came before us, you know, very good technology, but was kind of hamstrung by the by the kind of cost of that system. And it was on um, a dozen installations. We've now got to 20 in the U.S., 80 worldwide, and you know it'll be well over 100 by the end of the year. Because, but the sort of flip side to that is, we're not going with a kind of um, a blank check here to sort of go for the most accurate, most gold-plated system out there, you're looking for a technology that is attainable for it. So you have that trade-off between can every horse produce the same information to help with the welfare uh, and, the, and the wagering, but not such that, that only a few race courses can adopt it. So that's been the kind of the, the, the journey we've been on. That's quite difficult to marry those two things. Yeah, scalability being the key word there. Valentin, so uh, actually before, Dr. Palmer, uh, in New York, we have about 19,000 starts per year. That's individual starts. Uh, how many workouts, high-speed workouts, generally do we have? Well, high sp the high-speed workouts are uh, over 40,000, between 40 and 50,000 a year. So double, almost two and a half times the number of race. Uh, yeah, race I, th starts. I think Equibase published something like six or 700,000 workout times a year. Right. And we know from much of your past research, Dr. Palmer, that it's the uh, accumulation 
of high speed performance either, either in workouts or races that's important not just one or the other right? either either a lot of it or not enough of it <laughs> exactly so valentine you focus mostly on workouts so talk to us what is a valid data set to you how big does that need to be uh, for you and your team to be comfortable making conclusions I would say it depends on uh, what you would like to investigate. Uh, if you would like to investigate like the electrocardiogram of the horse uh, during a workout, only one monitoring could be enough to identify something wrong. Then after, uh, have the vet to have a closer look to, to investigate it. Um, after us today, uh, we use about uh, 100,000 workout to define some threshold that would help us to identify some horse like, you know, getting out of the standard very easily, but we need to be very careful with the uh, workout data uh, because uh, we need also to look at them in like an individual perspective because from a trainer to another, they will have different way to warm up the horse, different way to make the horse, uh, you know, trotting or not just after the workout, etc. From a track to another, also the data will be impacted by the quality of the ground, condition of the, tr of the track, etc. So it's always very important uh, to make sure we will have some qualified data to compare always what is uh, comparable. Great. Uh, there's some slide. If, do you want to talk through that slide quickly? That's oh, yeah, sure. So that was just to put some, uh, some image on uh, the platform we have developed. So here, like you have some example of uh, the playback of the training, the different graphs you can find, some analytic tools, the mapping of the training, etc. And also uh, something we, we wanted to tell you today, like it's us, we are very enthusiastic about some um, research program. We have a lot of research and vet using our product today to investigate new things. So uh, we have conducti conducted ourselves a lot of uh, uh, validation studies, uh, mainly for the electrocardiogram and, investigate and investigation of the different arrhythmias, etc. So we are also able to provide and uh, all the raw data from our device to investigate like a new type of uh, areas, like new things. Fantastic. So, so we have all this data. I'm going to assume the more data across tracks, right? Not just so in New York, we're boldly charging ahead. But I think could we all agree that having data across tracks, across surfaces, the more the better? Absolutely. Okay. So uh, let me give everyone a perspective for a second. Uh, <clears throat> Will mentioned Trackus before. Trackus has been at many of our tracks for many years. Uh, looking at New York, we had uh, our 2019 data had four and a half million rows of, of data from one year of Trackus. So that's kind of a lot for your Excel spreadsheet to handle. My next question is, are there any data scientists in the audience? I know we have a number of veterinarians, but is anyone taking classes in data science? Okay, so Dr. Palmer, asking you, if you're a veterinarian and you're interested in this field, what do you need to do to be able to handle all this data? Well, there's a couple of ways to handle it. Uh, you're right, Joe, that the, the really the, the, this is a new frontier, no question about it, and it's baby steps right now. And I can tell you that uh, I was trained at the University of Pennsylvania in 1976, same era as Dr. Bramlage, we're kind of old <laughs> compared to a lot of young people in, these, in the industry right now. But, but back in those days, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure I could have even spelled epidemiology. You know, I think that, that you, have to, you have to have training in epidemiology, you have to have training in statistics. And to work with, with uh, a data set, to work with, with an experiment, even in, in the one we just did at Belmont and Aqueduct, to take, to take you know, 6,500 recordings, lines of data, and then, then there's m millions of bytes in there when you're looking at that. You absolutely have to have a, a basically, I like to call them data wranglers. These are people that know how to work with large databases and have the computer power to, to do that, and, and a lot of this involves using artificial intelligence, which is kind of a catchphrase this day, but the, the most valuable way to do that is you don't just throw all the data in a computer and expect to get an answer out. You have to teach the computer or guide the computer to tell them you know, what, what the important things are, because a lot of covariables are going on in there, and you need to strip that all down. Yeah. 
in, <clears throat> from the TPD's perspective, if the last few years have been about acquiring the data, you know, getting onto as many race courses as possible, having a big enough data set, the present and the future is all about um, producing front ends and, and mining that data. So we're hiring huge numbers of data scientists, um, generally far younger than me, brains the size of planets, and the, the marriage of the size of this data set with some of these programming languages of like Python, you know, um, MATLAB, you know, R, but really Python 2 is what we, I guess we're doing a lot of it. I don't know that much about it, but it, it's, it's quite staggering how quickly these programs can, can evaluate this data and punch out um, meaningful results. So that's it's, it's super exciting. We, we create in-running odds. That's making 10,000 calculations per horse per second to predict who's going to win the race. We can refine that model the whole time. So it, it's an exciting marriage of sort of computer science and, and programming with huge data sets, machine learning, neural networks, all those buzzwords that people use probably and don't really mean them. In, in this game, we're really using that uh, machine learning the entire time. So racing is actually at the forefront, I think, of, of, of working with these big data sets. And um, yeah, anybody who's a budding data scientist, do get in touch with me, because we can never get enough of them. Valentin, are you looking for data scientists too? Um, yes, us, we have some uh, data scientists in, into our team uh, that are always there to provide some trainers, like uh, all the training and the information they would need to use the data to complete their feelings, their knowledge, etc., to, to complete the decision process, <coughs> sorry, into their daily job. After what we see now in some countries, such as Australia, we have some trainers that hired some uh, performance analysts to look at all the data, like we have some trainer in Australia, they have like a 25 device, they use every day for every workout, and so they have a team of uh, four people only to look at the data, so you have someone that will uh, uh, just uh, do all the data, anal data analysis and develop some uh, new code to look at the data, you have another person that will be there to transmit the information to the trainer or to the owner, and you have some people after that will be there also to make sure like uh, all the daily scenario of use is uh, running well, like uh, putting the device, the loading the data, etc. I was going to say that we were discussing this last night. That the, the 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 gap is the uh, is how do you marry the best of horsemanship and all of that natural instinct? But everybody, everybody who's been in this room over the hundreds of years and bought good horses, you don't want to you, you want to harness the human brain's ability to to train a horse, read a horse with some of the scientific, some of the data that Valentin system produces. Um, and whilst we're doing a hell of a lot of um, uh, evaluation of the data, it's more around the entertainment of the sport, the wagering, training, uh, you know, football teams, soccer teams, NFL teams, they've all got a data science person who's just looking at the data. And I'm sure they're sitting around and very much debating, does the data back up or contradict what the, the scout might say? Um, racing is going in that direction, but very few trainers uh, trained by numbers today, right? And that's probably, and that's sort of slowly changing with, with Valentin, his good product, but finding some room in the economics of training to fit in that extra salary of the people to evaluate the data and marry that with brilliant horsemanship is, um, is a big challenge. So that, that leads me into my next question. Uh, speaking of the, let's say the American sports leagues, but I know the Premier League and Australian rules football also are similar. Uh, they actually have broken things out where they've kind of standardized data collection. This is the expectation of what we want. And then they have a wide range of analysts. To use the NFL as an example, they have league-wide analysts and then each team has analysts. And then there is a vast kind of hobbyist, um, let's call them hobbyists, or some are even commercialized hobbyists now, uh, like Pro Football Focus, who does their own analysis of this stuff. Um, Dr. Palmer, what can we do to A, standardize the information that we're collecting across all racing and training venues, number one, and then two, how do we encourage research, realizing that typically uh, we've kind of had closed silos in this sport? I think that uh, introduction of HISA is going to make a huge change here because they're, they're going to re they were already are requiring a lot of data. And it seems to me that uh, right now the challenge is going to be to, to prioritize. You know, it, you know I think it, it takes a village. You know, we talk about reducing, I'm focused on reducing injury. 
And, and I think that um, and we're using fatalities, and, and there's almost everyone in this room is on that same page. So you know, I think if we're going to that needs to be one high priority. But but having having sensors on horses while they train and while they race, I think, is important to be able to do both of that because we can get a whole lot more data that way in a hurry. And I think that that uh, eventually, once once the um, if we can all work together to, to, to get a, a really a great database, that then I think there, there should be uh, competitive opportunities or at least, um, you know, much, much in the way that we have grant review processes right now at the universities and at the Grayson Jockey Club Research Foundation. You know, I think that, that scientists around the world should be able to make proposals to have access to this data and, and use it. And I think that that's going to be our, our quickest way to um, get actionable data that we can do something with. You know, and one of our answers to that is to be somewhat agnostic to what hardware is producing the, that is on the horse at that track. So we, we receive data from three different you know, um, tracking systems, standardize it so that when it goes out to scientists to evaluate for welfare or, or bookmakers or to create charts, they don't know that it's stride safe or uh, uh, McLeod or Swiss timing or, or, or GMAX. So kind of like we're sort of sitting on top of that and we can sort of standardize and homogenize uh, data so that the punter doesn't need to know the minutiae of what the sort of sensor was. It shouldn't matter. So I, I, I want to keep on this thread for a second. I want to thank our hosts, uh, the Grayson Jockey Club Research Foundation. And I think this is important that we have an opportunity to reset things. We have the opportunity to grab this data set, a kind of novel data set uh, for us, and we can let the research inform our opinions, right, and have a real scientific method here, as opposed to what we sometimes do, let our opinions inform the research. Um, so could you talk a little about how we could go about encouraging academics, uh, both within our sport and without our sport, and maybe there's ways we can find those people? I think it's, it's really important to do that, and it's going to be a challenge. Right now, it's a challenge just finding enough veterinarians to, to fill the, the regulatory role and to find veterinarians that will work at the racetrack. You know, so uh, that's our starting point. That's a pretty low bar. And now we've got to attract and incentivize people to do training in data management or, or marry these groups together in a way that we can be productive. I think, I think in the near term, it's, it's, it's a little late in the game to start training for this, but there are people around here that we can identify and pull together to start out with, and then you need to have programs developed that will incentivize and growth. You, and you can go a long way by just having, having the data easily accessible with you know, up-to-date APIs in modern languages. I think racing has suffered in the past by not having the cleanest data, data sets or, or our historic data has come in kind of great big bulk um, you know, um, Excel files. It's, 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 if you offer, you know, the modern formats, lots of APIs, lots of different types of feeds, good documentation, you'd be amazed how we can bring in more academics. There's an influx of people coming in from quant trading in financial markets, looking to trade sports where good data sets exist. So if you, if you, if you, if you provide it, people will come to it. Excellent. Will's giving us some excellent bullet points. I'm going to give you two. One is Python. If you are a young veterinarian or young and you want to get into this field, learn to code in Python. And the second one is API. So, did you write a Monty Python joke coming yeah, from you, I, Joe, there? I have no Monty Python jokes, but uh, I, I want to... It, Will, you want to show your presentation for a minute? No, don't worry. Not to worry about it. But if it flashes up while we're talking, okay. that's fine. I, I want to switch for a minute and focus to Valentin because I've seen your interface uh, that we saw on the screen a little while ago. And it leads me to a bunch of questions. Dr. Palmer kind of hit on it about working with trainers, right, to improve the health of their horse. Talk about uh, your user interface and how, how do we get people to work with this data uh, on a practitioner level, a vet at a barn, a trainer in his office. How, how do we do that? So first of all, it comes with a very easy to install hardware. Uh, that one of the that was our first topic. Like uh, when we were doing our market studies, we were working with one of the top trainers in France, and he said to us, like, uh, if your device takes more than 30 seconds to being set up on the horse, no one will never use it. <coughs> so this is why, for example, we have an, the RFID reader. 
it's make it very easy for the trainer to use it on a daily routine because you you never need to worry like about which horse is wearing what device at what time. So the data collection is very easy to do for them. Then after, to, for the platform, uh, we have developed a lot of uh, interpreted algorithm to highlight the key data for the trainer. So what we do most of the time, we have a first meeting with the trainer to define which type of indicator will be uh, the most appropriate for him to look at to answer his main question. And after the entire goal would be to always combine their feeling, their knowledge, uh, their experience with the data to, and us our job is to provide some objective data to take some decision at the end. And so this is why we are providing uh, like a strong services with some people behind to analyze the data for them and explain to them like uh, what does this mean? Uh, because once they start to use the data to take the decision to be part of the race or not, or uh, if you can find out an early pathologies and so the pathologies will, will not get too bad or if you choose to race uh, longer because of the locomotion profile, for example, it is directly linked also to the return on investment they will get using those products. And so this is like a big part of the, of the success. Right. Uh, Dr. Palmer, I know you pushed for the kind of, let's call it simplified red, yellow, and green system, but part of that is to make that understandable, right, for maybe non-technical users. No, exactly. The, the trainer doesn't need to know that his horse had a 3.5 standard deviation difference from the optimum. Sorry. What he needs to know is, can I put that horse back in to go again? Can I, I've got a good chance of racing him right back, or, or is there something going on? I need to sort it out. I need to get a veterinarian to look at the horse. And it's part of that veterinary client-patient relationship that this is a tool that gets you into the process really early. But, but by the same token, though, we do... I work from the numbers. I don't work from the colors. I work from the, num the numbers of standard deviations, and that's where the research is done. So you, you have to have those numbers to, at one level to, to use the data most appropriately. But I think communicating it to a trainer, I have a, a letter that basically I created that says, you know, your horse was just recorded. He's got a red alert. This is what this means. This is what it does not mean. And this is what you need to do. And I think that, that kind of, that's, that's actionable intelligence right now. So, Will, you, in England or in Europe, often they scoff at time, right? And you have probably a lot of experience overcoming or, or attempting to overcome that bias. Can you talk to us a little about some of the things you've done or uh, more analytic-minded people uh, in yeah, Europe yeah. have done? To... When, when we, yeah, that great freshman time is for prison yes. that came out from a champion trainer in the UK back in the day. Yeah, we, we definitely talk about tracking and not sectional timing um, because, you know, clearly we've got uphill courses, downhill courses, different surfaces, and so, you know, comparing sectional timers between Doncaster with its soggy chips and uh, an Asker is, is, not, is not comparable, although that's all can be adjusted for now in your good coding and databases. Um, so yeah, we, we think of it as tracking. It's a much wider data set. There's the safety angle, the betting angle. We think we're in the entertainment business. Um, on the left-hand side there, you've kind of got the, the enhanced chart, so try and offer much richer per half furlong data you know, str you know, stride length, stride frequency per half furlong. On the right-hand side there, you're trying to like summarize that for a whole new audience that doesn't want to talk about quarter mile times and speeds. They want to talk about who's got the top speed, you know, what, who, who ran through the line quickest, um, who, who showed the greatest sort of uh, uh, ability to race near their max power. So we're kind of like, we want to keep the traditional audience happy with a good accurate timing, but also um, you know, paint the data in new ways. Uh, so that's a winner of a, ho a horse at Ascot last week and some of his key statistics on the right. Live, the graphics, um, what's attainable for every track, um, uh, and then it live in running odds on the, on the bottom left-hand side there. And then you know, what can you do to offer people in-race in betting chances by looking at the velocity of every horse in real time? How are they racing against you know, par, top speeds, lowest speeds? Can we, can we tell people who's kind of spent the most time walking around the paddock, which horse has been in the stalls the longest, little, little on the day kind of live betting tips? Um, and then finally, after a race, rather than just talking about um, you know, who won the race, can you, can, you, can you draw speed charts? This is a particularly interesting one from Ascot last week where a horse called the Riddler uh, careered across the track, blocking the run of every single horse he was up against. 
and uh, the stewards can't yet use that information, but they hopefully will soon, and you can see that that horse in blue, how much its velocity was, um, was cut off by that. That creates huge talking points. We had hundreds of thousands of pieces of people engaging with that. That's a much better way of telling the story rather than running the replay 700 times, which is what the TV companies have done uh, to date. That, that's excellent. That last slide was excellent because I remember watching that race and watching him cut off a number of horses. So seeing it in um, that format is, is really validating. And then there's new types of bet. Some would say they're quite frivolous. They are a little bit frivolous, but a new audience that's going to come in, that's going to bet on NFL, it's going to bet on, on, on basketball and hockey. They want to maybe bet on, you know, who's going to reach the top speed, who's going to do the fastest final furlong, as well as in-race wagering. So, yeah, we're, we're spread across a whole number of fronts, and the question is, can we adapt our huge data set for a welfare point of view? Um, can it spit out some of the kinds of things that uh, Dr. Palmer's talking about? as well as bringing more people into racing to engage with it. So I'm going to get back to that in a second. I just want to ask Dr. Palmer, so you've actually dealt with New York Naira-based trainers with this data going to them and saying, hey, your horse may have a problem. What's the response been? Well, it's, it's been kind of interesting. Uh, when I was reviewing the Saratoga results, I, would ha I, had a, I was tracking those horses in a progressive fashion, looking at what they were doing, and I would see a horse win a stake at Saratoga and then drop off the radar screen, and, and, I, and I didn't know what happened to him. So I'd call the trainer, who is now in Florida, and I'd say, by the way, I just want you to know, you won a great stake in, in Saratoga. I kind of thought this horse might go with you to Florida, but I haven't seen anything, you know, recorded workouts, what's going on. I mean, the recording we have looks like he might have had a problem in that race. And, and there's usually, there's a long silence on the phone for about 20 or 30 seconds. And then he says, how did you know that? He said, he, he's at Windstar right now. He's recovering from surgery. You know, so the trainers are, uh, they were initially very frightened of this technology because the word was out that if we got a red alert, Palmer's going to scratch your horse. And so after, after, you know, after 5,000 horses, I said, how many have I scratched? None. You know, that's not what we're doing here. This is an educational deal. And so they, I think the trainers are, are fairly consistently very, very supportive of it. They're very interested in, in the information you can give them. It's like a great piece of insight that they would not ordinarily have. There's rumors running rampant on the backside that aren't true? Is that... Is... Shocking. Just simply shocking. <laughs> So, Valentin, you work a lot with the trainers uh, in the morning. It, try to explain what is, uh, who, not specific individuals, but how are they using this information a little more? I know you, you touched on it before when talking about your interface. Are they stretching horses out, running in longer distances because of that? Are they pointing, are, are they able to get them ready for the races faster because they can see their fitness levels? Um, uh, you know, without having to overwork them? Sure, so I mean, each trainer will use a different angle most of the time to use the data. So first you have uh, all the welfare and health uh, aspect. For example, uh, you will monitor your horse a few times. You will always do the warm-up phase with your horse, so you will know exactly what is his average heart rate during the warm-up phase. Uh, let's say the horse is around 125 beats per minute every day. If one day you see the heart rate going up to 140, 150, it will probably mean there is something wrong that needs to be investigated, maybe a pain or something, uh, something else. So you can contact your vet directly, or your vet can also have access to the data by distance to monitor those parameters for you. Then uh, after you will have uh, another very easy way to use the data. Let's say you will monitor your uh, last workout before a race. You will know exactly what was the peak speed data, how the horse handled his maximum speed for how long time. You will know exactly how many times the horse has spent into an aerobic zone, what was the level of the recovery fitness data. Then you will have the locomotion profile as well during the workout. You will go to the race. If the race is going well, you are happy with uh, how the horse ended the race. For the next previous work before the next race, you would be able to know 100% if the horse is back into the same good condition. I think I can help uh, pay Valentine a compliment. It's really in the, the, the strike rate. So the trainers who have that huge extra level of, of insight tend to, tend to, their horses are ready to rumble and they have a, you know, you have trainers with less horses punching above their weight with strike rates. I'd highlight somebody like George Bowie in the UK, very young trainer, 
less than 50 horses, got no right to be winning a classic race, you know, with a horse that's been, so you, or they're buying very cleverly horses in training, buying very cleverly at breeze up sales, and then training them with a level of precision that means that their strike rate is, is very impressive. So I think that's a... Yes, yeah, strike rate is pretty cool to objectize the acceleration process of the horse. So when you look at the workout, you will find different acceleration profile. You will have some horse increasing both stride length, stride frequency. You will have some horse increasing only their stride length. Or you will have some horse decreasing the stride frequency, increasing the stride length, for example. And so us, we use a lot the stride frequency to help just objective it. Uh, so it's very mechanical, but basically the IS the stride frequency will be at full speed. From a mechanical point of view, the less distance the horse will need to get to his maximum speed. As an owner, it helps you get that horse to the right distance with the right running tactic much more quickly. And in the UK, terrible prize money. It's less of an issue here. We dream of your prize money levels. Um, you know, maybe it's not such a thing, but the transport costs, you know, the inflation in training fees, transport costs, you can't be spending $500, $1,000 traveling to a race, and then you're going over like the wrong distance or your, your running tactics are a little bit wrong because that's just eating up potentially eight weeks of feed and costs. And that's how we're burning too many owners in this game is that we're not sort of going straight to the right tactics and the right distance. And if we can like narrow the angles on that and keep more owners enjoying the racing experience, that's good for the whole ecosystem. So what I'm hearing is there's somewhat of, we have this data set and there's a melding of its uses. There's equine welfare, the topic of this summit. There's performance. Maybe there's wagering, display, et cetera. In human sport, and I guess I'm going to go to Dr. Palmer on this. In human sport, let's say in pitching in baseball, they found that efficiency of performance actually is highly correlated to injury prevention. And would you expect to see a similar result? I know we don't have that data yet, but would you expect to see a similar result here? Well, I, th I think in, in Little League Baseball, you know, teenagers were suffering tremendous injuries from, from doing too much pitching. And the American College of Surgeons and the Little League did a study and figured out, well, you know, if they just put some restrictions on how many pitches those kids could throw, the problem goes away. And so I'm, I'm confident that we're going to learn things from this technology that's going to help us in terms of, of not just trainers making individual decisions, but uh, racetracks, uh, you know, carding races and scheduling races and things like that. I think it's got some tremendous potential for that, too. One of the other things I wanted to mention about the, the data that we're getting from these horses is it also tells us a lot about the racetrack. In other words, while each population of horses has a fingerprint, so does every racetrack, and it's different. And so, and so I, I fully expect when we see the data from Belmont and, and Aqueduct compared with Saratoga, we're going to see some differences in terms of quality of horses, the speed of the racetrack, the, the way the, the horses move over the track. And so, you know, the, the horse for the course kind of data is going to be able to be quantified really accurately with this. That's, uh, the punters will be excited for that. Will, were you going to say something? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, okay. This is my final uh, question for you guys, and you can feel free to expand. I'm going to use a, an American baseball analogy. I'm going to start here with Will, and we'll work down the uh, What inning are we in? If, if you don't know baseball, we have nine innings. Um, what inning are we it's in? It's just too long, baseball. I can't yeah. watch it for that long. And the season never ends either. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I think we are we're now into the exciting stuff of the web, exciting big, I give a new analogy, big wide open space where we've got enough content now, it's about what we do with it. And so um, I'd say we're, we're, we're over halfway. Is that, is that an over okay Over halfway, answer? okay. But for baseball that means there's Top years left. Top of the fifth. Top of the fifth. I'd, I'd switch that analogy to a racetrack, if I could. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> and I would say that we're well out of the starting gate, and, but I'd say we've got a long way to go. We're, we're just, again, we're, we're gathering some amazing data, we're analyzing it, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done. To, um, to make this scalable across the country and to, to learn as much as we can from it. So I'd, I'd say we're probably entering the first turn. Okay, and let me follow up with you, Doug. As a researcher, as a veterinarian, as someone who's focused on this 24 hours a day, if, when we're sitting here three years from now, what would, if your dreams were realized, what data would you have, what would we be talking about? Well, I've got, I'm gonna, from a biased perspective, yeah. welfare. 
Well, okay. yeah. I'd, I want to. I want to. I want to censor on every horse that does a high-speed workout or, or a race. If he's going faster than, than a furlong in 13 seconds, I want to. I want to censor on him. And I want to. And I think if we can do that, it, it'll open up. It'll tremendously open up the opportunity to intervene. I, I think our fatality rates will drop way down, and our attrition's going to drop way down. Excellent, Valentin. So. Yeah. What, after, what inning are we in? Or where uh, are we on the track? That's easier. After hearing this, I would say as well, probably uh, halfway. Uh, maybe if we can do an analogy with the human sport industry. Like a decade ago, uh, we had no football players, no baseball players. They were wearing no device at all. Uh, the trainers and uh, all the medical staff, everyone was a little bit reluctant at the very beginning. Now it's not even possible to imagine a human athlete being prepared for a professional competition that will appear in front of TV without wearing an R12 belt and a box in the back to monitor all the biometrics and physical data. So I would say we are in a, in a good way and even us on the field, we can really see it uh, on a daily basis like we even some old fashioned trainer with who we are working now. So it's very encouraging and uh, because uh, it's a win-win-win uh, agreement within uh, all the different parties like uh, the owner gets something out of the data, the trainer will get something uh, with the data, the vet, of course, research institution, everyone has something to, to, to make out of the data. And as I said at the beginning, I think equine sports can overtake human sports because we can, we can share the live data and the post-race data freely with broadcasters, punters, trainers, owners. In human sports, you've got that fundamental issue is that can you persuade or pay the athletes enough money to share their vital statistics um, in real time, or is it just gonna be used in training? So that's what's super exciting, that the thoroughbred story can be kind of like shared to whoever wants to, wants to tell that story. Okay, guys, thank you. I'm gonna use my final minute to give you the zealot's pitch here, okay? I'm me being the zealot. There's not a human football player or soccer player at a professional level who's not using a catapult vest. At F1, the drivers all use gloves that track their heart rate and perspiration. Uh, excuse me. Weightlifters are using push bands to understand their load. The human sport's about 10 years ahead of us on this. And as Will just pointed out, they have things like players' unions and privacy concerns. Not that we don't have things like privacy concerns and equity issues, making sure all trainers get access to this. And who, what are the security um, provisions on this data and who owns the data and all that that needs to be knocked out uh, amongst us. But we're 10 years behind, but we can catch up and we should catch up. It's not just for the benefit of the betting public, but it's really for the benefit of the horses. It gives us tools and opens us up to people we've never uh, been exposed to before who can truly help us. We're kind of a closed community. We're a small community in the sporting world, but this data and the sort of analysis that goes with it could really alter the trajectory of the sport. So let's all invest, right? We spend, right on this stage, we spend millions of dollars on horses, to the hundreds of millions in one session. And That's just your budget. Yeah, sadly, no. But, uh, and to get people to invest in this technology, in the analysis especially, um, we owe it to the horse, we owe it to ourselves, we owe it to the industry, quite frankly. Uh, we need to spend dollars. Anyway. Thank you all. Thank these great panelists. And uh, anyone else? Thank no? you, Chad. My pleasure. Thank Denise. <clears throat>
Since 1894, the Jockey Club has been dedicated to the improvement of thoroughbred breeding and racing. Its initiatives range from health and safety of athletes to promotion of the sport. Blood Horse, owned by the Jockey Club and Toba, serves owners and breeders with the largest reaching news media platforms and has proudly covered the thoroughbred industry for more than 100 years. Hello everyone, welcome back. We are going to get started again with our afternoon presentations. Many positive changes and innovations have occurred for the health and safety of our equine athletes since the first summit in 2006. Both regulatory and association veterinarians have witnessed several of these changes, including pre-race exams, monitoring horses between starts, advancement to the void claim rule, stronger vets list rules, and extended withdrawal times for medications. I'd like to welcome Dr. Mary Scalay Ward, Executive Director and COO of the Racing Medication and Testing Consortium, who will introduce and moderate the Regulatory Veterinarian Panel. And I did have just a couple of slides to sort of kick off. Oh, here we go. Um, so today's discussion is really going to be about change because I think that's what we're all facing and there's a lot of concern about that. And so I just wanted to start off um, by reminding you to follow the instructions of the poet, philosopher, musician, and fashion icon, um, David Bowie, who told us to turn and face the change. Ch -ch -ch changes. Feel free to sing along, okay? Where's the, where's to, on the chair, uh-huh, okay. It's just the green arrow, right? See how I learn, okay. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of a history lesson because we this sport has undergone a tremendous amount of change that some of you may not even be aware of, but where we are now uh, is a long way from where we started out. And um, hats off to one of my favorite historians, Ed Bowen, because he's taught me that there's so much to learn from the past, and so I want to share that with you. I've gotten a lot of mileage out of these slides over the years. Um, this is <clears throat> from 1939. Uh, newspaper headline says, Seabiscuit is lame after defeat by today at Santa Anita. And blowing up that box, it says, opinion was divided on his chances of returning. He's come back gimpy many times, but returned to race nonetheless. So my question for you is, do you think Seabiscuit would be allowed to race today if he were chronically lame? Would he get past the vet? Would he have achieved the record that, he, that put him in the history books and got him in that, that good movie? Um, I present to you that racing a chronically lame horse is no longer acceptable, and I think that should be fine with all of us. You do need to remember that in 1939, the country was coming out of the Depression, and people were trying to overcome adversity, and so seeing this little horse overcome adversity to prevail um, was inspiring to the nation. It's not so inspiring now. Change. Um, the next one, oh, I'm sorry, that doesn't show up any better. Um, this is actually a clipping from the Chicago Tribune that I cut out myself in fourth grade. Um, they were lefty scissors, and they treated lefties like we were perhaps disabled. The scissors were foam padded and didn't really cut anything, which explains the poor job on the snipping. But nonetheless, it was about dancer's image. Um, and here we are three days before the 93rd running of the Preakness, um, and he's feeling much better following the tapping of his bothersome right ankle last night. Uh, this, let's see. Another box says, the groom mentions that uh, the horse just really would walk on it the day before, but he's feeling much better now. And the little box at the bottom says that he's scheduled to gallop three miles tomorrow. So 
there's a lot to unpack there, 1968. 1973, this is Dr. Jane Lair. She was uh, the examining veterinarian in Illinois. Uh, when I started, I didn't start in 1973. Um, and there was actually color photography when I started. Any of you were thinking, oh my God, there was no color photography when she started on the track. Not entirely accurate. Jane was doing pre-race exams before it was mandated anywhere. She was a leader in that respect. But the interesting thing was, Jane didn't do pre-race exams on stakes horses. And when you'd ask her why, she'd say, well, they paid to run their horses. You'd say, what? And she said, well, they've already affirmed by putting their money up that they expect the horse to put in a credible performance. So they've already vouched for their horse, so I don't need to check that horse. So her concept of the pre-race exam was solely focused on ensuring that the better got a fair play for his investment, that that horse performed, gave a legitimate effort. And then here we are in 1989, and yes, I was working at the track then, and this is a horse that I remember. Its name was Brandy Cutlass, and you can see it ran quite well. Actually ended up with 58 lifetime starts, 15 wins, and um, in its three-year-old year, I think it made 17 starts. In its four-year-old year, it made 15 starts. Several careers for other horses. Um, but anyway, you'd see this horse, one, 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 one. Obviously a very successful racehorse at his level. Each time he ran, he limped back to the winner's circle. And I would call the state vet from the phone in the winner's circle and I'd say, Swede, Brandy Cutlass lame right front. And he'd say, Mary, did he win? Knowing full well that he won because we did have TV back in those days. And I'd say, yes, and he said, then what more do you want from the horse? He may have been lame, but he beat all those other horses. He doesn't need to be on the vets list. And every, week, every time the horse ran, I'd call him and say, sweet, he's lame right front. It's, it, this isn't right. And he said, but he won. He said, we'll put him on the vets list when he's lame, and he runs second. Hopefully you understand that that is no longer um, a credible approach to protecting our racehorses, but that's the history that we come from, and that's the change that you might, may not be aware of. And so with that, I'm going to introduce our panel who are going to talk about more contemporary changes. Um, some of them don't even know what a rotary phone is, but that's okay. They're changes that they've seen. Um, Dr. Will Farmer is Equine Medical Director for Churchill Downs Incorporated. <clears throat> the racetracks under his purview are obviously Churchill Downs, Fairgrounds, <clears throat> Presque Isle Downs, and Colonial Downs. Lots of Downs. Okay. Um, next, we have Dr. Jackie Bradley. She's the commissioned veterinarian at Prairie Meadows in Altoona, Iowa. And all the way on the end, we have Dr. Lynn Hovda, who is the chief veterinarian for the Minnesota Racing Commission. So we're going to do a couple of quick questions to introduce you to them and their experience, and then we'll, then we'll get down to the ch -ch -ch changes. Um, Will, we'll start with you and just work down the row. When did you start working as a racing regulatory veterinarian? Four days before the 2008 uh, Derby, which was eight bells and big brown year. Um, truly baptism by fire. Um, but uh, it was a, quite an experience for me, my first day on the racetrack, because uh, prior to that I had no real racing experience. Um, I grew up on the farm, did uh, horses when I graduated from veterinary school, uh, took a job out of necessity and for working for the commission with my wife being in dental school in University of Louisville. And so... I wanted to do horses and I uh, had the opportunity, so I, I just kind of followed that, and uh, that was my, my first experience. Well, welcome aboard. Thank you. Jackie? I started becoming a regulatory veterinarian in 2014, and it actually was at the dog track in Dubuque. It was my first three years as a stepping stone to Prairie Meadows after that. Okay. Um, and you have an interesting backstory since Will gave. Let, let's hear yours, because I think that should be something a lot of our racetrack operators will be interested in. In uh, 1999, when I graduated from high school, I was walking through our local horse fair, and a gentleman pulled me over to the table and said, you need to sign up for this program. And it was the Iowa um, Quarter Horse Racing Association, and they had a Racing for the Future program that allowed high school students to shadow the trainers and to learn how the entire backside worked. 
Through that program, I also got sent to Lone Star and did the same thing down there. And it kind of jump-started my career into racing. The following year, I helped with the program. And then later that year, I um, started working in the test barn, where I worked for nine years as a pea catcher. Um, and then I went out into mixed animal practice. And then finally was called back, like I said, to the uh, Greyhounds as the stepping stone back to Prairie Meadows. And once I started back there, I knew I was home. Dr. Hofta? Well, I'm of your vintage, probably know what a dial-up telephone is. So it's been at least 20 years that I've been the chief commission veterinarian. I actually started my career working hot or walking hots when I was in veterinary school. Went on to do an internship and a residency in um, large animal medicine. And then uh, worked for one year on the backside at Canterbury Downs, which is now Canterbury Park, and decided that um, I wasn't quite mentally prepared to be a backside veterinarian, so I went over to the dark side and became a regulatory veterinarian. Okay. So, next question, we'll just start with Will and move on down. How has your job changed since you started? So, I think that, um, you know, as all of our lives have changed, uh, as with the progression of technology, uh, that's probably been one of the biggest areas um, where things have changed. Uh, when I first started uh, with the Kentucky Racing Commission back in 2008, we were right, we, I started right at the beginning of change. They had started to implement uh, using the Encompass system, which is a uh, internet-based database uh, that is now universally used across the United States for pre-race exams. And to see that become incorporated into our daily uh, position uh, of doing our exams prior to, prior to 2008, uh, Pre-race exams were certainly done in Kentucky. However, the emphasis was more of are they upright, are they walking around the stall okay. The hands-on, the trotting portion of that um, was not emphasized as much as it was 2008 and then, you know, obviously through today. So I think those are some of the, uh, it just is continually advanced um, as technology has moved forward, um, obviously with r increased regulation. Uh, med some of the medication regulation and some of our um, other welfare issues uh, to advance um, how we do our job forward. So when I started, we did have Encompass and we were already doing the uh, full physical exams in the mornings. So the biggest change that we've had has kind of been recently in the last two or three years on evaluating the risk factors in the mornings before the horses um, actually even hit the track so we know which ones are on our, on our radar. I think perhaps the biggest change for me um, personally and professionally was when we added a standard red track in Minnesota because, well, I know a lot about quarter horses and um, a lot about thoroughbreds. I really didn't know very much about standard breads, so I had to take a deep dive into standard breads and spend some time at a few other tracks, so I came up to speed on them. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to ask you now, each of you get just one. You can have the same one or different. What is the single most impactful change for horse safety and welfare that has occurred in your career? And it could be something that's an industry-wide initiative. It can be something that happened locally to you. We'll start with Lynn this time. Um, for me, the biggest change has been the change in the medication policies and the rules and regulations. And Mary and I have talked about this a few times, and I think Scott Palmer as well, when we started doing this um, inter- uh, articular injections of corticosteroids could be given, at least in my state. We have a 48-hour rule, so 48 hours out from racing, you could still put a needle in a joint. And then we were lucky enough to move that out to five days in my state, and we moved it out to seven. We've moved it out to 14. And um, if currently we have some other policies in play about the number of times that you can put a injection in a joint and, and still have the horse run. So for me, it was the changes in medication. And that also includes the changes in the thought process of phenylbutazone and um, the other NSAIDs that are used, because it really pushed me over the edge when I would hear people who I know knew better stand up and say, well, it's just like giving an aspirin. Uh, mine would be the fact of the change from should they be racing or can they be racing to should they be racing? The same concept that you were discussing to where 
they won, so we should allow them to run again. And I think that's the big shift that I'm seeing on our backside right now is the should they be racing. I think uh, in addition to what uh, both um, Jackie and, and Len have said uh, regarding um, some of the changes we have, w one for me that I have been uh, in, was involved with both before the rule was implemented here in Kentucky and then have seen the effects of afterwards and its use uh, when I was during some time in California was the voided claim rule. Um, I think that the voided claim rule has really uh, made leaps and bounds because it has changed the approach to entering a horse in a claiming race. Um, and the, we have de-incentivized the idea of, I'll make it someone else's problem. And um, while it is certainly not a foolproof system or a system or a rule without a controversy, I do think the overall intent, the, over, the overall arching effects that it, have, it, it has had on our uh, overall population because many of our races, the vast majority of our races are claiming races, the effect is, is profound. And I guess I just interject at this point, sort of a shout out to the regulatory veterinarians. That is probably one of the toughest, most pressured jobs to do is examine the horses for the void claims. I don't know anybody who enjoys that. And they do a professional and consistent job. And so just props to them because it's, it's not something anybody looks forward to doing. I've had them on both sides. I've had this, the, the losing and the winning and both arguing, you know, the opposite thing. So, yeah, you do tend to get caught in a crossfire um, between that. Uh, I think many states have gone to, you know, trying to make that as, um, I don't want to say a private decision, but to exclude, to try to keep those parties away from being able to try to influence the veterinarian because you do need, you need some quiet time to be able to look at the horse, be able to do your exam thoroughly. But it's, it is, it's a very difficult place to be. But at the end of the day, as regulatory veterinarian, uh, my sole concern is the welfare of the horse. And if there is something there um, that, that I can identify and document uh, and there's concern, I, I, I can act on that. Actually, I'm just going to second Will on that one. And um, the veterinarian in our test barn who is doing these is doing a wonderful job. And I laughed at her the other day. I said, well, we need to get you a support group. And she said, you are my support group. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, and I'm just going to throw in a plug for the equine injury database. I've got a special place in my heart for that. But many of you don't know, in 2007, when Barbara was injured, Many of us at different racetracks were getting questions about how often does this injury occur? How, you know, how many horses recover from this? And none of us had an answer. None of us had an answer. And it certainly made us look like we weren't very good stewards of our horses if we didn't know what was happening to them and whether or not they were recovering from the injuries. So every time Tim talks, I just kind of swell with pride because he has done remarkable stuff with the data that these guys make sure gets put in the system on a daily basis. Okay, so now, Will, I'm going to ask you to put your uh, smaller racetrack hat on, and for all three of you, in, in no particular order, have there been challenges in regulating a sport that is not a signature industry in your state? And conversely, have there been situations where it's been easier to implement change because it's not a signature industry in your state? Yeah, so to kind of just explain with, with Mary, um, you know, obviously I have a vast variety of racetracks that uh, I'm involved with through um, Churchill Incorporated. And so definitely have all, all levels. Um, and there are unique challenges with each of those. Uh, in certain states, um, we have very, very strong horsemen groups and they tend to have, be very boisterous and very powerful when it comes to uh, deciding some of uh, how uh, commissions act or how they move. Um, and so that, from my standpoint, on a regulatory standpoint, is very, very challenging. Um, to be creative, to work with the structures that are already in place, to be able to uh, bring in some house rules uh, where we can, to try to uh, improve the safety and welfare in a jurisdiction that may not always uh, seem to come as strong on welfare and safety. Um, and then to, on the converse of that, uh, another jurisdiction where um, I think overall, because it is a smaller jurisdiction, we have actually made some changes that were well embraced um, and have actually then been picked up by the Racing Commission to become 
uh, re uh, state regulation. So I think that that's a huge win when we're able to start at the ground at the ground level at the racetrack, and then the commission is able to see the effectiveness of that, and then incorporate that into their rules. Our biggest challenge um, that I see at the smaller tracks is actually the monetary constraint of not being able to have some of like the PET scan and the bigger equipment that would be very nice that the larger tracks have. Um, and yes, on the converse side, it is easier to implement some of the decisions that need to be made because we don't have all of the insight. And, and I'd say you make a really good point because the criteria for soundness and safety and welfare uh, can't or shouldn't be lowered at these racetracks, but the resources and the accessibility to the level of medicine that might be needed to maintain horse health can be hugely problematic. Correct. So that's, a, that's an ongoing challenge that I see. Some of our practitioners don't even have a digital radiograph. They're still hand developing their films. Lynn? I've been actually thinking about this as we're sitting here. I, I think for me, um, it's prob probably one of the easiest things to do is get our rules changed so that we can update them on a yearly basis. And being at a smaller track where you know the people, you know the people in the HBPA or you know the people in the MHRI and you can sit down with them face to face and negotiate makes getting a lot of the rule changes, whether they're house rules or they're actually written into your, your um, rule book, a lot easier. And I'm just gonna say for us as well, even though our veterinary school is just 20 minutes away from us, it's a lifetime away in terms of what we can do for diagnostics and that's a major problem. Okay. Next question. Um, what changes would you like to see? Um, the biggest thing that I would like to see changed is better communication um, for our exams through Encompass. Have some of the tracks that aren't currently sharing their information be shared, and some of them that are using language we don't quite understand in their exams maybe make that more clear. I think if on to, to kind of expand on that, we have seen um, you know the Encompass, which was track is now track manager, um, that we are using for our, our data collection uh, is it is an amazing tool um, that we are able to communicate us. And I'll use Kentucky for a good example because we have horses that ship uh, Indiana, Ohio, Illinois, West Virginia, New York uh, on a, a routine basis. And so to be able to share that vital information regarding exam findings, regulatory exam findings on a horse um, is from a welfare standpoint incredibly helpful and it's a very efficient way to do that. Um, I think that over the years, the participation, the buy-in, um, and just the overall process of doing those exams have become um, much more standardized. We've, uh, through, um, through the RMTC with their RegVet uh, conference that's been held annually for the last several years, we, we, there's always been a focus on um, how to collaborate and to harmonize our exams so that as a, as a group of regulatory veterinarians, we can be most consistent because I think that that is a, a really important thing for us to be able to share that information effect, effectively and efficiently amongst jurisdictions, just to kind of expand on your thought. I would agree. Okay. And, and I, I do think your point about a common language, a common shorthand is really, really important. Um, you know, I, I still sometimes see things where it just says K's and A's, which stands for knees and ankles. And I would be really worried if a horse didn't have knees or ankles, I'm not sure how to interpret a finding that just says K's and A's. And so it may have substantial meaning to the person that wrote it, but it is not a value if nobody else understands what K's and A's means. So we've got some work to do there for sure. And also just to, you know, to continue to expand on it, because I'm, I'm a huge proponent of it. I, I've of the track manager system um, and the ability to communicate that information. And one of the areas that I think um, we have for many years traditionally, it was a race day exam uh, portal, portal to be used. And that's how it was used was just on race day. Um, over the last, I will say five to seven years, 
Uh, there's been a lot of work by the Jockey Club, by the Encompass people, um, in collaboration with the regulatory veterinarians, and we've really expanded that, uh, the ability of that database um, to be able to take on um, non-race day exams. And so this, this really started out uh, with the help of the Breeders' Cup when we were looking, when we look at these horses for multiple days in a row prior to a race day, and we wanted to be able to capture that information and uh, then be able to uh, have that for review, quick review, while we are doing race day exams. So I think that it's, I'm excited about the progress that we have seen with the non-race day exams, the use, the different, um, trying to get the word out on how, to, how most effectively to use that because in today's world, we are not just looking at horses on race morning. Uh, most of us are looking at horses well unrelated to races, whether it's coming off of long layoffs or you know, the, our vet list uh, horses, working horses off the vets list to be able to document that information. So it's, uh, I'm excited to see that continue to develop. Mary, I'm really excited and looking forward to what, having all of our um, private practitioners treatment sheets in an electronic modus so that we can sort and do a better job of looking at how many horses are still getting steroid injections, how many horses are getting different things. So I'm looking forward to that occurring. And I think that'll be a really useful intelligence gathering tool to see shifts in medication usage patterns within the population, not just an individual horse. And I did want to go back to Will's point for just one second and just reiterate that if you're only looking at horses on race day, you are missing the boat at this point. We know these are cumulative injuries. Anybody who says the horse took a bad step is in for a really wicked glance from me, okay? We know these are cumulative injuries, and if we're not looking at these horses at other times, we are missing an opportunity to help protect them. So from my pulpit today, that's an important message. We ready for the next? Pardon? Ready for the next question? I'm ready. Okay. Um, your job's biggest challenges and greatest frustrations, we'll start with Jackie. Biggest challenges would be probably um, accurately communicating with the, the trainers to make them see what we're seeing and not have the evidence-based medicine that we need um, where these wearables that are coming look like it might be a good answer to be able to show them what we're seeing and to get them to realize that we are there for the horse and um, that we're not just making things up. <laughs> well, my biggest challenge is staying calm in the face of owners who are very upset when their horse has been scratched, especially if they've come from out of town. Yeah, I think, um, so it, one of the unique with my roles uh, is that I deal with multiple racing jurisdictions, and so that is for me to really be, you know, in the weeds in each of those racing jurisdictions, and and that's where I see the the, the commonality or the usefulness of Hiza um, to be able to bring some of that together because I have uh, four racing jurisdictions, and every single one of them are different. Um, as we all know, everything is different. But when I'm trying to implement a house rule or do a, uh, a welfare program at one of our locations right now because of the way state regulations are set in different states that it, you know, it may not be possible at another racetrack. Um, the, same, the same rule at one does not apply to the other based on current uh, regulation. And so that's, that's a huge frustration. And, and it's the communication um, to our horsemen, um, you know, that we, I think we always, as regulatory veterinarians, our biggest challenge is communication because we are we always have important things to communicate because we're usually there you know, especially race day information because it usually is around and involves a scratching of a horse or an issue that we've identified and so I think as a as a group as a as a talking to the regulatory veterinarians um, the biggest thing that we that we need to continue to work on is our communication and I think as regulatory veterinarians our level of sensitivity to the race day sound horse um, has gotten um, finer and tighter uh, with regards of, of what we are allowing to go to the racetrack and the communication of that to trainers 
especially to our private veterinarians because they are our allies in this. And so a lot of times as a regulatory veterinarian, it tends to be confrontational because it's us versus them kind of, a, of an atmosphere. And one of the things that we can really work on is to help if a private veterinarian's um, you know, love threshold for a sound horse is here and the regulatory veterinarians is here, that is, that's the area of miscommunication. And so if we can help to communicate that to our private practitioners, uh, I'll use the example, uh, you know, here in our state, all of our horses by state regulation are required to have a pre-entry exam done by their private practitioner before they are even allowed to enter in a race. And so they're tends to be concern or frustration when a horse is scratched on race day and they say, well, my vet you know, just okayed this four days ago when he did the pre-entry examination. Certainly things change, we all know that. Five minutes later, a horse may look completely different than the initial exam, but it is trying to communicate what that level, that threshold that is being used amongst the regulatory veterinarians to the private veterinarians so that when they do their pre-entry exam, we're closer to the same page. And I think that that's right now our biggest challenge is to close that communication gap. I think another thing might be the need to communicate how the, the goal or the, the intent of the pre-race exam has changed. I mean, there was a time when the default was the horse will run unless we find something wrong with it. Unless we can find a reason for it not to run, this horse is gonna run. And I think that in the last couple of years, it has really become, you're going into the stall and it, the, the veterinarian is saying, basically, did the trainer defend to me why this horse should be allowed to run today? And so it, it's, a, it's a different dynamic than it used to be. Yes. Some people have, have understood that very clearly. Others have not understood it as well. And that's, that, again, has resulted in some communication difficulties. Okay. Now it's story time. Um, I'm going to ask each of you to tell me the single most gratifying event, the most, the single career affirming moment that lets you know this, you, you made the right choice, you're in the right place and you're doing the right thing. And I'm going to help you by telling my story first so you've got a few minutes to think. But when I was working at Arlington and I was relatively new, and if I knew as much as I thought I knew, I would have been useful, but I didn't, you know. And this horse got hurt on the racetrack, and Jack Vanberg was a trainer. And I ran out there, and he shows up with his staff, and the horse is standing there, and you know, I knew which leg it was. And he said, what do you think it is? I'm like, well, uh, I think it's a knee, and blah, 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 blah. And he said, well, I'm pretty sure it's this, and it wasn't a knee. And he explained to me why. And while he was doing that, he was directing his staff. He gave his keys to one of his employees and said, take my car, go back to the barn, find all the towels that you can, tell everybody we're coming back with the horse in the ambulance, we want a tub of water by the stall, we're gonna rub this horse dry. Gave somebody else instructions. He very calmly directed the whole scene while he was teaching me about the horse's injury. We got the horse in the ambulance, sent it back to the barn, but he was exceptionally generous. He knew I didn't know what I was talking about, and he could have just pushed me aside and said, get out of here, let the grown-ups do their work, but he didn't. He took time to teach me, and it was many years later. I was in the equine medical director's position in Kentucky, and I happened to see him in the paddock one day, and I went up and I said, I'm sure you don't remember me, but I remember what you did for me, and I try every day to do that for other people. Um, it was a remarkable moment. It was an extreme display of generosity at a time when most people are really anxious and tensions are high and emotions are, are crazy. And through all of that, he found the time to teach me and make me a better veterinarian, and he didn't owe me any of that, but he did. So to me, that was a, a tremendous moment. Will, you're up. Perfect. Um, so mine was, again, I think, probably for most of us is gonna be early on in our careers, otherwise we wouldn't still be doing this if we didn't have that, that aha moment or that confirmation. Fairly early on within the first year, um, it was probably my very first meet at Churchill Downs. Um, it was my very first scratch that I had. It was a horse that had gotten cast in the stall and had uh, a laceration. And the trainer um, was adamant that it was just a skin laceration and, and gave me, you know, as trainers tend to do, they're gonna campaign for their horse. It, it, he felt that the horse was not injured enough to, um, to not race that day. And, and I stood my ground and 
when we came back and followed up, uh, had conversations, well, sure enough, this horse had probably at the same time caused a hairline fracture. And so, because uh, the horse did never really recovered and ended up doing diagnostics and found a hairline fracture. And so, you know, that for me was like, I stuck to my guns. It was hard in the moment, especially that those first, it's still hard. It's not something that we look forward to scratching a horse, um, it, no matter whether it's a $5,000 claim or, or Mary and I have been involved in scratching horses out of the Kentucky Derby. It's not a fun thing to do at any point in time, but when you do, when you stick to your guns and, and at the end you find out that absolutely that was the right decision and, and I was able to protect that horse, um, that was all I needed for me. It, that really sealed the deal for me and I was like, this is where I am. My personality is such that I'm not a real fiery person. I tend to be, I can handle the stressful situations fairly well um, and so being in that type of environment, uh, you know, that was, it, it, that sealed it for me. I don't know that there's an exact single moment, but there's just a multiple ones where we saw, saw something in the morning and were able to take the horse out of the race and later found out that there actually was something there and it just validated what, what we found. And there's been others where we've looked back at our vets list and 90% of the horses that we've put on there have not come back to racing six months later. So it, it's that kind of stuff that validates that we're actually doing something and helping these horses. And so I just have to ask you, does that experience help you with subsequent interactions with those trainers? It increases your credibility because you, you did know that, you did you intervened and you protected the horse and so the next time you say, oh, I'm not so sure we're in, in a good spot here. How usually, usually. Sometimes they, they'll they come back and they'll thank us later. Um, it's, it happens. <laughs> um, not and, often enough though. Right, right. And we have had the backside vets come up and say, yeah, you made the right call. We found this on the horse and um, definitely shouldn't have been racing that day. Well, I, similar to Mary, have a story, I guess because we've been around so long. Um, I was still working on the, on the gate, working behind the starting gate, and I don't remember the exact month, but it was hot, really hot, and I'm pretty sure that at that time we didn't really think about canceling racing unless um, we were all pretty close to a death experience. So it was a very hot day, and I had a horse that fell down um, just past the finish line, which at Canterbury Park is right in front of the grandstands. It's the worst place in the world to have a horse fall down. And the crowd was still. Everybody was just quiet, looking, watching, and then a million people all appeared on the track and we sort of shooed them all off. Everybody go, we'll take care of this. And I had two of the best gate crew I could ever ask for sit on that horse's neck while I got it treated and we waited and waited and waited and I got the horse ambulance out there and um, had it backed up perfectly and I had the crew get off their neck and he stood up and got on the ambulance and everybody in the grandstand clapped and I thought, this is it, I belong here. Can I add one thing? Yes, you may. <laughs> so I think as many, you know, to everyone's point about there are those times where you feel validated. There are so many times, too, that keep me striving to do better when you do okay a horse to go to the racetrack and it does suffer an injury. And you, you're, there's constant self-reflection in that because what did I miss? And so there's this continual drive to learn and improve uh, my own skills, my own techniques, because, um, you know, I at the end of the day, it's, it's very frustrating to me when we do the best that we can and, and there is still an injury that happens. And I, so again, I, I always question that. And so with as many times as, as much as you know, we like to have those aha moments and, and reaffirmations, I also think what drives me a lot are those times of self-reflection to figure out how to make myself better because as a regulatory veterinarian, I wanna do the best I can for the horse every day. And those are the nights that you don't sleep. Exactly. And there can be lots of them. <laughs> lots. Yep. Okay. What was the best advice you've ever been given about doing your job? I'll start with that because it, I actually laughed at Mary um, a little bit about this. It really was don't look down, Mary. But it's not don't look down at the horse legs. It's don't look down when you're communicating with anybody. Look them straight in the eye. Don't back off. Stand your ground. 
Mine was learn to be the veteran quarterback and have a bigger field of vision and not just focus on one thing, but look at the whole picture. You might miss things if you're focused. Yeah, and I think it's, it is stick to your guns because usually, and I had a veterinarian who had told me that, you know, when, you, when you've got a strong feeling, stick with it. And um, as I tell trainers now, um, I have big enough shoulders that if I'm wrong, I will admit it. If I, if I scratched a horse that they've done the diagnostic workup and um, they were not able to confirm what I felt that I was seeing or my, or my uh, to confirm my exam that I had on a pre-race scratch, um, I'm, I'm okay to stand up to say what I felt that day, I wasn't comfortable with. Um, but to stick to your guns because nearly every time they are correct. Your, your initial instincts, um, your intuition about you, what you're finding, what the horse is telling you as you're doing your exam is correct. And I'm, Mary? I'm going to go ahead and say mine. Um, it was said to me by Dr. Paul Smith, who was the Illinois Racing Board veterinarian for the harness tracks in Chicago, when I had been doing some harness work before I decided to go to the thoroughbred side in a regulatory position. And Smitty was a little worried that people were going to run over the top of me. I know some of you may think that's funny. And he just looked at me and he said, always make them worry. You might be a little bit crazier than they are. <laughs> and you know what? Words to live by, right? You don't have to act crazy. You just need people to be a little worried that it's in there and maybe they don't want to cross that line. And so um, I'm fine with it that I'll, I'll get it put on a sweatshirt, my Christmas cards, whatever. It was good advice. Great advice. You're welcome to use it, anybody who wants to. Um, so my next question, what skills did you think you needed when you took the job? And now that you've had it for a while, what skills do you know you need to have? Well, <laughs> So uh, coming from a non-racing background, obviously I thought my horse, you know, my diagnostician skills would be the most important. And don't get me wrong, that is incredibly important as a regulatory veterinarian to be able to identify the unsound horse. But what I quickly learned were my communication and my um, uh, skills to be able to resolve conflict, conflict resolution skills, um, because very quickly I realized that most of the, the issues that come with a regulatory veterinarian all resolve around um, conflict resolution. To be able to you know, clearly communicate why and stand for what you're doing, um, knowing that there's gonna be an unhappy party in that conversation. And so I think the conflict resolution was, was the thing I totally underestimated. I, you know, I kind of, in the back of my head, thinking I'm going into a regulatory position. Um, and that's something still to this day is, is a constant. I mean, you know, as we are approaching, approaching and getting ready to go, um, you know, with Haiza coming on on July 1st, we're spending a lot of time working through how do we implement that our, that our tracks. And again, you know, there's, constant conflict and constant debate, and I think a lot of that's healthy, and we can work through that, and it's just figuring out how to work and walk your way through those situations. Definitely the conflict re 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 excuse me, um, resolution, but as well as um, investigative skills, whether it be a um, right. investigating the data in the mornings to see the risk factors, or post-race or post-injury, um, or even going through a truck, just the investigative skills that I needed to develop. Well, I'm pretty sure I came into being a regulatory veterinarian just about blind to everything that I would ever need. And, but as I moved up, starting in the test barn and then working behind the starting gate, finally into the chief commission spot, I can tell you that I had no idea of the leadership skills that I would need whether I would be a leader for my group of veterinarians, which was an N of one when I started, and now we're, I think, eight or nine strong, or whether I'm a leader in the field by sitting here chatting with you, or whether I'm a leader for um, the trainers and the grooms on the backside. I had no idea, and conflict resolution comes right along with leadership. So one of the things I've learned over the years is that most regulatory veterinarians sort of view this, it ends up being sort of a calling. Either you get it and you're all in or you don't stay. So what would you say to a veterinary student who is contemplating 
regulatory medicine? What, what, what does it do for you? Why are you doing it? And would you encourage a young veterinarian to get involved? So I'll start with the fact that I think that over the decades, the position of a regulatory veterinarian has changed from, and, and I will lean on both Lynn and Mary to, to confirm or deny, but from a more of a, from a the, 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 looking at the individual of the regulatory veterinarian, we have a much younger population than what traditionally regulatory veterinarians had been if you go back you know, a, a couple decades ago, where it was more of a retirement type position, um, a second career, where now we have much more younger veterinarians that are coming into the, into the field of regulatory veterinary medicine and making a career out of it like I have for myself, like Jackie is for herself, um, several of our colleagues. Um, and so I think that there's been a, a transition from being a, uh, the experience level coming into the regulatory position has changed because you used to get a lot of veterinarians who had, you know, decades of, of private practice experience or racetrack experience coming, coming into a regulatory position versus myself who had private practice, not racetrack, but coming to the racetrack. So I think that the education, um, when I was in veterinary school, I knew nothing of this type of position. No idea that there was even a regular, you know, what this job was. If you had asked me, I would have had no idea. So I think education of our veterinary students um, as Nearly every industry, veterinarians are, are included in that, both racetrack, private practice, as well as regulatory veterinarians. We need to get our word out there because of the fact that we are short-staffed. It's, it's a true challenge for us to find the veterinarians to fulfill uh, the needs that we, are, that we have and are gonna be created. Um, so I think it's, it's education of those uh, students to be able to understand what does this type of a position in, entail um, and, and to be able to understand what the skill set would be to come into a position like this. So Jackie, you're kind of in, in a unique position because you do have veterinary students working in the test barn, so you've got a, a direct pipeline to these individuals. How do you motivate them? To, you know, how do you light the passion for the job when they're catching pee? It's a bit of a leap, right? We, we do try to stand on the rail with them and you know discuss what we're seeing on these horses if, if we see a lameness on them. And we do encourage them to um, tell us what they think and um, we help them. Some of them aren't quite in vet school and they're applying, so we'll help them with their, with their applications and write them references. And we just encourage them and tell them that you know, it's a great profession and you get to see new stuff every day, even though you, you may be doing the same exams, but I'm constantly seeing stuff that I didn't think I would ever see, and it's just a new experience of things that can happen, um, good and bad, um, but it's very gratifying to be able to see the changes that you can make and be able to help these horses. We, like I said, we have the veterinary school not more than 20 minutes north of us. So at each of our racetracks, we have veterinary students. Certainly the harness horse track, they can, those students will stand at the rail oftentimes if they're not in the test barn busy doing something. And Dr. Radishal or Dr. Taylor will talk to them about a whole variety of things with standard breads, um, the gait, whether it's a trotter or a pacer, the different parts of the harness, the overcheck, how you take it off, why you take it off. They get a real education there. At um, the thoroughbred quarter horse track, it's a little bit different because our test barn is a lot, diff a lot busier there. Um, I make a point to spend 15 or 20 minutes just sitting in the test barn with the students. Sometimes we just laugh but we'll watch horses as they're walking around. We'll watch them cool. We talk about some things as basic as what color it is. Um, we talk about hind end lamenesses. We talk about front end lamenesses. And we make a point if we have looked at something in the morning and not liked it and asked for a radiograph, which we do frequently, uh, our private practitioners are very good about giving us that radiograph and we put it up on our computer in the test barn and we show them. These are the things that we see. This is what a, um, a third carpal bone fracture looks like. These are what moth-eaten sesamoids look like. 
this is what a bad, really bad ultrasound of an extensor tendon looks like. So we're, we're very fortunate that our practicing veterinarians are very helpful with that. The other thing is we encourage them in the morning to come and spend some time with us, especially if they're applying for veterinary school, so we get an idea of what their interest is. And so they'll walk around with us on our pre-race examinations, and we talk about you know, this, that, and everything else. And, and, and I think similar to Will and, and, and anybody else, we have some horses that we know are, I don't want to say stellar, but you know, well, let's go to Barn B2 because we know we have a really good set of Oslets there and you're not ever going to really see Oslets at the veterinary school. So we have some spots that we make sure that we take them and we encourage them along the way. Yeah, I mean, I think students coming to the racetrack, um, it's an incredible opportunity, you know, f aligning form with function. That's something we never really did in vet school. It was all kind of siloed. You were in radiography radiology, but you weren't doing the lameness on the horse that you were radiographing. And at the racetrack, you can see the horse's conformation. You can pick up that foot and see how that horse with that conformation wears his shoe. You can see how he travels and what stress points might be on the leg because of abnormal conformation. You watch him travel at speed on the racetrack. If, if one gets injured, they ride back in the ambulance with the horse and the commissioned veterinarian. They can see the radiographs. In some cases, they can scrub in on the surgery, see the post-op films. I mean, soup to nuts, it is a, a tremendous educational opportunity. I think we just need to let more people know that it's there. We had, when I was, when I was in Florida, we would get students rotating through, I think it was maybe Maryland Regional Veterinary College. They did a lot of external rotations. And so one of the rotations had to be um, regulatory industry. And so a lot of the students went through a meat packing, meat processing plant. But racetrack regulatory also fit into that. And we had a student who signed up because she didn't want to go to a meat packing plant. And I don't blame her. I don't either. Um, and at the end of the stay, she wrote me a nice note said thank you so much, I learned a lot, I enjoyed myself, you've got a great crew and I just want you to know you're all better than a meat packing plant. <laughs> Good to know. So it was, it was quite the compliment, we, we patted ourselves on the backs, but yeah, we've had a lot of good experiences with students, even if they don't go into racetrack medicine, if they're interested in equine, it's a great place to get experience. But they're advocates for the horse then, and they're, the students that come through us, even if they don't stay with us, they become advocates for the horse and they become advocates for all of the good things that we do because they see what we do on a daily basis. Well, it's 1.53. You guys ripped through all the questions. I thought I'd have plenty left that we didn't talk about. Is there anything you would like these folks to know about what you do that we haven't talked about? We've covered it all. Yeah, Come on, we haven't even started, Mary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so I was, I've been doing all these site visits lately, and I was at a racetrack the other day, and they had a part-time vet who was on the front side of the winter circle watching horses get unsaddled, and he's relatively new, and he goes, can you believe it, they're, they're paying me to go to the races. And I said, yeah, that's how I felt when I started, and then I started to realize all that the job entails. And, I mean, the one thing that I will say is, Every day in this job, I have laughed and I have learned something. And when either of those two things stop, it's time for me to leave. It's been, it's been great for me. I've loved every minute of it. And some of it you just can't make up. No. You just can't make no. some of this stuff up. It was, I've said many times, if you took one, you know, a week in the life of and gave it to a Hollywood producer, they'd probably turn it down because it wouldn't be believable. Um, some of the story, you know, the things that we deal with, but it's, it's always learning. That is the one thing I do love about uh, this position is that there is no day is the same. Um, you know, every single day there's something new, a continually learning um, and situations that arise to be able to, that, that require a regulatory veterinarian to think on their feet, um, to think, uh, you know, beyond just themselves or that horse to go back to the, the quarterback analogy of to be able to see the whole field. Um, on, how, on how things are playing out. Um, it, it just gives you a really different perspective. And, and I sure I speak for 
nearly every regulatory veterinarian when I say when we watch a horse race, it's very, very different than how anybody else watches a horse race. Um, because uh, very seldom can I tell you who won a race. I'm looking for the, the you know, the bobbles, the, the, the awkward steps, the checks, the, those types of things that are occurring during a race that happen very fast. And I can tell you who did that during a race and, and different points in the race and, and where that happened. Come back. But I couldn't tell you who won the race necessarily just because I'm so focused on other things. And it's, uh, it's, it's a unique uh, perspective, I think. It's definitely changed even how I look at other horse events. I go to a horse show now and I don't watch horses on the rail the same as, as I used to. It's, I'm constantly evaluating them like I am at the racetrack. So it, it makes every aspect of being around horses a little different. Yeah, I'm not a person you'd want to go to a horse show with either. I'm the same way. It's like, mm, I don't like that one. Maybe that one doesn't need to be there. Exactly. I, and I guess the thing that I close with is I think we are in sort of a unique position to be educating lots of people, veterinarians, horsemen, owners. We have huge opportunities. And for me, some of the most gratifying moments are when somebody says something back that I said to them. Um, we did a Reg Vet CE not too long ago, and James Given, who's uh, with the BHA in equine safety and welfare, I got to go over to the Grand National this year, watch the big horses jump the big fences, and it was amazing. Um, but I was with them on some pre-race exams, and he was looking at a horse, and it was not jogging well. And he said, now, what was it you said at the meeting? What about talking? You I said, I shouldn't have to talk myself into letting a horse race. And he goes, that's it. And he looked at the trainer and he goes, we're not going to go today. And I thought, I made a difference not only for that horse, but for that veterinarian and how he looks at horses, not just that one, but everyone. And I, so I am very gratified when I hear somebody take something that I said and continue to carry it forward. It means a lot. So with that, I think we've... We've burned up our hour in a constructive manner. Thank you all very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much, Dr. Scalay, Dr. Bradley, Dr. Farmer, and Dr. Havda. What uh, amazing insight that we just got from that uh, very in-depth and honest conversation, not only from an industry perspective, but for any aspiring veterinarians out there to be able to learn more about this profession. In 2016, the Grayson Jockey Club Foundation funded research by the University of California, Davis, that would attempt positron emission tomography, more commonly known as PET scans, on horses with a focus on the distal or lower limb. With success in using a new piece of equipment with breakaway safety features to perform the scans, the UC Davis group returned in 2019 with another PET scan project that was funded. Now this tool is being used to assist veterinarians in diagnosis, turning research into action. Joining us to discuss positron emission tomography and the knowledge gained from over 1,000 racehorse fetlocks is Dr. Matthew Sprier, Associate Professor of Surgical and Radiological Sciences at the University of California, Davis. Welcome, Dr. Sprier. Thank you very much, and thank you for the organization to have me here. I'm very excited to present to you today um, a lot of things we have done in the last two and a half years, and even more exciting, uh, discuss with everybody where this could take us uh, in the next few years. So in the last two and a half years, I have indeed looked at over a thousand pets on racehorse fetlocks, and I've learned a lot. So how did it start? We did the first pet scan on a horse in 2015, and at the time we used that scanner uh, that you see here on the slides, I was uh, not designed to image equine fetlock, but human brain. So we, it worked actually pretty well to image the, the horse fetlock, but as you see here, we had to have the horse under general anesthesia. So what did we get at the time? So PET, in a nutshell, is a 3D bone scan. So similar as for a bone scan, we inject a radio tracer, but then the image we obtain is a three-dimensional image um, as you see here on this slide, with on the left a normal fetlock, 
who is using that bone tracer homogeneous uh, red background, and the one on the right is a racehorse with a couple issues, uh, one in uh, the Parmar aspect of the Comdal and one in the sesamoid bone that uh, lights up at sight of increased bone remodeling. I would actually encourage you to look at the images on the uh, upper screen that are much brighter than uh, the first screen here. Um, and so this is uh, what uh, we obtained uh, as the initial uh, scans. And we can look at it in a different way. I should use a 3D rendering uh, with that little video, but we can also focus on specific lesion looking in uh, the different planes here. And what I want to show on this slide is a comparison with the scintigraphy. So we are able to image in a different planes. We have a higher spatial resolution. So here is a good example of this is a scintigraphy from the same horse, and we can tell that the condars are abnormal, but from the pet we get much more information on the specific localization, and we identify something in the sesamoid bone that uh, we had missed in the parma condyle. So as part of this uh, original study, we got to sacrifice one of the horses to uh, look at exactly what it looks like on gross pathology, micro CT, and histology, and this is a good illustration of how obvious that abnormality is on the PET scan, being this bright yellow and the red, um, but what we show here is that on the cross section, there's no defect yet, and that's what's very important to understand about bone scan. We're talking about functional imaging, so we're not looking at changes in the size and shape of structure, but we're looking at changes happening at the molecular level with uh, increased concentration of the tracer in a specific area. So what we see here is that we're looking at a bone bruise. On the microsity, we see increased porosity, and the histology shows neovascularization and osteoblastic activity. But what it shows here is that we can find some very early changes. So this was all very exciting, but anesthetizing horses at a racetrack is uh, not uh, practical. And so we, we brainstorm about that, and uh, with long mile uh, veterinary imaging, the, the company that had the initial scanner, we brainstormed with them to come up with something that would be um, more convenient to image horses. And uh, this is uh, the scanner uh, that uh, we designed. So the detector are similar to the one in the brain scanner you saw before, but the ring is oriented horizontally and opens freely. Uh, to be able to image uh, the horse standing. So we had that scanner uh, built at the end of uh, 2019, uh, thanks to some funding from the Strona Group and Southern California Equine Foundation, and the Grayson Jockey Club funded the study to uh, validate the scanner. And so we validated the scanner in Davis and took the scanner to Santa Anita in uh, December 2019. So this is the first horse imaged at Santa Anita. And here is a short uh, video showing how that works. So this is a um, scintigraphy room at Santa Anita. Uh, bring the horse in, the horse is sedated, and the scanner opens up, and we can drive uh, the scanner to the horse. So very um, easy and simple uh, to position that around the horse fetlock. And then once you're centered here, you just close um, the ring at the back of the fetlock. And uh, imaging acquisition takes uh, two to four minutes uh, per fetlock. So in 10 minutes, we can do two fetlocks, and we've been able to do all four fetlocks in under 20 minutes. So we have to inject a radio tracer half an hour prior to the scan, and because of radiation uh, safety rules, the horse has to stay in the hospital uh, for three to five hours after the scan, but the half-life being faster than with bone scan, we can release horses the same day, when for a bone scan, typically you have to keep them for a day after. So where do we stand today? So there are now five of these scanners. The first one at Santa Anita has imaged close to 500 study, over 300 horses, as we had, as you will see, many horses have been imaged multiple times. And then we have another scanner that we use at Golden Gate Fields. Uh, this is uh, the most exciting one for me because this is a scanner that we have out in Davis, but we take the scanner uh, to the racetrack. So the way we do it is right here. Uh, you can see that we load uh, the scanner in the back of a horse trailer. So this is just like a two horse trailer. We load the scanner in here. And so this is to show you right uh, back here in, in the fog of San Francisco. We can see Golden Gate. It's just like coming out of the racetrack. We have this fantastic view on the Golden Gate Bridge. So this is showing the pet scanner next to the Golden Gate Bridge. 
Uh, New Bolton Center also has a scanner since June 2020, and more recently, uh, Rude and Riddle in March of this year, and World Equestrian Center in Ocala also have a scanner, so these are the five current scanners. And what is even more exciting is that in a year from now, this number will have uh, doubled, as there are uh, five other scanners that will be installed in the next year. So what have we learned? Uh, when we started at Santa Anita, the question is, what are we going to see? Are they all just going to light up in the Parma Condal, and that's what we're going to get? Uh, so this is a busy slide showing like eight different horses. Um, but what I want to show here is the diversity of things we saw. We indeed saw a lot of uptake uh, in uh, the Parma Condal in many cases. But we also have some horses that do not show any abnormal uptake. And we have some horses showing some uptake uh, in the sesamoid bone, some uptake in P1. So quite, quite a range uh, of findings that we have here. So we had quite a few different studies going on uh, to look through all of that. Uh, the initial study at Santa Anita was funded by the Grayson Jockey Club Research Foundation. And uh, what, one of the goals of that study was compared with scintigraphy. Here is an example of a scintigraphy, which is an Abnormal scintigraphy, where we see some increased uptake in the Parma condal, but then when we bring up uh, the PET scan, indeed we confirm the increased uptake in the Parma condal, but we also see some focal uptake right here, which is uptake in the sesamoid bone. And that was a big, a big finding. We know that scintigraphy does pretty well with looking at the Parma condal, but uh, the sesamoid bones being smaller, the lesion being not as large, much more difficult to recognize on scintigraphy, much more obvious on PET. Another example, another like abnormal scintigraphy, definitely quite some increased uptake uh, in the fetlocks here on scintigraphy. Um, but when you look at the PET, you have a much better definition of everything that's going on. And we can make it spin, and we can see that there's some increased uptake in the Parma condyle, um, but there's also some increased uptake in the proximal phalanx in the subchondral bone and dorsally. Um, so again, if you compare with what we see on the bone scan, we have much uh, better definition of what is going on. Uh, we also did some comparison with MRI, and uh, a couple examples here, a case of severe uh, palmarosochondral disease, or POD, and so these are pretty well um, characterized on MRI, and here is a good example. We have a pretty uh, severe POD in the lateral palmarocondyle, and um, very good uh, correlation here between the PET uh, and the MRI. An example here of more mild POD, and same thing on the MRI, the changes are not um, as severe as in the previous case, and the PET is similar. We can see on this one, symmetric biaxial uh, mild POD. And where it is also very interesting to do the comparison is, again, in the sesamoid bones. Uh, on MRI here, very abnormal sesamoid bones uh, with like decreased uh, signal intensity on that T1 sequence, so diffusely sclerotic sesamoid bone. What's interesting on the PET is that we have some very uh, focal uptake at the dorsal aspect of the medial sesamoid bone. Um, and what's quite interesting is that this finding on MRI is actually fairly common. It's probably 25 or 30 percent of the horses that will have this kind of pattern. And also note on this case how both sesamoid look similar on MRI when the PET finds something uh, more focal, more localized in this area. And, and we'll get back to that kind of lesions uh, soon. Comparison with PET and CT, um, a lot of work here down out of University of Pennsylvania as they have um, a standing CT. And here, an example of good correlation again between PET and CT. Uh, we can see very abnormal uptake on PET, uh, the axial aspect of the lateral condyle. And when we look at it on CT, we see like a fissure in that parasagittal groove. And you can see how you can combine the two here, which is kind of the, the best of both worlds here, with PET bringing functional information. We know there's something very active in that parasagittal groove, and the CT brings a structural information. We see that there's a crack in that um, condyle, and knowing that this is something active, this is definitely going to be a case uh, at high risk uh, for, for the displacement uh, of a fracture. Uh, another example here is again in a sesamoid bone, and uh, again, pretty obvious uh, finding on the PET with that focal increased uptake in that sesamoid bone. And on the CT, the changes are much more subtle, uh, but there is a little bit of a, of a focal lucency here, uh, confirming that we have an active uh, resorptive uh, lesion at that level. So this was for comparative imaging. 
Uh, another great advantage of PET is that we are able to do some quantification. And so that's what I'm showing here. I have a case with uptake in both Parma and Dal, and I can measure what is called like an SUV for standardized uptake value, which is looking at how much radioactivity in a specific area, depending on the amount of radioactivity, the weight of the horse, and corrected for decay. Uh, so this is something that really helps assess like the, the severity uh, of the uptake. And so this has been uh, particularly helpful to grade these lesions. And what I'm showing on these slides are all the front fetlock we did in the first year at Santa Anita. And I'm using different grades, uh, one, two, three. And uh, I'm using a ratio of the uptake in the area of interest in the lesion versus the background. And so grade one would be less than double background, grade two between two and three times background, and grade three more than three times background. So I can localize a lesion and then give it a grade of severity. And this is what we found in all the clinical cases in the first year at Santa Anita. So not surprisingly, the parmacondyle are the most common with the medial parmacondyle above 50% and uh, the lateral parmacondyle a bit less frequent. And then the sesamoid bone, and again, the medial sesamoid bone more common than the lateral sesamoid bone. And then some dorsal uptake in the cannon bone and a dorsal P1 with P1 subchondral bone a little less common. So this is uh, all the findings we had in the front fetlock. Uh, very interesting to compare with the hind fetlock, which is, I have to say, the hind fetlock is a different species, as we have a very different distribution of the findings, with the lateral plantar condyle being by far the most common abnormality in the hind fetlock. And when we're looking at the sesamoid bone, we also have the lateral sesamoid bone more common than the medial which is the opposite of the front limb. Um, another really interesting um, aspect is to be able to further localize the abnormal findings in the sesamoid bones. And this is looking at all the uptake in the front sesamoid bones, and we've divided it uh, in different area. And the dorsal aspect uh, of the sesamoid bone, which is that example that we have here on the top row, is the most common, especially the medial aspect of the dorsal sesamoid bone, most common abnormal site. Then we see some uptake on the abaxial aspect, the attachment of the uh, suspensory ligament, which would be the second most common, and then the apex of the sesamoid bone. But I want to go back to this one, the medial PSB, medial sesamoid bone dorsal, which is the most common, and uh, this would be like a good example of it. Uh, so articular surface of that sesamoid bone, uh, dorsal, abaxial, typically on that medial bone. And about at the time I started looking at these images, uh, Dr. Stover and her team were doing some really good work investigating the fracture of the sesamoid bone. And what they found is that a lot of these horses fracturing the sesamoid bone had evidence of um, early resorption in that spot. And independently, we identified the same spot. And so it was like very exciting when we saw that, as this is considered like a risk factor for fracture, very exciting that this was something that we could um, assess on the PET. So this is definitely the one um, lesion we are worried about. And this is one of the Worst case I have seen, I've shown you the previous one with that uptake dorsally. This one is even more concerning when it starts extending towards the palmar aspect of the bone, as we know that this is a horse that is very much at risk of getting like a mid-body fracture uh, straight uh, through this area. So this is um, definitely, um, Dr. Palmer was talking about the red flag. This is definitely a red flag, and we don't want this horse on the racetrack uh, when we see that. Another part of that initial study funded by Grayson Jockey Club was to look at evolution over time. And so the advantage of that functional aspect is that we can see uh, things uh, change pretty quickly over time. And the first part was to look at horses that we had diagnosed uh, with an abnormality and then horses were laid up and we were following over time. And we can see that in some of these, uh, here, um, Parmar Condal uptake and uh, as uh, we can see, it um, resolved pretty quickly. At six weeks, this was resolved, and 12 weeks did not come back. And here, a more complex case, uh, where we can see some parma condal uptake and also some sesamoid bone uptake. And this one took longer. At the six-week scan, we still see these two lesions, and after 12 weeks, 
we can see the polymer uptake is quite improved when the sesamoid bone uh, has persisted. So that was very interesting for us as an early study to check over time. And the first question was like repeatability of findings, making sure that what we would see on what scan would not be a fluke that we would not see at another time. And so here we definitely uh, confirmed the repeatability of the findings. And so this is what I illustrated with, with this graph here. We had all these whole C scans three times. So the first scan on the left, second on the right, and third scan um, on the further right. And so the yellow one are the more severe, like the grade three, when the red are the grade one. And what we looked at is that depending on the intensity of the uptake initially, this was more likely to keep a high uptake on the follow-up scan. And the bottom line, if we're looking for resolution at 12 weeks, we see that the ones that were grade one, 71% were resolved at 12 weeks, when the ones that were grade three, only 22% were resolved after 12 weeks. So we confirm the repeatability of the findings here, and we also confirm that this value we measure as a good indication of the severity of the injury and how much time uh, this is gonna take for resolution. So this is very helpful now when we scan horses. Based on this data, we can decide uh, how long, um, how much time off uh, these horses uh, would need. So after that study, and other question that came up, we looked at these horses with resolving these findings through a layup. What happened when they go back into training? Are these things gonna come right back up? And so this was a study founded by the Dolly Green Research Foundation, Southern California Equine Foundation. And we had 12 horses coming back from layup after fetlock injury. And we scanned this at the beginning of training, one month, two months, four months, and six months. And interestingly, we had kind of a, a range of outcome with six of the 12 going back to racing successfully, four of them back to racing, but not successful, and two that did not go back to racing. And so that's very really interesting to see what, what happened with these different horses. And this is good example. So this is the original um, POD um, lesion. That horse was arrested for three months. He was back in training in June. Two months later, looks pretty clean. After six months in December, pretty clean. And this horse was back racing successfully. Um, we can let it spin here. Uh, and this is um, another example. Uh, yeah, project's much better again on the upper screen. But the, the thing here is that on this guy, we had uh, some increased uptake in the sesamoid that resolved through rest. Two months into training, things were pretty quiet. But after six months, we actually went back to where we were initially. And this horse was doing poorly and was retired uh, from racing at this stage. So showing how we can um, objectively assess uh, these findings uh, pretty well with uh, following up on these cases. Uh, this is another example that is quite interesting because this was a two-year-old initially with that sesamoid lesion that we are really worried about. And so this one got quite some time off. We gave him initially three months and decided there was still some uptake, so he got more time off until um, March when everything was cleaned, uh, went back and um, was cleaned still after one month in training here. Further follow-up down the road, we had that horse uh, back racing successfully and that sesamoid bone remained quiet uh, through additional follow-up scans. So this was a good example too that we found that quite concerning lesion initially with enough time off early on and with monitoring this lesion, this is uh, grade one uh, winning horses that has been doing like pretty well uh, with, with some good follow-up and careful monitoring. Uh, another really interesting study we completed last year uh, was looking at normal horses. All these horses I've shown you till now were horses with a known issue, but we were like, what is normal? What would a normal PET scan would look like? And so this was a very exciting study because we got to run that as a multi-center study. Uh, this was funded by Dolly Green Research Foundation for the two California sites, so Santa Anita and Golden Gate. And we had an East Coast site uh, with horses from the Fair Hill Training Center uh, being scanned at uh, New Bolton Center. And so in each of these sites, we randomly selected 24 horses. So ahead of the weekend of racing, we would select second race, horse finishing in the third position. We kept only horses in the top 50% uh, of the field. And so these guys were invited to participate in the study. 
And we got pretty good participation, about um, one in two kind of agreed to be part of the study. Uh, we had um, one of the track vet like look at the horse after the race, making sure he wasn't lame. If the horse was lame after the race, he was uh, disqualified from the study. So we had 72 horses within one week after a race, successful race defined as top 50% of the field without lameness that uh, we got to scan. Uh, we scanned all four fetlock on uh, these horses, and uh, yeah, we could do that in 15 to 30 minutes per horse. So the max we did were 11 horses in one day, so we can have pretty, pretty high throughput. And um, this is one example uh, here on the slide. So some of these horses had uh, really uh, no abnormal findings. And so that was the first observation. And what we were hoping to see is that the pet findings were less frequent and less severe in these um, horses randomly selected compared with the normal horses. And so this is back to uh, the graph I showed you earlier with this clinical horses at St. Anita. And this is for the normal population at St. Anita. What's very interesting is that the distribution is, is similar. And again, we see more uh, parmacondal and medial, more common than natural. But overall, we see uh, very few grade three. So the distribution is the same, but we don't have the most severe changes uh, than we could see in the clinical uh, population. So this is a good reference of what we can consider uh, normal and not uh, worry too much. What was interesting too was the comparison between the different track. And so there were um, you know, some comments about that like earlier in the day. And so the Golden Gate horses uh, had the fewer uh, sites of uptake. And so the Golden Gate population, Golden Gate has a tapita track, synthetic track, and we purposefully selected only horses that were training and racing on tapeta. So we excluded uh, turf horses, as there is some turf races at Golden Gate too, but we only included horses only training and racing on tapeta. Um, the horses from Santa Anita included both uh, dirt and turf horses, and we see a little bit more abnormalities, especially in the medial uh, Palma Condal, a little bit some more severe grade, but again, uh, things remain much less uh, severe than in the clinical population. The Fair Hill group, a bit more heterogeneous population here, as Fair Hill has different training track, and also compared with the California horses who are training and racing on the same track, uh, these guys go and race at different sites, and it's interesting that these horses potentially exposed to different surfaces indeed did show a bit uh, more uh, sites of uptake. So interesting to look at this comparison between the different track. Um, another like interesting finding is how much uh, real abnormal findings did we see? And we had a few, and this is one example here. So we had three out of the 72 horses, which makes about 4%, that had findings that were uh, concerning enough that they had to get a significant amount uh, of time off. This one actually uh, did get a transcondylar screw uh, for identification of um, uh, this um, uh, uptake in the prosthetical groove. Uh, so 4% of these normal horses had findings that required uh, some significant changes, including surgery in one of them. In 15 horses, there were some uptake that recommendations were made to the trainer to back off a bit on the training. Uh, so that's what we saw in that population. Another interesting uh, small project we did here, but looking at normal versus clinical horses, this is from end of 2021 at Golden Gate. Uh, at the time, they had one two-year-old that had a bilateral sesamoid fracture. It was a lightly raised horse with no clinical findings prior to that. And based on other observation with more issues recently in two-year-old, with funding from the Strona group, we decided to look at 12 horses, six that had clinical signs related to the fetlock and six randomly selected in the same races and try to see how much we would see in this two-year-old. And interestingly, uh, about half of them had some condal changes in half of the fetlock. One quarter of the fetlock had some sesamoid changes, but we made the same observation that the findings were more severe in the clinical cases than in the randomly selected cases. And two of these guys had some uh, extended uh, time off based on the findings. So a smaller scale study in a more homogeneous population 
but again, coming with the same conclusion that um, depending on what population we look at, in a normal population, we're still gonna see things, but not as severe. And so bring some idea about screening and potentially trying to, uh, whether this is like here, like clinical observation, or having all the tools that um, we'll, we'll discuss in a second to help decide uh, which horses uh, should um, get scanned. And so I wanna wrap it up on discussing where this is everything we've done and now what I think are the current indication and where this could take us. And I definitely see several um, indications for pets. The most, I would say the easiest one is um, diagnostic investigation of lameness. Um, but what's quite interesting is monitoring of healing and monitoring for recurrence. And I think there's a lot of, of benefits um, in, in this too and we'll discuss that further. Uh, I'll discuss fracture healing and obviously fracture risk assessment. So monitoring of healing has been uh, very helpful, descending how much time off uh, these horses need. And as shown in the study, the initial grade can help decide whether this is two, three, or up to five months uh, off. Monitoring of recurrence. So we did in that initial study a lot of scanning, zero, one, two, uh, four, and six months. And what we learned from that is that we don't need to scan that much. And the one time point that's the most critical is gonna be the three to four months uh, into the training, which is when the horses um, typically gain some, um, starting to get to their peak activity with longer work close to, to five furlongs, because before that it's unlikely we see some issue, but this is the time typically when injuries might recur. What's interesting too is that typically what we see at that time is the same issue that was the early issue. Um, again, further evidence that this is not stepping in a hole, this is just like these horses have some site of um, stress, of failure, that tends to be the same uh, that would come back. Uh, fracture healing prognosis, this is a, a project I didn't have time to include in today's presentation, but this is something we're doing uh, with Dr. Carpenter, with horses getting condylar fracture repair. We've been scanning them a um, couple days after repair and three months after repair. And this is an example of a case uh, three months after repair. And we can see that this one has a lateral condylar fracture and a lot ac of activity in that parma condyle and also some activity periarticular. So this guy had a pretty severe like pod lesion at the fracture site and uh, quite some degenerative periarticular uptake, so poor, poor prognosis for returning to racing in this one. And um, here's so the big one, fracture risk assessment and screening. And I think that was where it was very helpful to have all the information on, on these normal horses and know what is acceptable and what is above a certain threshold. And this is where, um, this was a question I was asked when we first brought the scanner at Santa Anita, can you tell which one is gonna break down? And at that time I was like, this is too early, and I think after having looked at a thousand fetlocks, I feel much more comfortable answering this question, especially because of what I've shown you. We have some very um, specific localization of the findings, and comparing with what we know from all the pathology observation, when we see some uptake in a site that we know is related to, to break down, this is definitely a concern, and then the severity of the uptake uh, also helps with that. So there is some potential there to do some screening, and one example prior to a big event with the example of what's been done in the Melbourne Cup with, with CT or MRI, so this is one possibility. Um, but one that I am very interested about is the more like longitudinal follow-up, and it fits pretty well with some a discussion that were had earlier with like accumulating data on, on these horses. And I think relating that to, to the trainer perspective, it is also better to present um, the pet as a tool to monitor horses and help guide them through their training and through their career. Um, it is good to protect the big event as it was mentioned before. So it is good potentially um, to put like an additional safety before to a big event, but we don't really want to see uh, all these tools um, being like, oh, something that's gonna tell the trainer the horse cannot run. And so I think when we bring the concept of longitudinal follow-up and screenings through the year and helping recognizing which horses are more at risk and how the training might be adapted, I think this is gonna be a much better way to, 
to get the technology um, adopted by the trainer and get people more likely to want to participate. Um, so based on the knowledge we currently have, um, there's no real reason to scan the horses too early in their training, um, but around four to six months in their training, uh, when they are at peak training or around the first race, I think this is a time when we'll get a good indication of what's happening in a specific fetlock. And again, having scanned some horses up to eight times, um, I think different horses are going to have different uh, weaknesses, and there are condylar horses and there are sesamoid horses. And depending on what we see in an initial uh, screening scan, we can decide on how often a horse needs to be rescanned. If it's a horse that doesn't show much, just some condyle uptake, nothing of major concern, can go six months uh, without any issue. When we see some things that are in the sesamoid, depending on the severity, it might be, okay, this is really hot in the sesamoid, this horse needs some time off now. Um, but we know that about 20% of the horses will have some changes in their sesamoid, and we're not gonna scratch like 20% of the horses if there's nothing else than the PET scan findings. Um, but this is, to me, a sign that this horse is a horse that needs to be monitored more closely, and potentially a horse that would benefit from being scanned uh, every two to three months. And one final slide here that fits pretty well with some um, discussion from this morning. It's, there's a lot of data there, and uh, I've looked at a lot of these, and I have a lot, I've gained a lot of knowledge from that, but there is also the possibility of extracting way more information through that than uh, I can, and there is also a lot of like data analysis that can be done. And so we're starting looking into developing some um, artificial intelligence tools to look at that. Um, what we've done so far is using like thresholding, using this SUV value, and so this is an example uh, of a case where we looked at um, thresholding at five levels, so below five is uh, normal for bone, and so we can see in this horse that if we threshold at five, we can measure a specific volume, and then using different threshold, 15, which is like three times background, quite high, we still got a little something, so this is a a first step of developing some of these tools with the next uh, level will be uh, teaching the computer to recognize uh, what part of the joint it is because obviously increased SUV in a condal is gonna be different from increased SUV in a sesamoid bone. But so these are some tools that will um, become available and that will help uh, categorize what we have on this PET scan. And as a radiologist, I love looking at these and I think it's still important to have human eyes looking at that, but if I could have help from a computer to like go through the scan and pull like some of this information, that would definitely help uh, in terms of data analysis, data processing, and scanning more cases. Uh, so this is it. I just have a lot of uh, acknowledgement I want to go through because uh, this has been a lot of work and this has been a real teamwork. Uh, it's been fascinating working with um, brain biosciences, long malvet imaging, I met them uh, almost eight years ago now, and they were working on the human brain, and I was like, what about we look at horses limp? And they were like, sure. <laughs> and now they definitely are uh, quite involved uh, with that, with having developed like a, a specific system. And huge thank you for all the funding that came through. Uh, Center for Equine Health at UC Davis, I was the first uh, supporter of that, and a lot of support from the Grayson Jockey Club, the Strona Group, uh, Dolly Green Research Foundation, Oak Tree Research Foundation, Pennsylvania Horse Racing Association, uh, all the technical staff uh, that has been involved in Davis, uh, at New Bolton Center, Southern California Equine, and uh, all the racetrack veterinarians and trainers that have brought uh, cases um, to support all of that. Uh, there's no time for questions here, but this is my email and Twitter if you want to reach out to me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Spriere. One of the initial recommendations at the 2006 Welfare and Safety of the Racehorse Summit was for a dedicated lab to test racetrack surfaces, and racing surfaces have remained on summit agendas ever since. For over a decade now, the industry has had a dedicated lab for surface testing, maintenance records, weather, wind, and more. The doctor joining us momentarily has been an advocate of the Racing Surfaces Testing Laboratory since its inception and will update us on the advances in this field. 
I'd like to welcome Dr. Wayne McElwraith, founding director of the Orthopedic Research Center at Colorado State University. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for the invitation. This turned out a little differently than I'd planned in that uh, um, I was going to walk through the early history of this great combination uh, combined product with project with uh, someone else changing my slides. Can I go back on these? Or? to show that picture of me. Can we go back a slide? Or is, have I got control of that? Or? Yeah, thanks. And so um, <laughs> I was going to do half the talk, and Mick Peterson was going to do the other half. He unfortunately has got laid down with COVID. And uh, so I've had to do some uh, quite a lot of slides to, to put back in that uh, are out of my comfort zone. But anyway, just this is, it's been a really good experience having to do this talk um, on my own because I can recognize everything that Mick's done. He's been the, the leader in this, uh, in the racetrack surface testing lab. Um, I got in a strange position of being vice chair of the lab and uh, I started him off in this business and he's often said to me, I don't know whether I want to thank you for getting me involved in this business or hate you. Um, and we'll, you'll have some examples of that. But anyway, just to, to set the stage with what we are talking about and why this uh, program, which has been heavily supported by the Jockey Club and other, other groups, is trying to get uh, on top of a consistency in the racetrack. So I'm gonna go through a little bit of history and then it's really been exciting for me to get mixed slides and work through them with what's happened more recently. Anyway, prevention of musculoskeletal injury in the racehorse remains, remains an ideal goal for all of us. We certainly make improvements, but we're not we haven't solved all the issues, never will, but uh, we keep trying, we keep decreasing, as Tim Parkin showed earlier this morning, we keep decreasing the incidence of problems. The severe physical demands are placed on the musculoskeletal system of thoroughbred racehorses using the high speeds reached because of the high speeds reached during racing and training. And racing surface is commonly implicated as a risk factor. And of course, as you know, we have various surfaces, we have, we have dirt, we have synthetics came along, turf, and, and various speeds with which these horses race on them. The interesting thing was is that Mick and I started doing this uh, exercise before synthetics came, and of course they became an important part of what we were looking at research-wise. So just briefly, there's multiple factors involved in musculoskeletal injury, and of course, we all know that, and we work on all these areas, or we've done work on all these areas. But the important one, of course, today that we're talking about is racetrack surface. And this is how this whole project started in 1995. Mick Peterson was a professor, a mechanical engineer at Colorado State University. He knew nothing about horses. And myself, an equine orthopedic surgeon, I knew nothing about engineering. And, but had a desire to take racetrack surface out of the musculoskeletal injury equation. Now we still haven't, <laughs> we still haven't done that, but, um, and now looking back and it's 1990, it was 1995, but I've been doing surgery at, uh, <coughs> at Equine Medical Center, which is, used to be across the road from Los Alamitos. There's other buildings got in the way since then, uh, since 1983. 
And this person on the right in the picture, Blaine Schwanevelt, is still holds the record for number of stakes wins in the Hall of Fame, a great racing quarter horse trainer. But every time I was doing surgery, uh, Blaine would wander in and talk about goddamn racetrack. And so I was sort of wondering, okay, they'd always blame the racetrack. And sometimes these trainers would eliminate or not consider the other factors that were involved. Was that horse sound, et cetera, et cetera. So when Mick came to me interested in looking at racetrack surface, uh, it was like, yes, that'd be great. We could maybe certify a racetrack. Well, that was a little bit difficult to do, but um, I've put out a timeline, or we've put out a timeline as to how we work through this. We actually, he started getting to know what we dealt with as far as the disease process goes and what musculoskeletal injury constituted. So I've got these divided up into uh, time periods and we're gonna go through each of those. Initially, uh, Mick came over to see us at the Orthopedic Research Center in the, in the Vet Teaching Hospital. Um, he was interested in the work that Chris Kalchak was doing. This was Chris Kalchak's PhD work with Bob Norden and myself, and, uh, and Sue James was also a bioengineer involved with it. And of course, this is well published, this work, but uh, basically the top two pictures are taken from uh, the Colorado uh, thoroughbred racetrack uh, injury database. We had a post-mortem program that was a lot, lot smaller than the Davis one, but we, we were necropsying all the horses that, uh, that uh, suffered muscular, catastrophic musculoskeletal injury. And that picture on the top left is the opposite fetlock to the one that had the catastrophic injury, and of course you can see the associated pathology and the right-hand picture shows the micro damage that uh, Chris defined in his PhD work. And then, of course, we, we see this all the time with, uh, as a in a clinical arena where we see change on in the radiographs and then we've got more sophisticated imaging now, but arthroscopic surgery reveals that we've got subchondral bone disease. So Mick was interested in these. These are some of the papers from uh, Chris's work because we not only showed micro damage and micro cracks, that's a crack at the top, but we showed the other progressive change with remodeling, um, exercise versus non-exercise there. We showed osteocyte uh, loss and necrosis of the bone. And he actually went and uh, looked at subchondral sclerosis and developed an acoustic microscope to look at bony sclerosis in the equine limb and published on that. Our first paper in uh, looking at uh, racetrack surface was a paper that he had two of his grad students, Raoul Reiser and Becky Woodward. Raoul uh, went away to the University of Wyoming for a while and then came back and has been a, an important part in our uh, person involved in our orthopedic research program. This paper clarified the challenges associated with modeling the ground in the horse ground interaction. And at this point, there was no reliable data available to describe the mechanical properties of racing surfaces. And this particular paper, although my name's on it, I would have had a lot of trouble defending it scientifically because it was all equations and diagrams um, on spring loading uh, of the bone. Then the next step was the development of the Arono Biomechanical Surface Tester. And that acronym came from Mick at that time, was in, uh, was in Maine at the University of Maine. He'd left CSU and this was where we kept our relationship and we started with funding from various groups in Southern California, started looking at well, first of all, develop the biomechanical surface tester. And to do that, he used his experience in mechanics and the design of acoustics and vibrations from submarines. But also we were involved with work at, the C at CSU. We did studies on high-speed treadmill, the high-speed treadmill that we had. 
uh, videos at Santa Anita of the horse, and then accelerometer, that should be accelerometer data from Dr. David Nunnemaker, um, who's already been mentioned today by Dr. Bramlage, but uh, it was very useful data to help build up a model to try and match the kinetics and the kinematics of the loaded lead forelimb, and that's where we also, our clinical experience was uh, useful there on how to load and track like a horse. And so this is some of the early uh, cinematography as well as diagrams to go with the phases of gait and the interaction with the racetrack that led to the design of the tester. <coughs> Excuse me. The first version of the biomechanical hoof tester was used in California. This picture on the right's at Santa Anita. There's a diagram in the middle on how the construction was, and this was when we first reported the development of that tester. And the important part of it was how it went into the ground at the angle or close to the angle and uh, went through the stance phase um, as a uh, horse would or a horse's hoof does. So we sort of likened it to looking at the racetrack surface from the perspective of the hoof. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so this went to, uh, once we built that machine, then it was sort of a quest for, the more cons for a more consistent racetrack. Because this paper here, which was published in 2008, it accumulated, there was a lot of data collected in Southern California that we used. Accumulation of data revealed that some tracks are more variable than others. And then uh, Mick was started testing uh, at Churchill Downs in Kentucky and looked at various racetracks and was building up a database at that stage. And the important thing here is uh, that we noticed very quickly, or he noticed very quickly, was the effect of track maintenance on mechanical properties of a dirt racetrack. <coughs> it was interesting, excuse me, <coughs> it was interesting that, uh, I don't hope I've got, got COVID, um, but uh, the first study that was reported on, on racetrack surface was out of Minnesota, Canterbury Downs, in the, early, uh, in the early years. And they showed that the location of injuries was where all the water trucks came into the track. And, um, you know, differences in quality, that's pretty obvious. But the thing that was really interesting as we accumulated data was how variable the surface was in various parts of the racetrack and between days. And that was when we initially, Mick recognized that and we started on looking at climate and day-to-day -day temperature as well as uh, water content, both being really critical factors in the track. So our approach was really, as I've said earlier, these were, these were two major statements taken from a paper that was an important, it was the first time that the veterinary community or the equine veterinary community had a presentation from Mick. This was at the American College of Veterinary Surgeons meeting in 2005, how we characterized the surface looking at the way the hoof sees it. And then there was further objective assessment of the track. The next thing that he developed was Doppler radar to look at the base. And so, we st and this became really important when the synthetic track came, came, synthetic tracks came along because they had a very specific base, or if they were put incorrectly, they did. And uh, the Doppler radar would allow us to identify any divots that might be in that base. Now, we did a number of other studies. It's, uh, I still get a bit of a chuckle that I've got a paper in Thermochemica Acta, which obviously is not a journal that uh, any of us here would read, including me, but um, we, it was an interesting use of the tester. This was a, a, well, probably the first classic use of the tester to demonstrate a problem and to solve a problem. What happened is when synthetic racetracks come to Southern California, it was a lot different than where they were developed in England. And uh, at Del Mar, you'd have a very nice track in the morning when it was cool, 
And then in the afternoon, as things warmed up and the wax melted, that uh, the times were really, really slow. And at about the time that we started doing work, now I'm using the royal we, but I did go down there and help with part of the project. Uh, Mick had a, two PhD students working on this. The, um, the uh, Pacific Classic, which is a mile and a quarter race, went off in two minutes and eight seconds, uh, which is really slow, obviously. And, uh, and it was very, it, we showed the gradation of temperature change in the racetrack, and that was the whole factor. And guess what? We could pretty much solve that problem with water. And that was the first time when deficient water uh, was really pointed out to be important in it. So at about the time that that, that paper was published, uh, the last paper on the overall uh, maintenance being important, uh, we had the second, this was the second welfare and safety of the racehorse summit. And uh, this was the brainchild of, of Dan Fick, who's pictured there following on, who was previously, before he went to the jockey club, was at AQHA. And uh, he was the one that sort of set up or led the uh, welfare and safety summit in 2008 where we had these workshops. And so recommendations were made. Um, there were seven working groups and of course, Mick and I were in the, the working group for track surfaces. And we had a primary objective to promote consistent and safe racetrack surface conditions. And then the related objectives were research. You can read them here, but well, you may not be able to read them. Uh, down from the seats, but anyway, review existing research and inform public and industry regarding other causes of musculoskeletal injury, including micro damage, changes in training method, unrecognized disease, potential role of rider. Like we weren't naive at that time in thinking that racetrack surface was the whole story. Obviously it's not, but to develop a research and development model for synthetic dirt and turf racing surfaces. <coughs> Down there we've got complete the Peterson McElwraith research project which was rather nice because they, the Grayson Jockey Club Research uh, Foundation had just funded a research project there. And so these various uh, procedures were set up. <coughs> the people, we had track surface managers, multiple people in this working group and so we were talking about shear strength and load. It was, uh, it was a great discussion. It was an important part of the day. And from this meeting, these are the various objectives, provide track superintendents the ability for readily monitoring changes in the racetrack surface material because we didn't have any science with it at that, you know, well, minimal science at that stage. You know, track surface managers uh, were very experienced. They had their own ways of doing things. Not that they were wrong, a lot of them were correct, but uh, we wanted to try and get data and put data into the equation. So we agreed to form a Welfare Safety Summit Racing Surface Committee and, uh, you know, the Grayson Jockey Club Research Foundation were involved in it and the working group at the summit basically became the Racing Surface Testing Committee that uh, was mentioned in the introduction. And we did get a Grayson Jockey Club Research Foundation grant. Johnny Mac Smith told me this morning that I better acknowledge that. So uh, there it is. But um, this was a grant that we had that helped us where we went. So, you know, this is summarizing what we identified as needed. We wanted to create a clearinghouse for surfaces data we wanted reliable and consistent testing, risk assessment data, sharing of methods. And so we'd already, Mick had already developed the, the tester, surface tester, as well as Doppler radar. Doppler radar was available and he managed, he used it for looking at the base as we mentioned before. But a sharing of method and creating a culture of data so that all racetracks, our ideal was that all racetracks be involved. And as you'll see at the end of my talk, uh, 
we've progressed pretty well with that. But we started off with two machines, some work at Santa Anita and uh, Del Mar, and then it's built up into this national scheme. And I'll come back to that in a minute. So we needed performance testing. In other words, how does the track respond to those, uh, the surfaces and the tester? And then Dr. Sue Stover at UC Davis was doing in vitro work with her hoof in the box technique that was also providing useful data for us. Composition testing, what's in that, and we've gradually built up that to a really sophisticated lab that's here in Lexington now uh, as far as looking at components that are critical to how the track behaves. And of course, there's specific ones for synthetics, there's specific ones for dirt. And then maintenance methods, and this is really important, you know, and I know that Mix presented this a lot, that it's about water and moisture content is the number one thing that can put you in too much or too little, and the variability of it is the big challenge that we deal with. But the idea was to create a culture of data, which is now looking a long way down the road, we have accomplished. Consistent track composition, consistent test methods for new materials, new methods when needed, database of results for research, and particularly being open to all users. We weren't interested in creating a pattern. We were certainly getting funding from various sources, including charging for these services once the testing lab started, but it's always, it was a little hand to mouth for a long time. Uh, but we had good support from the racetracks, uh, considerable support from the participating racetracks at the time, as well as, as I said, AQHA, Jockey Club, and then uh, the Southern California Equine Foundation, the Dolly Green Foundation, these all became involved and would help us. But this was the goal, a single reliable lab for the industry. So this was the first lab the Laboratory for Analysis of Track Materials. It was basically uh, Mick Peterson's garage in, uh, in Maine. And, uh, but, and this is, and had good equipment inside and we started off with some fairly basic uh, modalities that were being tested and then it built up. And then of course linking the characteristics of the track to an injury database, correlating it and, and then also the next phase was developing tests for synthetic track materials with the wax uh, being a critical component that had to be analyzed. And so this has led to some pretty sophisticated techniques that have been used. Different tracks, maintenance matters, different tracks do things differently. And there's reasons for that, the weather's different, the design of the track, you know, it's not like you can go and change the design of the track without a lot of expense and a lot of trouble. How they're used, I think one of the challenges we have in America that uh, we don't have so much in other, other countries is that horses tend to go to the racetrack and train over the racetrack every day, the same track that they're racing during that meet, and that's a challenge for maintenance and to develop the best practices for maintenance methods. But your maintenance, the idea is that it would be based on data, on the characteristics from testing, as well as the physical characteristics and the weather conditions. So I'm gonna fast forward to 2021. This is the, uh, the team that, that Mick has in, uh, in Lexington. Um, and of course, there's a big boost to the, the lab there and the equipment, uh, thank you, thanks to a, uh, a grant of 750,000 from the, uh, well, a contribution of 750,000 from the Jockey Club, which has been enabled us to go out and uh, have four sets of equipment. Initially, we had the hoof tester uh, in California, obviously it's not easy to ship. Mick was driving, driving it across country himself. And now we have four units thanks to the, the Jockey Club's contribution. And 
I'm just going to go through these are mixed slides that I've uh, used and tried to understand properly for you. Uh, he, he coined the term maintenance quality system, and this is an update on the maintenance quality system, which is the aggregate result from the testing lab and from the testing at the, uh, at the tracks, and retrospective data as well. So there's three stages of MQS in this concept. There's documentation, pre-meet inspection. Now, pre-meet inspection is going and doing testing at the racetrack before the meet starts. And then once you're out there doing the testing before the meet starts, it's follow-up daily monitoring. And this is obviously um, time-consuming, equipment-consuming, but this is what we've, that Mix managed to lead the program to. Regulations defined by the best practices MQS and now the Heiser Surfaces regulations, and I'll come back to that shortly, are an important part of it. Testing's based on standard methods. We talked about some of those briefly. Then a database, and then turf research has started, and you know, we need to still get, we, we're still not there as far as the, da the quality of turf uh, testing, but we've come a long way, whereas before it was pretty much ignored for a long, uh, quite a lot in the program, just because we were limited with what tools we could use. And of course, as we know, turf racing is becoming increasingly, uh, an increasingly high percentage in this country and so it's, it's really useful. And, um, and again, turf is very dependent on moisture as well. So this was a slide that Mick made for 2020. Um, uh, the, sh the places on the left are full participation uh, in the program. These tracks are also uh, NTRA certified and uh, more recently, Colonial Downs and Woodbine and Charlestown have, have, have come on board. The, the jockey club uh, equipment is critical to support the growth. In other words, the equipment funded by the jockey club has been really critical to this. So phase one was design documentation and setup. So a racetrack's gonna come into the program, they say we want to be part of it, we want to be completely part of it, and uh, so the track gets documented, the testing, as you can see lower down on the diagram, attention to maintenance, uniform equipment for maintenance, and then equally important are the new weather station design at five tracks, and this has been tested at five tracks, and. These are very sophisticated. They're going to give you daily monitoring. And again, that's ideal to change of track. There's a lot of standards being created in sports arenas, uh, sports programs like this. But as you know, the, the equine situation in the racetrack is, is unique. Um, but, uh, and these, and of course, we do suffer from big swings in, in, in weather. And like the the the, uh, the cluster of fatal injuries in uh, Santa Anita in 2019 that was mentioned earlier today by Dr. Benson and is uh, it's just a good example of the limited control you have when you've got very abnormal rain rain levels coming in. Track geometry. This is an interesting slide in that. It's looking at the education. Early on in the program, uh, Mick attended and spoke frequently at racetrack superintendent days. They, these events were once a year, and he was there educating. This is sort of a, an increased level of education in that they're training racetrack personnel to manipulation uh, to, with laser, in other words, demonstrate proficiency with laser measurements related to the grader and what your levels are and where you put the grader. So he's called them a grader school. And uh, at a recent one in Kentucky, six students 
or their, their workers at the racetrack or people involved in racetrack superintendent, uh, six students all demonstrated proficiency in this. So it's adapting the scientific techniques into uh, practical management. Phase two uh, is that, as I mentioned before, is at the race meet, you come out and do a, do a thorough testing before the race meet starts. And so this is it where we've got not only the testing equipment down on the left-hand side, the, the hoof tester, uh, the Arono hoof tester, as well as Doppler radar evaluation for the track. And so this just brings up, emphasizes the jockey club gift, uh, which consolidated organizations, updated equipment, and so that we have four complete uh, vehicles equipped for the testing uh, now available. At the moment, uh, there's one in California, and there's two in Lexington, and one in Maryland, and these will be you know, won't have to travel across the whole country for them. The NTRA have also gave a, uh, a really good gift to the University of Kentucky for research space and calibration of equipment, all part of the, of the hoof testing laboratory. And of course, Mick moved from Maine to, uh, to Lexington quite some time ago um, and is part of the faculty there. New equipment usage, this is just some data on site testing, for instance, at Breeders' Cup last year, 10 days, fairgrounds. Uh, this is 21 data, Oaklawn Park, Pennsylvania, Laurel, and uh, locations available for both East and West Coast equipment. And uh, so in January here, there was machine calibration and load cell calibration. So the support has been really critical and, um, and with being able to transport that testing capability to the track. So this just is another, is a diagram looking at the equipment usage. It's not a diagram, but a, a summary of it. And, uh, and then phase three is the daily tracking and the measurements. And so these are just pictures taken out with uh, daily tracking um, and then on the right hand bottom slide is sort of use of testing, uh, the testing equipment that they're currently using for turf. And so we are, as I said before, um, the program is expanding its abilities in turf. So last but not least, how does this relate to Heiser? And these are slides that uh, Mick uh, gave me. Uh, What's been really good here is that Dr. Sue Stover, who's chair of the safety committee um, with the Heiser, uh, with Heiser has been proactive in fitting the standards and what we're doing, uh, what we have been doing into Heiser protocols. So basically, before this was a draft, but Mick told me today that this is now in effect. Um, everybody settled on the current version of surfaces regulations. Racetrack shall have data collection protocols in place. SOP reviewed annually and um, a practices document and all racetrack have designs, records, tests and daily data collection. And these are just some more details that Mick gave me on the surface test methods and surface material test methods. They must be documented and consistent with testing standards, and I'll talk about those in a minute, from internationally recognized standard, standards organizations. ASTM International, and we've been involved with, but for the more agricultural-oriented tests and standards, the American Society of Agriculture and Biological Engineers I found out from Mick of being more cooperative and interested. And, uh, and when possible, unpublished standards methods consist, are consistent, but these are documented by the Racing Services Testing Laboratory. I'll show you a list of the ones where we've got approved standards uh, shortly, but in the meantime, uh, there's a lot of consistency, there's a lot of knowledge and experience being developed in the 
in the testing laboratory. So pre-meat inspection, in other words, we've talked about this before and daily measurements, it's gonna be the same with Heiser as far as uh, the racetrack conforming to that pre-race and pre-meat inspection and then daily measurements during the meet. And I think what's really critical is, uh, you know, material testing regularly for composition, weather conditions being monitored at very close intervals, and moisture content is critical. There's still further things to do. Um, <coughs> there's quite a bit of work going into the development of sensor-based moisture measurements so that the ideal will get there hopefully get there is uh, monitoring moisture real time and then putting the appropriate amount of, of water into the track. So these are the standards, ASTM uh, standards for equestrian surfaces that have been approved um, and you can read them here but you'll notice that some, a lot of these have risen out of our research. Um, again, Mix leading the research uh, functional properties of equine surfaces, uh, wax binder removal from synthetic tracks, how easily it is removed, triaxial shear strength and cohesion of equine sports surfaces, standard test method for gas chromatography analysis of petroleum waxes used in equestrian synthetic surfaces, and standard test methods for measurements of transition temperatures, which I mentioned before. Uh, which we showed at Delmar rather graphically how much uh, melting of the wax changed the, the, the ability of the track to support the hoof. And uh, also part of it that's, that's also really um, important is the differences between the different products as well. And this is spun over into non-racing equestrian surfaces and um, I think is gonna be <coughs> a continued part of uh, usefulness and we're leading. Uh, Mick and uh, um, with some colleagues in Scandinavia, we did write a white paper. Um, my role was very minor, I have to confess, but uh, had a white paper on maintenance of surfaces some years ago and I think It'd be really good to update that, but I think that's coming with all of these proposed standards. These are proposed standards on equestrian surfaces that I think are going to be more and more important as we try and have uniformity uh, throughout the country under the Heiser mentality. So the next step on standards is the American Society of Agricultural and Bio Biosystems engineering for methods that, this is for the penetrometer, for turf and dirt, cushion depth, as well as documenting um, the equipment used. And, uh, and we'll probably, we'll focus on ASTM on materials testing, but have to default to RSTL when we haven't got things standardized. So now, I didn't, I mentioned, we've talked about the importance of data and working with the Jockey Club have been working on a new data system and this is just one slide of the new database uh, interface that's going to be available as I understand it uh, soon. So finishing up, you know, obviously safety is part of a bigger story. Um, you've mentioned the fact of data, the equine injury database of course as uh, Dr. Parkin has championed for quite some time, uh, is critical to relate that back to the machines. You can see that there's a number of components to building up that database, and particularly a number of, of components that are critical for consistency of surface. Not just the equipment or the machines that, uh, that are used at the racetrack, the materials themselves, and Mother Nature has seemed to become more and more important or more and more, un, more and more unpredictable. Manpower, the methods, and the jockey injury database is also critical. Safety in horses or decreased musculoskeletal injury in horses is certainly correlated with safety for jockeys as well. 
So surfaces are one factor in the risk to the horse, but the risk to the horse, as we said, is, is a risk to the rider. And so I think this is an important part of, uh, of getting more data and uh, making the tracks as consistent as we can. I think these groups have been critical. It's been a real team effort. It's been a huge team effort uh, led by Mick, as I alluded to before. There's been a lot of doing it on a shoestring in the early phases, and it's paid off now the investment from other support, particularly the support of the Jockey Club, is really allowing this whole dream to, to come to fruition. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. McElwraith. We are now going to take another 20 minute break and we'll come back together for our final two sessions of the day. Red, good boy. Hey, Red. Did you go for a ride, buddy? Huh? I'm gonna miss you, Red. Jockey Club Research Foundation provides the best equine research to treat the horses we love.
Uh, well, welcome back. Uh, we're really looking forward to the next panel. Uh, it's a panel that I actually uh, wanted to do uh, to get a different perspective on welfare and safety issues. Uh, we tend to hear a lot from the same people, uh, and that's not a problem because that's their area of expertise, but we do have a growing generation coming into the game, uh, into the sport, uh, and taking care of the animals we love. So in addition to her keep work, Anise is also the president of Amplify. And Amplify Horse Racing is a 501c3 nonprofit promoting education and careers in the thoroughbred industry to youth and young adults. They have a mentorship program. They host in-person and virtual educational events, including equine careers tour series with the Keep Foundation a children's equine education program, a podcast, a monthly virt virtual live stream, behind the scenes educational tours and engagement, and so much more from Amplify. Uh, it looks like they do a little bit of anything, and I'll say this is a very ambitious, uh, ambitious group of young professionals. I'm really looking forward to what they have to say. Uh, they're gonna lead our generation in the future, so uh, it's good to get the shapes and ideas of what they're thinking. So with that, I'll turn it over to Denise and the Amplify group. Thank you so much, Jamie, and uh, thank you to everyone for giving us this opportunity today to lend this perspective on what youth and young adults who are coming into the industry are thinking about welfare and safety of the racehorse. And so just kind of reiterating what Jamie had mentioned, uh, Amplify seeks to promote education and careers in the industry, but we, at the core of what we do, we want to educate. And a lot of the questions that we receive at or through our virtual events or in-person programming really center around the topics that we're talking about today, which is welfare and safety of the racehorse. And so we wanna be able to address those concerns of young people and give them the confidence that this industry is maintaining healthy, safe horses. Um, and then at the same time, through this presentation, we hope to deliver to the industry some perspective on what those young people coming in, the questions that they do have, and our advice on how to address that. So in introducing our panelists, I just have to reinforce and say that I'm so proud to have this amazing group here today. And because not only are they current leaders, we have future leaders, and I think that they all have such amazing insight to be able to lend the industry through their internship experiences and jobs and the careers that they've built for themselves so far, but also through their engagement with peers, because I think that that uh, does a lot to help inform us and inform our decisions and in the way that we proceed with uh, improving perceptions of the industry going forward. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Ms. Haley Amos, who is Manager of Communications and Social Media for the Breeders' Cup, Hallie Hardy on the end, Executive Director of Horse Country, Farron Peterson, jockey and veterinarian. She actually rode a race at Churchill today and <laughs> got here for this panel, so uh, five stars for the hustle. Uh, we have Eric Resendez, who is a student at BCTC Equine and former Amplify Horse Racing mentee and Deja Robinson, pre-vet student and Ed Brown scholar. So I want to start, you all have such unique experiences that you bring to the table through your positions and your studies. So I really wanna start with sharing some anecdotal evidence on either questions or concerns that you have all had presented to you or you know, um, engagement with your peers that has kind of stood out to you. And Haley, I'm gonna start with you because social media is really at the forefront of everyone's minds right now when it comes to information sharing. And also that is a place where many young people express concerns or they advocate on behalf of something or they air grievances. 
So I'd love to hear from you, what are some of the most common questions and concerns that you've had to address through social media about the industry? Yeah, so um, oftentimes, in particular for the Breeders' Cup, um, a lot of questions we receive are questions regarding what sort of safety and procedure precautions we take um, in advance of the Breeders' Cup races. And that's always a fun question because Breeders' Cup's number one priority is the safety of the thoroughbred athlete. And so uh, leading up to the Breeders' Cup, we do multiple rounds of out-of-competition testing. And we, um, prior to that, we also do a blood test work prior to the final race of the Breeders' Cup. And then once the race takes place, then we'll test all four of the horses that finish in the top four. Um, additionally, we have equine safety that people might not be aware of and that uh, takes place 24, uh, 24 hour surveillance watch on Tuesdays prior to the Breeders' Cup. So all of these things that we do um, are, are things that maybe not everyone gets to understand. And social media is a great resource because you're able to interact and share that information with people. Uh, we've got a team on our so social media that we're out there two weeks prior to the Breeders' Cup and we are sharing everything that takes place. Um, and I think transparency and authenticity is really important on social. So ensuring that people are aware of all of the different things that go into uh, preparation for something and to get that horse in the starting gate. Farron, you had a very unique and busy vet school experience and that that's when you were starting to get involved in the thoroughbred industry initially, uh, exercise riding and then becoming a jockey. So what were some of the reactions from your fellow students as you got involved in the industry and how did you address that? Yeah, so I was a veterinary student at UC Davis and halfway through I started riding races and I think it was helpful that I had two years to just work with my colleagues and they could see my dedication to veterinary medicine and every school break I would be off traveling, doing thoroughbred internships and all of a sudden they see now I'm riding races and I had several different colleagues uh, approach me on my own time and just say, how is it that you feel okay with you know, riding racehorses? Isn't that harmful to the animals? And isn't that against your ethics? So to be able to have those personal relationships and that they have the comfort and respect for me to be able to have those conversations. And once I spoke with them, I could tell that it really turned them around. And you know, a lot of them are vegan and you know in vet school you're going to get kind of the full spectrum and people who just really really care about animals and have changed their whole lifestyle for them and the perception of horse racing especially out in california where i was is not that well perceived so i think it was really helpful that i had that established relationship with those people and that they could come and talk to me because it still happens all the time, not so much in Lexington, that people will meet me and go, I've never met a jockey before. So it's a really unique opportunity to have those conversations with people. Yeah, certainly having uh, a conversation can go a lot way or a long ways in developing understanding between two people who might not have had that understanding before. And Deja, I, I understand that vet school is your aspiration, that you would love to work as a vet in the thoroughbred industry. And I actually don't know a lot about your story of how you were introduced to the thoroughbred industry. So if you'd share a bit about that and did you have any of your own concerns as you were first getting involved in horse racing? Yes, so being from Georgia and also coming from primarily a sport horse background, I knew little to nothing about racing. I would hear about it, but I really wasn't exposed to it until I transferred to the University of Kentucky. Um, in 2019, I was able to come out and actually see what the racetrack was like. So I had many questions. Um, the first question was, how in the world do they monitor all of these horses? Um, and I didn't really know what a regulatory vet did. I had more of an understanding of like a private or what would be like an attendant vet did, but I had no idea about the regulatory side um, until I did some of my internships with the KHRC and the Stronic Group. Um, so that was my first question. And then secondly, I knew that racing was um, a global industry. So I was curious to know if these rules and protocols applied across the states and then in different countries. I was very shocked when I found out that it didn't initially. Um, 
And then um, another question that I had, so I knew vets were responsible for the care of horses, but I saw that there were so many opportunities and avenues in the industry. So I was curious to know um, the role that other positions, such as the trainers, owners, jockeys, stewards, track masons had um, in relation to equine welfare and safety. And I grew to learn that it all relates and that everybody's responsible for ensuring that these horses are taken care of. Um, and then lastly, my, uh, a main question that I had, I guess being Gen Z, and interested in technology and just seeing um, how it's kind of revolutionized a lot of other industries, what technology was being used to help with equine welfare and safety and then the potential that that had for the future. So those are some of my main questions coming into the industry. You know, it's really interesting. I'm gonna um, ask Eric momentarily to talk about being a Keeneland College ambassador, but Amplify the last couple of years has given these mini paddock tours during Keeneland College Scholarship Day. And it was really interesting how many questions we actually got from college students just about regulation of the industry and that a lot didn't even realize that, you know, to be on the backside of the racetrack, to work on the racetrack and be around these horses, that you have to be licensed. So sometimes it's even really basic things like that that can give young people a lot of confidence in, in the industry and the regulations that we have. And Eric, you, you've been in a very unique situation as a ambassador in that you know, you're kind of representing the sport, representing Keeneland as a college ambassador. And you know, during college scholarship days, that, which are very well attended with many students that might not have ever been to the racetrack before, uh, you're kind of charged with a unique task in that you have to engage with those students who might not have ever you know, been to a horse race in their life. So how did you navigate you know, engaging some of these students? And then did you find that some of your own um, studies and internships and mentorship in the industry helped to guide that? Yeah, so pers <clears throat> perspective, like all the things that I've done has given me have given me different perspectives. So I think sharing that with people or students that haven't, that aren't really knowledgeable in the in this industry is being able to explain kind of what the process is to get a horse to the track and kind of what their daily routine entails and as well as including like the management aspect of what a farm does and how they even might even process to get to the sale and. I think it's very interesting watching all of the reactions when you explain to them like all of the all of the steps that a horse takes just to get to the track and just to train. Especially they're all, they're always so shocked to to explain that they never think it's going to be as uh, complicated, I guess, as it might seem. It might seem as it's just you buy a horse and you train it to race, but it, in some cases it's you buy a horse and you have to you know send it to the sales and then that someone else buys it and then. It's, it's a whole process, so just explaining that to people that aren't familiar with this industry has been very, very in, in, interesting, to say the least. Yeah. You mentioned to me before that you got um, questions about equipment, that you find that that sometimes comes into play. Can you talk a little bit about that, like some of the basic questions on things that might seem very obvious to us um, as being involved in racing, understanding what the horses are wearing and the purpose that it might serve, but um, I think you mentioned like uh, a martingale or something when we were talking about this previously. Yeah, so especially in the mornings when horses have sometimes I get questions of why is the sat why are the saddles different? Why usually it's tack related or why does this horse have bandages and that one doesn't? It's just explaining um, what certain bandages uh, support for which different reasons, and I think. It's just being able to explain it in a, in a way that someone can understand it without feeling belittled, especially because sometimes it's so basic, someone explaining it might be like, oh, how do you not know this? But I think it's being able to stay, keep an open mind and, and just know that not everyone, like, is everyone just wanting to learn? So I think it's just uh, filling that curiosity with, with answers that keep them more interested in the industry. So I'm, I'm gonna present the next couple questions to all of you guys, actually, and I'm gonna start with you, Hallie. If you all had to summarize why is 
welfare and safety at the front of mind for young people who are getting involved in the industry? And then why is it important for the industry to understand and address those concerns? Yeah, well, it's a big, big old question to be asking, isn't it? I mean, I think most of us here today, um, we're fortunate uh, to, I would primarily say, engage with horses at some point in our youth, right? That's why we were passionate about following a, a career in this, in this uh, industry. And it's important, I think, to each one of us that welfare and safety is, is considered when it comes to the equine athletes that are in our care and that participate in our industry and, and jockeys and, and the human athletes as well. Um, so if you know it's important to you, you have to imagine it's important to young people and it is, is something that we um, should proactively be addressing. You know, I, I can very much identify with, with Eric there that a lot of our horse country guests, you know, don't necessarily walk in on a tour and have this deep negative perception of horse racing. They actually know very little, <laughs> which can be just as negative as having a, a, a poor perception of racing. So to be able to proactively engage and show how we care for these animals goes such uh, an incredibly far away, a um, long, long way. And so I think, you know, if, again, if you can imagine yourself caring about why a horse breaks down on the racetrack and how we handle that and how we try to prevent that, then we should be sharing that information and, and information from events like this um, with the younger generations as well so they know and be proactive in how we share that, that information. And for anyone who's not familiar with Horse Country, it's a really impactful tourism initiative that's based here uh, in central Kentucky that welcomes people onto the farms and brings them on this in-depth educational tour. So just getting into that perception piece a little bit more, which you already kind of touched on, you know, what are the most common perceptions that people bring in or questions and, and comments on their tours? about their experience and, and you know maybe that was their first interaction ever with the thoroughbred industry. Yeah, so it's actually um, quite surprising and it's changed over horse country's history if we've, as we've more regularly given tours. Um, you know, back when we started, it was your real diehard fans that were coming out to you know, see their favorite racehorses that had now retired and were stallions or broodmares. And they are you know, one of our greatest assets. They're out there on social media defending us constantly. But what we found, we do actually, um, as part of your checking out to book your tour, we do ask questions. And one of the questions is, how often do you interact in an equine-related activity? And I think it's close to 70% either answer never or occasionally. Um, so the majority of people are coming through, like Eric mentioned, on College Scholarship Day, and they, they know very, very little. Um, so it's not necessarily that they have these tough questions that they're asking. And I should qualify as well. Our, our target demographics are not necessarily young people, but we do get lots of kids and families through. Um, we hosted a number of FF, FFA groups, both recently for their state convention that was here in Lexington. Their national convention is in Louisville here soon. A lot of those groups come through. Um, so we do, I mean, honestly, a lot of times those students do have perceptions and have very hard questions to ask. Um, so our farms being able to um, not only just say this is what we do, but directly show it and let the students and young people and our other, our guests, um, interact with it. And we're lucky to have um, several aftercare uh, uh, members, so New Vocations, the Secretariat Center, the Equine Adoption Center, as well as our two vet clinics here offer tours. So to be able to really show that whole life cycle from day one to, to day end of, of how we take care of our horses. And again, it's just this proactive thing. We're answering questions before a guest even knows to ask them. Um, and I can speak from my experience. When I was in college, I gave tours when I was at Windstar Farm. It is so impactful. I mean, to have somebody, you know, hear somebody say, oh, I didn't realize you took care of them like this, or I didn't realize that things like the Retired Racehorse Project uh, and, you know, the Thoroughbred Makeover happen. It, you know, for me as a young person, it makes me very proud to be part of this industry when we can speak to initiatives like those. So going back to that summary question, Haley, I'll have you address it. You know, why, why do you think that welfare and safety is at the front of mind for so many young people coming into the industry? So yeah, I think, you know, um, social media is a great tool to share that information with them. Um, oftentimes, as, as someone that operates an account like the Breeders' Cup, you're going to get a wide spectrum of questions, in particular um, on Twitter. That's a really good conversational piece. So it's really important to use that opportunity and that space to educate people. Um, obviously, you're entertaining too, but social media is a tool that 
you can do both in. And you can reach wide audiences that may not otherwise get in front of a horse. Um, whether it's geographically or other constraints, there are plenty of people that we've connected with that are so far from a racetrack they've never even seen one. But to be able to share the information about horses, which they clearly are passionate about, and to share that we are taking the best care of those animals in our athletes is very vital to our audiences. Farron? So for me, it's the way that the culture is developing. You can take, for example, the food animal industry and people who consume animal products are now asking, how are those animals raised? Were they given antibiotics or hormones? Um, so it's just something that people have started caring about more recently. And so I think that transfers over to all animals. And it's great that people are caring more about animals and welfare. So I think it's our challenge to figure out they are top athletes training at a high level. They need to be cared for and treated. We need to meet their needs. But how can we also keep our public happy and engaged? Because we want young people being involved. And I'm involved in horse racing. I love horses. And I think they receive great care. So how can we portray that to people who are seeing the other side that the media portrays? But that's the kind of questions people are starting to ask. And so they want answers from us. And Eric and Deja, I think you guys, as students, probably have the best insight into this as you're still having a lot of these conversations with your peers or maybe you know, getting more questions that um, Farron, Haley, and Hallie would being out of school. So Eric, what are, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so um, it's kind of hard to I'm still learning a lot, so there are some certain things that I don't, don't really know, but I think it's just where the sport, I feel like, is becoming more mainstream. People are starting to, people that might not know a lot about racing are starting to identify perhaps more with certain horses that win big races. For example, Rich Strike, like he won the Derby. A lot of people fell in love with that story. So I think the more popular this sport becomes, the more we have to, be, we have to take care of these animals that, you know, give their give their all for the races and I think it's just important to treat those treat those horses and inform the people that perhaps might be a little bit skeptical about what type of treatments they get or medicine or why certain horses get specific things and I think it's just important that the public is aware of why people do certain things to take care of the horses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that brings up a, a great point. We Amplified launched its mentorship program in 2021, um, which essentially pairs young people who want to work in the industry with industry professionals. Eric was one of our initial mentees, but many of those who applied had actually uh, watched racing on TV during the pandemic. And that was how they initially got into racing. So that's a, a very good point on something to be conscious of as it gets in front of more eyes you know, to have an awareness of how we can address the questions that will be coming at us. Deja? Yes, and I would have to agree, um, especially um, in a sense of just kind of the cultural influence and impact and also the use of social media, especially just during COVID um, and how people have just been on social media more um, and able to see kind of what racing is and all that it has to offer. Um, I don't want to repeat too much of what was said, but I think it's really important um, to consider how much of a tool social media can be um, to really just push how important welfare is and to show that even those who may be skeptical about racing that, um, just to show them the many initiatives that are being taken to show that the horse is first, although it's an exciting sport, they're beautiful athletes, that the horse is first on the track, off the track, and then even after their career as race horses. Um, so I think that that's why it's, it's on the forefront now. And even just for those who may be familiar, um, just of course with HISA coming, that's also gonna put um, a huge, huge emphasis on um, just uniformity within welfare and safety. And I think that'll really help with the sustainability of the sport because people who may not know are seeing all these initiatives that are being taken. They're able to see what was being done maybe what didn't work, what did work, what's being done now, and then um, what could be done in the future. So I think that'll really help with um, getting a new demographic into racing as well. 
So then, Hallie? I was just going to kind of connect all of those things really quickly and tell me if we're running out of time. I love to talk, so we can, I can always shut up. We're, whenever we're I actually doing very good on time, which is why I threw that curveball and yeah. I asked you guys all that yeah. question that I said I was going to ask a couple well, of Well, I mean, I just think Farron's point about, um, you know, recognizing the, f the food industry and how they're having to answer certain questions. And you think, you know, even with my generation, but, you know, going more and more so, you know, kids are farther and farther away from interacting with, with livestock, whether it's horses or whether it's, you know, any, any type of farm work or working with livestock on farms. Um, so a lot of those questions become more and more elevated over time. Um, with this younger generation, I, I know from some experience at even Locust Trace here in Lexington, which is a, an agri-science school, they have students who show up who don't know anything about mm -hmm. the horses that they're going to be working with. But I think, to your point as well, that's where social media becomes such an important asset. Um, and I think, talking what you said, one of my favorite words is edutainment. We're educating in an entertaining way. And to make sure that across the board, you know, um, whether it's Breeders' Cup or it's the Jockey Club or America's Best Racing or Horse Country or Kingland, that we're doing a good job of really, of edutaining, of, of having engaging educational content out there. And I do know from my experience on giving tours um, that people eat that up. Um, and then in line with that as well, we have, you know, detractors from our industry who are incredibly engaged on social media. Um, so we have to combat that. We have to be just as active um, as they are. Otherwise, we'll get lost in translation. So then kind of going from the, you know, why is it important to young people to converting that into action? I would love everyone who's watching today to actually have some action points that they can take away from this conversation and how we can continue to address this and educate and proactively engage with people on this topic. So um, Haley, I'll, I'll start with you. What would you say are some specific targeted ways that the industry can engage with young people and continue to, to educate and address any concerns that they might have? Well, we're just gonna go back to the, the exact same thing I've been saying all along, which is social media. Um, one of the things, and I keep going back to Twitter because I think Twitter is a really unique platform that the horse racing industry in particular takes advantage of. You get that immediate reaction, you get, you get to hear immediately the results of the race, you get to hear a lot of instant uh, statements of what happened after the race from trainers, and whereas if you were reading an article, it might be a little uh, postponed. So that being said, Twitter is a great tool, but it's also you also have to approach it as the yin and the yang. It's got the good and the bad. So making sure that you are on top of the conversation, that you respond to situations that take place in a timely manner and authentically. No one wants to hear a robotic response. People know that it's a person behind those pages, whether it's a brand or a, a persona, and they want a response that shows empathy and connects with them. So making sure that you are consistently transparent and authentic to, throughout that is very important. I think that brings up a great point because I feel like there can be a bit of temptation there when there are maybe negative comments or comments that kind of dig in a negative way to just delete them from your posts. And I think that you brought up a, that's a great point to take that as an opportunity for further engagement and education because you might not be able to change that person's mind, but somebody else reading through that feed might be able to say, okay, I understand this other perspective or this you know, horse racing account has addressed this concern of this person. So that's a great point. Eric, I'll throw it to you. Ooh, okay, so, um, yeah, so as kind of like a student perspective, I think a very good, uh, something that perhaps the industry I saw that was a little bit lacking is promoting or I guess supporting uh, organizations that promote the industry within the youth. I think I was very lucky to find Amplify Horse Racing and make that connection because networking is also very important in this industry and it's also like, you, you can work as hard as you want, but you might have to know someone important to get to know, to, to keep moving up the ladder. So I think just opening the doors more to allow everyone to network that is interested within this industry, to allow them to network with people that, that have hold positions that they find interesting or that they, they would like to, to work in in the future and in supporting 
like schools that want to further educate the, the younger generation in this industry. Like for example, I go, I'm a current student at BCTC Quine. I've learned like a lot of stuff. I, I've done the mentorship thing. I've, I've learned more about different aspects. I think it's, it's di very important because it provides different perspectives and it, it's given me like perspectives. Even for example, the Keeneland ambassadorship has given me the opportunity to see what it's like uh, to be a racing secretary, how he goes about writing on uh, all of the, the condition book and, and that's been very interesting. Mm -hmm. And I think just being able to support, the, in, the industry being able to support those programs as a whole to anyone that's interested, whether that be networking or education, I think that's, that's very important. That's a great point. Just an overall promotion of our programs and making sure that young people know that there are opportunities to take the next step and get more involved. Farron? I think there's a lot of importance in personal conversations. When I rode the Del Mar meet in 2019, it was when the media was hitting horse racing especially hard, and they would have protesters out front more than usual leading to the entrance to Del Mar, and so the people who were coming to attend the races had to read all these disturbing signs. So the horsemen worked together, and we stood on the other side and wrote signs uh, with phrases about you know, the research that we're able to fund and the jobs that we offer um, you know, and support families. So I would go to those um, and then I would sneak over to the other side and just start talking with the people and just approach them respectfully and try to find out where they were coming from. And it was really interesting to see because um, some of them really believed horses shouldn't be in pastures, they shouldn't be on lead ropes, dogs shouldn't be on leashes, and fair enough if that's the way that they feel. But it helped me to see people are on a spectrum, and my mission isn't to change those people's minds, but the people in the middle of the spectrum who just want to know that horses are being cared for and treated well, and all they're getting is the information from the media, and like most of us can attest to, we get a lot of our news from the media, and we don't go and look it up ourselves, and especially if they're not a horse racing enthusiast. And so they're going to believe what's in front of them and you know what's pushed in front of them. Um, so to be able to reach out to them and to have those conversations. So even those people who were on the extremist side, as I started having conversations and telling them I'm riding the Del Mar meet, I'm also practicing veterinary medicine, I would actually see their body language change and be at ease and they'd start to put their signs down and one person picked the sign back up and it was upside down. They didn't even notice and it was great. But I just think that there's a lot of importance that as people get to know you and they watch, like, can you walk the talk? And just to, um, you know, get to know someone who's involved in horse racing. I mean, even just to add to that point, you mentioned data at some point in there and like this event in and of itself provides us so many amazing points and pieces of data and tangible research that can be shared with people. Mm -hmm. And that is something really concrete to show someone that shows that we care. Deja? You have a question for me, so I want to make sure I answer it. Uh, um, so just in talking about like tangible, specific uh, ways that the industry can start to address concerns of young people and continue to educate. I think it's just going back to kind of as we stated with being transparent and not being on the defense of people who don't understand, um, like not just being angry, but just taking that time to say, okay, this is what actually goes on. Because a lot of people in the industry have been raised in the industry, they just kind of know it in and out. But for a newcomer, it can be very overwhelming. You feel like you don't know anything and there's just so much to learn, which is also the exciting part of it because of the different people that you meet from different backgrounds of life that are all connected through their passion for horses. So I think just um, kind of moving with times and we, what we've been talking about with change being okay with understanding that that comes along with that. Um, so just really being willing to use different avenues and be intentional about um, targeting people so they can have that exposure, whether it's through just having tours or if it's somebody who's interested, like me being a vet, um, different organizations showing what a vet does or even just what a track, at a track, what the racing secretary does, what the stewards do, just really showing all the opportunities that are there and being transparent about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Absolutely. Hallie? This is my favorite question, because <laughs> I get to shamelessly plug horse country. <laughs> No, I mean, in all sincerity, what is, uh, I mean, everything that we've kind of talked about here takes time and takes dollars, right? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of our, our organizations, and especially those at the top, have been spread really thin in terms of what they can cover, right? But now we have horse country. We have Amplify. I mean, everything that we've talked about here today, Amplify is doing, and they're not recreating the wheel. Anise is trying to find, you know, resources that exist, and literally, you'll love this, amplify them and make sure people know about them and young people can connect to those resources that exist. You think of America's Best Racing, you know, one of the jockey club's initiatives, they're out there. And so I think for those um, here and tuning in today is to make sure that within your organizations, you're uh, promoting some of these things that already exist. Maybe your organization can't tackle the perception of thoroughbred racing. I mean, that's a big, it's a big thing, isn't it? Um, but if you can promote horse country, whether um, you want to organize some tours for your um, your employees, or you have some family friends that are coming into town that might have s certain perceptions, that is what we're we're here for. Um, and both between Amplify and and what Anise has done um, with the mentorship program, and really trying to directly connect with young people. Um, and with Horse Country, we have you know, a varied list of people that come through. We have your leisure travelers that are here really primarily to drink bourbon, but also want to go on a horse farm. Um, but we're also trying to be proactive and engaging with bigger businesses um, and having you know, special experiences for their employees. And then also with the likes of 4-H groups and FFA groups and you know, middle school, high school um, level students as well, so they can come see and whether that makes them maybe a, a $2 show betting fan on their phone on Derby Day. Mm -hmm. Maybe it makes them somebody who wants to pursue a career in this industry, like I'm sure many of us had that kind of first, um, you know, first experience in this industry that said, that's what I want to do. Or maybe they end up being you know, very wealthy and they want to buy racehorses, which would be great for everybody involved. Um, so I think the point being is, is there are tangible, specific things happening. And it's on us to do our best to participate in, in things like this so you all know about them um, and can help champion them for us as well. So it's www.visithorsecountry.com. <laughs> uh, I, I just mean to say that there are, there are great things going on and um, you know, we're, we're, here to, we're here for the industry in the long term. We're here to promote um, the industry. I know our Horse Country's mission is very much identified with that and I know Amplifies is as well. And same with America's Best Racing and Kingland Kids Club. I'm, I'm sure I left a few other great initiatives out of that mix, but there are things happening and we don't have to recreate the wheel. We just need continued you know, promotion and, and sponsorship of our, our initiatives. Guys, we're kind of coming to the end of our questions. Does anybody else have anything that is just on your heart that you need to express before we wrap it up? Um, to parlay off of what um, Hallie said, it's, I think there's a lot of information that we can provide, but also making that information digestible to the general public and making it easy to understand because I sat, I sat in the seat and I, like, I was listening into a lot of these speakers and a lot, of, a lot of things that I didn't understand was they used a lot of terms that I was not very familiar with and, and that was something that came to mind is so these terms, a lot of things that we find normal might not be as as understandable. Like they, someone that might that doesn't know that much about the industry, perhaps doesn't understand what we mean when we say specific things. So I think making that information uh, available in a manner that's digestible to the general public is very important. That's an amazing point, and that also gets back into what you were saying, Deja, in terms of. It can be very intimidating to be a newcomer in our industry. It's so nuanced. There are so many different aspects of it, and you have to spend years learning it and learning the people to understand how they're interconnected. And we have a lot of jargon that we all just kind of throw around, and we all kind of know what it means, but then sometimes it takes taking a step back and realizing that you know, when you're around somebody who's new to it, it kind of, we, we need to be inclusive. And part of that is making our language very understandable to anyone until they can meet us at our level of, you know, having the same amount of understanding of the sport. Can I add something too? Absolutely. Um, so I think, you know, it's been touched on origi originally, but networking is very important in this business. It's um, getting your foot in the door, um, having that first introduction to any type of angle in horse racing 
And I think, you know, being um, a part of the industry, us as leaders can open the door to young audiences by giving resources on how they can connect with you. Um, I always say my DMs are open on my personal social media channels. You can always reach out to me there. And I've met a lot of wonderful people who do reach out. So being very open to those opportunities, in particular in the digital realm where people may not be close by to the uh, business, uh, really is beneficial for those young people who are interested in stepping in. One kind of just general last thing I, I wanted to comment on, and this is definitely apparent to me now at, with horse country, but was um, during my time, I actually worked for America's Best Racing back in 2013 um, when we did the bus tour, if that is, rings a bell to anybody. It was an incredible time. We got to travel the country and promote our big race days. It was wonderful. Um, but I just, I think it's important to say that those kind of efforts are not a snap your finger, we fixed racing um, kind of approach. And there's really no way for us to do that um, really within any demographic, but definitely not with young people. I mean, we've talked pretty persistently about how authenticity is important and it takes time to be able to build trust and commitment with, with any fan, but I think with young people as well in that space. Um, so just remembering that um, these initiatives are gonna, gonna take time. Um, and one the great thing about the booking platform we use at Horse Country is we have a ton of, of data. Um, and one um, uh, marker we use is called a net promoter score. Um, which probably wouldn't be a uh, jargon that's well used in our industry, but a lot of brands use it um, as a, uh, a marker for uh, future business and, and growth, brand growth. Um, and so essentially, um, the question is, how likely are you to recommend blank brand name? So it might be, how likely are you to recommend Kinglin after a tour here? And it's a scale of one to 10. People who uh, rank one to six are called detractors, and they will essentially May, might be negative for your business or will just not reenact with your brand or re-engage with your brand. Um, seven to eight are passives and nine to 10 are promoters. They are likely to turn around and either buy your product again or to promote your product or leave a, a, a review if you're an attraction. Um, and horse country across the board since May of 2018, across our membership of, of 22 actively touring locations, have a net promoter score of, of 90. Um, and that scale is from negative 100 to 100, and essentially you're dividing the tra detractors from your promoters. So across the board, our members have a 90 NPS rating, which means that people love interacting with their, those individual brands, with those locations, and are likely to turn around and become ambassadors and promote that experience, which has to be a long-term positive impact for our industry. And I would say for my time with America's Best Racing, those that we got to host at the racetrack and go through a form with them and really engage with them and, and the racing product all have a phenomenal time. They enjoy it very much so. And health and welfare and safety being a part of that too. But again, you know, how many people can you host one day at the racetrack? So to know that this is an ongoing thing, this is something we have to be proactive about, we have to do regularly, we have to target the young generation and engage them in this way or we're gonna get lost you know, in the bigger picture of things that are gonna attract and engage them. Great points, guys. Thank you all so, so much for being involved in the panel today. I'm really excited to bring a lot of these thoughts and ideas into uh, the dialogue that Amplify is having with young people. But I'd also challenge everyone watching today to just engage in dialogue, engage with young people, whether that is putting a call out on your social media to send a DM or to just have a general conversation because there's so much connection that can be made and understanding developed just through a simple conversation. So I think that in and of itself is a great starting point. And thank you guys and thank you to everyone watching today. Just like that, we are on to the final presentation of the day. Encompass Solutions is a system used by the majority of racing organizations to run their racetracks and meets, providing a centralized platform to organize data.
From before horses ship into the track until after they ship out, the Encompass system assists racing personnel in a variety of jobs required to run a racetrack, from the racing office to simulcasting and health and safety services, which is what we're going to focus on next. Um, Encompass includes several features that assist veterinarians in maintaining a safe and healthy racing population. To discuss Keeneland and the Encompass programs, I'd now like to welcome Chris Dobbins, Senior Vice President at Encompass, and Dr. Stuart Brown, Vice President of Equine Safety for Keeneland, who not only oversees equine safety during Keeneland race meets, but also year-round during training at Keeneland and the Thoroughbred Training Center. So welcome, Chris and Dr. Brown. Well, thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank the Grayson Jockey Club, Jamie Hayden, uh, and of course, Dr. Brown and Keeneland for uh, hosting this. It's, it's been a, a great conference uh, or summit, and uh, I look forward to uh, getting us to the finish line, and uh, Dr. Brown's going to put a bow around it, and uh, he'll kind of uh, back up uh, what I explain into a practical purpose of what they do here at Keeneland and at the Thoroughbred Training Center. Uh, just to add a little bit about Encompass, uh, we're, we're a, you know, a software as a service platform, but we try, we're a solutions provider. And so what makes our platform unique uh, and very uh, valuable to the industry is, is we do service 100% of the marketplace. And so every racetrack has access to this platform that they're putting data into. They're looking at the data. We're able to create uh, custom reporting for them and create uh, a lot of products to uh, service our uh, racetracks. And so with that, I'll, I'll get into kind of where, what the objectives are here today. I just wanna you know, discuss how we meet our clients' welfare and safety needs, uh, what we've done to uh, assist Keeneland with our Thoroughbred Training Center uh, to, again, address those welfare and, and safety needs. Uh, I'll give a, a quick update on, on what uh, we have uh, worked with Heiza on in our flagship product, Track Manager, uh, which falls into that first set of uh, rules, the 2000 series, which again are the safety uh, section that we're uh, assisting Heiza with, and of course assisting our customers, the tracks, to, uh, to leverage the, the data they put in to assist them in their, their reporting and their requirements to Heiza. And then I'll, I'll just wrap it up with just giving a quick uh, discussion on our Equitaps product, which is a, a new service uh, that is uh, uh, going to be available for folks to put in their electronic treatment records, pass those along to HISA or the commissions. Again, it's, it's kind of replacing a service that we uh, built uh, to support racing commissions on an individual level. Uh, through their state regulations of uh, requirements for electronic treatment records. So, you, you know, what does Encompass do to help with the welfare and safety? Uh, you know, we, we create a lot of custom reporting packages, which Dr. Brown uh, will definitely go into and provide a lot of examples of, of in today's uh, reports, their, their inventory control, uh, uh, and then we, we, we added another section in that I believe was touched on in the regulatory panel, uh, our non-race observation, which assists uh, veterinarians to, to put in examinations outside of just your uh, race examinations. Uh, you know, I'm sure you, you, you were able to hear a lot of uh, great comments from that panel on the use of those products. We host the pre-race exam module for all the tracks across the country. We host the EID module uh, as well for all the tracks across the country, uh, and as well as the vet lists. And so we built this uh, area of the non-race observation uh, for, again, uh, the ability to put in more information about the horse, uh, to tie that all together with your pre-race exams, uh, and have the, a, a bigger picture of what you're looking at uh, when you're evaluating the horse uh, before a race or just in your day-to-day as uh, Dr. Brown and his team do here at Keeneland. We integrate those electronic treatment records uh, into a lot of that reporting. So again, uh, single reporting, instead of doing all the hours of research, you're able to run single reports that give you that 
uh, view of, well, here's a PP of a horse's history on the track, a PP view of here's its pre-race exams that have occurred, a PP view of any non-race observations that have occurred. We get to then also throw in, you know, all the treatments that have occurred with that horse, uh, any vet list history. So again, they're getting that full picture of a horse's history uh, when they go out and do an exam, evaluate a horse, uh, and decide whether he's, uh, you know, uh, capable of participating that day or not. Or, uh, and, and in some cases, it's not that he's participating that day, but uh, just seeing a horse on a track, uh, the vet walking around, looks up this information and may have a conversation with the trainer about the, the physical status of that horse. And then the risk reporting that we've created. A lot of that emerged from a, a lot of Dr. Dr. Parkins data that's emerged out of uh, the EID and these conferences. Uh, and so, you know, we look at high speed furlongs. Uh, we look at, uh, has the horse had vetless history? We look at, has a horse had not started before he's four? Has he had so many furlongs before he's ever started? There's a lot of different factors uh, that we, we, we look at and again, Dr. Brown will, will get into uh, some of that aspect of what they look at here, but each racing environment's a little unique and each uh, customer has some unique parameters that fits their population of horses that they want to monitor a little more closely. So the Third Red Training Center, uh, Dr. Brown came to us and said, you know, we really need to look at this population of horses a little more closely like we would look at our population of horses here at Keeneland. And so we created that facility uh, for the Thoroughbred Training Center in our track manager product to act just like a racetrack. So Dr. Brown has the ability to now, you know, look at trainer inventory reporting, uh, assign stalls over at the facility, monitor the in and out uh, process uh, at the training center. And again, all the safety reporting along with that with inventory starts and entry data for other tracks, along with the risk factors that Dr. Brown likes to look at that pertain to that uh, inventory of horses. And the one thing that, that he is really focused on and we'll, and we'll get more into is, you know, the Thoroughbred Training Center feeds a lot of other tracks around the region besides just uh, Keeneland. So they're really doing a service for many of the other tracks in this region, whether it's Belterra Park or Indiana Grand. They're, they're able to evaluate horses before those horses even go up there for a pre-race exam, which is, which is very beneficial. Just some quick updates on HISA uh, and what we're doing in, in our flagship pro, uh, product track manager. Is we're, we're adding in uh, some entry notifications at the time of entry that we bounce the data back off of the HISA database to say, you know, is, can this horse race? Is he on, is he's been registered? Has the trainer been registered? Uh, has the jockey registered and completed the uh, required uh, procedures that they need, whether it's a, a physical date, a concussion test, and a acceptance of a concussion protocol at the track they participate at. You know, has the horse, is the horse on a high as a vet list or is the trainer uh, have any fines owed, et cetera. So we'll bounce that data off of the HISA database, bring that back to the entry clerk at time of entry. He can, he or she can notify the person making the entry that, hey, this horse is on a high as a can't race list. They can then advise those folks to, to take care of that before the horse actually races or becomes scratched on the day of the race. Uh, so just a way for our tracks to be alerted that uh, at time of entry, these are some things that need to be resolved. We create a new highs of vets list uh, that's very similar to all the veterinarian lists that's, that have been in track manager and managed 